and welcome at the second day of the Global Economic Impact Forum on Ukraine. Right now we will be starting with the opening speeches. Um, I want to invite Mr. John Denton, Secretary General of International Chamber of Commerce, to stage, please. Welcome, Mr. Denton. Thank you Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. What about, can you hear me if I do this? Can you still hear me if I'm talking? Yeah. That's not bad, eh? I'm, uh, I'm learning as I go. Listen, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in today's um, event. I know yesterday was a very uh, busy day for a number, of, a number of the attendees, and I actually see some colleagues of mine and friends of mine who I met when I was recently in Kiev as well, so welcome to all of you. Um, my name is John Denton. Um, I'm actually an Australian and the first Australian in the 101-year history of the International Chamber of Commerce to lead the International Chamber of Commerce. So they didn't quite know what they were going to get, but they got me. So uh, I'm very much enjoying the role. And also, uh, it's great to be back in Istanbul. Many of you would know the ICC has an extremely strong presence in Istanbul and in Turkey. And we work very closely with Tob and, of course, uh, my, my good friend Rifat Bey. So we're very involved. So you can't fully hear me? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was, it was going quite well. Okay. So anyway, so the ICC, just so you're clear, and we're very glad to have our new logo up there. We're the world's business organization. We represent uh, more than 45 million businesses globally. We're actually present now in more than 130 countries. Uh, and I'm very pleased that we've been able to expand our, le our membership and the constituency that we serve over the last few years that I've been leading the organization. Many of you would actually know also that the International Chamber of Commerce was established in 1919 uh, in the wake of the First World War and in the midst of the Spanish flu influenza. And it was established by a group of visionary European industrialists on the conviction that greater commercial exchanges between nations is conducive to the promotion of peace. Today, the International Chamber of Commerce, we there, we remain firmly convinced of this proposition. And our membership has grown so much, and as I said, over the last three years, we've expanded our, the constituency that we serve extraordinarily, that we now represent, our constituency now consists of more than two thirds of our constituency are in developing and emerging economies. Sadly, at the moment, to be a developing and emerging economy is also to be described in the current environment as a fragile economy as well. We are the representative of the global private sector in the United Nations. We promote trade, create standards, and have the world's leading court of international arbitration. And we have witnessed not only the first-hand dev devastation of this country, of, this, of uh, Ukraine, so just to allow me to sort myself out. And we do, that, we do that all in the service of peace, prosperity, and opportunity for all. And that is our guiding principle. Peace, prosperity, and opportunity for all. And when we say all, we mean everyone everywhere, and that's what we actually do. This guiding principle has no greater relevance when speaking at a conference dedicated to investing in Ukraine after the illegal invasion by the Russian Federation and while the country remains ravaged by war. The founding fathers, and yes, they were men uh, at the time, uh, of the International Chamber of Commerce were known as and are still celebrated as merchants of peace. And it's precisely with the spirit of our founding fathers that we are all convened here today. It's a real honour to join you, to support Ukraine, and to give today's keynote address. I've witnessed not only, witnessed not only the first hand the devastation of the country, including most shockingly in Butcha, but also the extraordinary efforts of the Ukrainian people when I visited there about a month ago as the guest of Gennady and the Ukrainian government. I thank you very much for that. I've also witnessed the extraordinary efforts of the Ukrainian people, the government, and importantly, of businesses. Most recently, we convened what we call the ICC Regional Action Network, which brings together all the chambers of commerce in Europe, and we are presenting to them the functioning chambers of commerce in Ukraine. And let's not forget that the chambers of commerce in Ukraine are still functioning, and they are an incredibly important lifeblood for the maintenance of, uh, of uh, the economy in Ukraine. 
So let me begin by acknowledging all the Ukrainian organisers of this conference, and there are many, from clusters through to associations, through the government, and the many Ukrainian speakers and participants, both, both those who have travelled far to be here, and the many more who are unable to leave while they serve in the military while continuing their important day jobs. And let me also pay my respects to the Turkish government, citizens and the Turkish business community who have done so much to support Ukraine, not least through the extremely important ongoing diplomatic efforts to broker a deal to allow the reopening of the Black Sea for vital Ukrainian exports to reach the rest of the world. I've been asked today to speak on international trade as a mechanism to support global economic stability. It's hard to think of a more pertin pertinent top topic at this time or a pertinent theme and I would like to use this occasion to make three key observations that no doubt will be explored in greater depth in the panels that follow. First, I want to provide an overview of the very difficult global economic context in which we are all operating and outline the most urgent policy interventions from a global business perspective. Second, I will cover the importance of keeping international trade flowing, especially food, and how the public and private sectors can work together to best achieve that. And then I will conclude by providing some thoughts and why and how the international community must support the Ukrainian private sector, not only for Ukraine, but actually for the world. So to begin, the global economic context in which this conference is taking place is, to put it bluntly, devastating. Today, over 60% of workers have lower real incomes than before the pandemic. You know, 60% of the poorest countries are in debt distress or at high risk of it. Developing countries, as I said before, which now represent two-thirds of the ICC's constituency, are actually searching for an additional $1.2 trillion per year to fill their social protection gap. That's how far they've fallen. And there's an extra $4.3 trillion required to meet the Sustainable Development Goals. That's more than ever before. And in addition to the enormous human toll, the war in Ukraine has only caused more economic distress. Global average growth prospects have been revised downward. Many countries' fiscal balances have deteriorated, and the average household income has lost 1.5% due to price increases in corn and wheat alone. So worldwide, more people are now facing famine-like conditions than ever before, and more people have faced severe hunger emergencies. And as poverty increases, as we all know, so too does social and political risk. And let us be absolutely clear, and even though Russia's war in Ukraine did not cause all of these problems, and there are many underlying causes, this war has seriously aggravated and exacerbated the situation. The blockade of the Black Sea has exacerbated massive food security challenges globally, effectively taking Ukrainian wheat and sunflower off global markets, drastically restricting the ability of fertilisers from Russia and Belarus, and generating market volatility and huge price spikes. In Beirut alone, where the ICC is very present, with, even with a centre of entrepreneurship there, we saw price increases of around 1,000%. That's the level of volatility we're seeing. Accordingly, as a first order priority for the global business community, let us be clear, this war must stop and the blockade must be removed. Similarly, the war in Ukraine has led to huge spikes in energy prices, which anyone here who drives a car and pays an electricity bill certainly would have noticed, but which is also driving inflation across the real economy, putting the balance sheets of small businesses at risk and leading the world into potentially stagflation. Most worryingly, about this global economic situation is that the underlying factors generating the food, energy and debt crisis are all compounding upon each other, causing vicious cycles. Record food prices will likely continue to rise with increasing fertilising pr fertilizer prices, rising interest rates, maritime costs are at triple their pre-pandemic average on account of supply chain disruptions, and record oil prices and gas prices, each of which goes on to increase the cost of the other. Absent effective coordinated global action, the global economy may well get stuck in this vicious cycle, which will lead to declines in real incomes and the ability of families, smallholder farmers and SMEs to cope, as well as a reduction, a reduction in the ability of countries, especially in the developing world, to service their debt obligations, 
to provide the very social protection and safety nets their citizens need because their fiscal space is narrowing. In short, I am painting a very grim economic picture, but also one that could easily lead to widespread social and political unrest. In such a situation, the world needs a comprehensive and coordinated global response because these issues are all interlinked. We welcome the efforts of the United Nations Secretary General Guterres in establishing a global crisis response group to deal with this triple threat, but also, importantly, inviting for the first time the private sector into the midst of actually providing global support to this global crisis response group. And the group that was chosen to actually do that is the International Chamber of Commerce. And I'm proud to serve on that committee because we are doing good work in actually bringing to the attention of policymakers globally the, the challenges we see, but also the solutions that, that are there. This is the first instance ever where the UN has systemically crowded in the private sector as an integral part of the solution to this massive problem. Similarly, we welcome the creation of the G7's Global Alliance on Food Security and President Macron's Farm Initiative designed to combat the food crisis. And we are proud to be part of all those initiatives. But let's face it, the, pro the proposition I've always put is that no global challenge can be solved without the private sector, both in the delivery of solutions, but also in keeping pressure on governments to avoid harmful policy actions and to appropriately prioritise their actions. This brings me to my next point about the importance of keeping markets open and trade flowing. This might sound self-evident, but in a world of entrenched protectionism, supply chain disruptions, the fracturing of the global economy along geopolitical lines, as a business community, we must continue to make the case for maintaining open trade and investment settings. There are, of course, good old school economic reasons for this. We know that it all leads to greater efficiency and lack of fragmentation means greater growth at a time of potential global recession. But let's be clear as well, open trade settings minimise supply chain disruptions and help rebuild more resilient value chains. And trade has long been proven to be the, the keeper, the, the provider of prosperity, having lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the, fast, in the last few decades alone. Perhaps more importantly, however, is that keeping trade open during difficult times is ultimately better for people, for our citizens. We do not need to cast our minds back too far to remember the deadly impact.
Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome back. So we're proceeding. Unfortunately, Mr. Badr Kalyasi is not with us. So Mr. Dennis Yachin, uh, Mr. Denis Yashin, who is the Director of Corporate Relations U.S.-Ukraine uh, Business Council, will be moderating today's forum. May I kindly call him to stage? So I will hand you the microphone. Okay. Thank Welcome. You. And I just want to introduce shortly our speakers. Uh, this is going to be about... Sorry. This is going to be about financing the rebuilding of Ukraine. And our speakers are going to be Vice President, Banking Black Sea Trade and Development Bank, Mr. Hassan Demirhan. May he kindly come on stage, please. Welcome. And Matteo Patrone, Managing Director, Eastern Europe and the Caucus European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. He's online. I think he can hear us. We will recheck afterwards. And then Asin Nazali, managing partner, Nazali Tax Legal, please. Can I invite him to stage? Yes, it's coming. So thank you very much. The stage is yours. So, Matteo, can you hear us well? Matteo, can you hear us well? Okay. Matteo, can you hear us well? Okay, super. Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the panel financing the rebuilding of Ukraine. It's, it is a crucial of businesses in Ukraine. They are looking for ways how to get financing, how to find financing, how to rebuild the infrastructure, how to rebuild other areas in Ukraine. We would like to hear your perspective and your point of view on that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me well, Matteo? No, Thank you. 
user to these companies. Um, by the infrastructure, indeed, and we have been working with Google that is needs that. Uh, and, uh, and we are um, um, now uh, preparing a project also with uh, you that has been an historic partner of the BRT and it is being particularly generous in welcoming internet space people who were in the past months. And uh, for security, I think you mentioned that. And we have derived a package of about 200 million euros of uh, our business companies um, for the sole campaign and then the ending of, uh, of uh, um, contacts and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the fees at the moment being. And then the financial you would have a uh, value chain. Now, so you see, out of these, so far, we have invested uh, already over 650 million euros. We plan to invest over 1 billion euros this year as well. And, uh, and as a majority of this, it is going to be in energy and, and uh, transport infrastructure. And uh, um, at the moment, we focus on provision of liquidity, so working capital uh, to the right of the capital is new and after that. But uh, at some point, and that point is not too far back in time, we will need to start working also on investment. And, uh, and as you know, the, the Ukrainian authorities have uh, proposed a comprehensive plan for a survey in Uganda about a month ago, with less than that actually. And, um, and that has a comprehensive program that funds over 10 years for $350 billion. Uh, we would like for the moment to focus on what is needed uh, in the first phase of the recovery, uh, while the conflict is still raging. And, uh, and we think that uh, the main focus uh, uh, should be uh, on ensuring uh, export of uh, agricultural foodstuff, and uh, that's why we are devising uh, and uh, with the financing for an investment plan by Google and Smitza, but also more holistically, we are looking at um, the GCP infrastructure, not only in Ukraine, so the railways, but also the ports of Ismail, very, and uh, but also in neighboring countries, uh, we are uh, shown uh, in the Moldova port with the rest, and we are also working with the uh, Romanian authorities to see if we can uh, support uh, the uh, improvements uh, of uh, the conditions uh, of the dining cars, uh, for instance, in Sumeria, and uh, as we also have in discussion with the Polish authorities to also explore that route towards the Baltic uh, port. Um, that, that is one chapter of it. The other one is the GFP, the demand of, uh, of liquidity. Uh, um, I think we need to see the moment of Ukraine having uh, done a fantastic job of uh, being uh, certified, uh, and so we can be able now to export electricity uh, um, to the EU, and that will increase the revenues for the country. So we are also considering um, investments for repairs and, uh, and, and storage of energy uh, for the Nego, which will uh, facilitate this uh, exercise. Um, and then, then you need to look at a leading point once the conflict is over. And uh, I think that uh, um, the authority should be praised for the um, strong uh, stance on, on the part of uh, the sector want to rebuild infrastructure that has been destroyed by the Russian uh, aggression, but they want to do it in a way that uh, is uh, consistent with the concept of building a better and and uh, and um, and climate mitigation and uh, and that is something that is very close to our world here uh, and uh, 
Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mattel, for your invaluable input. I would like to address quite the same question to Hassan Demirhan, Vice President, Banking Black Sea Trade and Development. All right. Um, thank you very much. Good morning to all, all our guests. Um, basically, um, as a development bank, multilateral development bank, usually very sensitive, this type of kind of um, destruction uh, or uh, fragile economies, let's put it this way. And um, we are, uh, as a Black Sea Trade and Development Bank, um, we have uh, also the same experience we had, uh, because, uh, you know, as Azerbaijan and Armenia also are member countries, so we show the same reaction during this conflict between these two countries. So what we are, what we are saying, um, as a development bank uh, owned by the multilateral or by the um, state, uh, multi-state uh, uh, entities, so we are very sensitive on uh, basically such a uh, fragile countries. Uh, of course, uh, in this case, not only the development banks, but, but also the European uh, uh, public uh, financial institutions has been also very active, and uh, they are the first one really taking necessary action uh, to provide financing uh, to Ukraine. In addition to that one, also EU countries uh, as a state in different kind of uh, sovereign funds, sovereign related entities, they provide the also financing. They committed to provide the fi uh, financing because, uh, you know, uh, providing financing implementation takes time. But immediate reaction was a commitment uh, from the different institutions. So this type of, uh, let's put it this way, commitments has a different formats. Basically, one is the loan, a simple loan, and the second one is a guarantees or unfunded kind of transactions. So um, mostly, especially European uh, sovereign entities, they provide uh, they provided unfunded kind of line of financing. Let's put it this way, in, in a different uh, kind of way. Uh, the line of financing can be uh, unfunded and can be guaranteed. It can be uh, trade financing or other uh, form of uh, guarantees, or can be uh, issuing the bond, but guaranteed by the uh, basically sovereigns in the Europe. So uh, these are the reactions, <clears throat> what we have seen so far. But uh, one of the important things as a bank and multilateral development bank to react or to provide a loan, uh, usually it is expected to be a concessional. It's not like a private, uh, you know, fund uh, uh, kind of reaction. It's a concessional, means uh, to pri uh, the pricing is can be in donor, can be in uh, basically um, uh, principal amount. So uh, it is not, not like a market-driven kind of cost or pricing of the loan. So that's the uh, important uh, difference between the private sector financing and the uh, multilateral uh, development uh, funds. So, we what is the as a Black Sea uh, Trade and Development Bank? What is our role? What we have done so far for the Ukraine? <clears throat> First of all, we are 11 member countries. In our 11 member countries, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Armenia, Azerbaijan, 
Turkey, like Greece, these all countries are our member countries. So um, we, as I said, we have a good ex experience, especially in Azerbaijan and uh, uh, other cases, Azerbaijan and the Armenian cases. But uh, for this one, uh, we have a little bit further action we have taken because the scale of the economy, scale of the impact is huge. So in this regard, what we did actually, <clears throat> uh, since the establishment of the bank, which is, uh, which is around uh, 1990s, the uh, Ukraine is our member, major member countries. So they have uh, more than 14% shareholding, and also they have a, um, a management, a vice president level of management representative uh, in the board, uh, so in the, in the management. So of course, they have also representative in the, uh, in the board as well. So these also help to facilitate and also basically increase the, our exposure very rapidly, very fast. Uh, especially in, in Ukraine. So since the establishment, um, what I can say, we are a middle size of, let's say, uh, multilateral development bank. Uh, since the establishment, we approved around more than 1 billion uh, US dollar, uh, euro um, the, for the Ukraine, um, which is around uh, more than 12%, roughly 12, 13% uh, of the total exposure. So uh, this, of course, uh, this approval, board approval, has a different stages. Some of them is completed, some of them is under the implementation, you know, in the different stage of the implementation. So what we can say that uh, uh, at this stage, we can say uh, more than 50% completed project financing, uh, basically, in different uh, format, and uh, around 40% of uh, 1 billion, let's put this uh, this way, around 400 million, this is the rough amount, uh, which is currently under the implementation, or we can say it is pending for the implementation. So uh, this is an important uh, kind of exposure as a, a development bank. So uh, <clears throat> that's implementation. Uh, you know, we have uh, exposure in a different sector, but what we have seen actually, our expo exposure especially recently in the two major sectors. One is the energy, especially energy sector, and second one is the SME sector, in general SME sector. The SME sector became more important because of the COVID reaction, uh, especially we prioritized the SME sector of the, before this conflict, SME sector in, in Ukraine. And uh, before the COVID, our major exposure was the, in the energy uh, sector. So when we finance, uh, we can finance a, basically as a single, um, uh, as a, we can finance the total operation of the project, or it can be syndication together with other uh, other financial institution. Major, mainly the other financial institution, again, uh, you know, multilateral development bank like EBRD and other kind of uh, mainly EBRD, I can say, but uh, also European Investment Bank. We have also other European uh, entities, financial entities. So, I mean, uh, the example that we, uh, we can share with you, we did with other uh, MDBs, I just want to uh, mention, uh, especially uh, Gulf of Takas and the uh, Ringy uh, Bioenergy. Uh, so one of the important things that the major focus in the energy sector is the renewable energy. That's the important things. It can be wind energy, it can be bioenergy, it can be uh, basically um, the uh, solar panel uh, uh, energy sector. Uh, so these are the range uh, energy, uh, basically ingulates, uh, uh, swash, uh, this kind of, uh, and also we are also very much engaged with the uh, Euro gas bank uh, financing. That's also uh, very important for us. Um, uh, basically to have an exposure. So in this way, uh, basically, uh, we continue, we, we have done, and we will continue to also uh, support the economy. Now, this time, uh, as I said, you know, the priorities for the development bank, for the financing, can be uh, revised and changed. As I mentioned, for example, uh, before COVID-19, the priority were is the energy sector and also uh, environment because it is the, uh, because of the environmentally friendly 
and uh, also, uh, you know, SDGs kind of um, compliance uh, reason. So what we did, we revised during the COVID, and then we focus on more, uh, you know, uh, medium size uh, kind of uh, investments. So when we do this type of, especially uh, mid size um, sector or companies, uh, or uh, micro size companies, uh, again the major focus we are uh, we do through the line of financing we reach out to local entities through using the uh, the local banks like Ukrakas Bank as, as I mentioned or like you know trade entities trade financing entities in for example uh, similar entities in Turkey we have an Exim Bank type of uh, entities we utilize this, that one to uh, reach out uh, these entities so. Um, uh, we uh, so now it is the stage for us as a bank, basically to revise the priorities, which is we are revising now, together with the um, uh, contribution of the board member as well as the management of the uh, from Ukraine. So what are the uh, basically stages now at this stage? Uh, the first stage we are now fo focus on f uh, basically immediate action is the required restoration of the destroyed objects and breaches and life support system. These are the major focus and immediate action required for this financing, So, which is already uh, started. The second stage is also uh, basically, uh, re uh, basically the con uh, construction or uh, resumption of the water, electricity uh, supply, and all other uh, in the uh, devastated territory. So, this is the second uh, stage, but these are the very important uh, for us also to prioritize uh, during this time. <clears throat> the last stage, of course, which is a little bit long term, and it requires full-fledged infrastructure and the country, uh, country, uh, country level like agriculture and all other uh, sector. So these are the um, uh, major kind of. Um, kind of priorities, uh, prioritization for us. So, uh, of course, uh, construction requires basically focusing on the uh, building materials, agriculture, food production, uh, metal uh, manufacturing. These are the, as a sector-wise, we are focusing on this sector. The companies are operating in uh, this sector. So, uh, <clears throat> now, the issue is here, um, uh, basically, the focus, as I said, it is uh, rehabilitation and reconstruction because of the, the damage. It is not, uh, per se, a new kind of uh, immediate action, new building or new project, uh, per se. So these are the, uh, 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 the priority for us. But one of the another important fire, uh, priority for us to make sure that new infrastructure is modern, digital, and in the line with the Paris Agreement. This is also very important. All these our projects has to be in the line with the Paris Agreement. Uh, this is also our uh, major uh, focus on that one. Now, coming back to the private sector, uh, foreign investor, private sector, foreign investor. So let's put it this way. Financing or investments can be a two way. One is the direct equity, uh, private sector direct equity. Another one is the providing the loan. So the direct equity investment at this stage, it will be very challenging. From It is expected to the private sector, it is challenging at this stage, which is, uh, so we have to be uh, uh, careful on that one. So the pri providing the loan from the private uh, kind of uh, sector, let's say uh, private banks, not government related or multilateral development banks, is uh, can be also uh, reasonable, but uh, it requires some um, basically some regulatory changes and adoption of the, some regulatory changes in the Ukraine. For example, in this regard, um, what we have to do, uh, the major kind of structure is a public-private partnership type of uh, project financing. That's the important things. By this way, you can, uh, especially um, the public sector should take a certain risk. 
I don't want to go detail on the structure and all the things. This is another long story. But by this way, the uh, public sector, whether it is a, a you know pu public entity or the banks, MDPs, they will take some portion of the risk, and so that the private sector funding may uh, basically became more attractive, uh, especially in Ukraine. So um, this is uh, um, basically <clears throat> so. From the equity, direct equity investment, the private sector will be, uh, it will be challenging. And uh, for the other one, again, uh, it can be uh, uh, basically doable, but it requires a legal kind of framework, a, a good uh, f legal fr framework in, in place. Uh, so we are uh, actually, and also uh, at this stage, uh, the donor the type of financing is much more priority than a complete pure risk adjusted or risk based kind of uh, financing methodology so that's the that's the at this stage also we have to uh, take care of this kind of distinguish on on that one so bottom line i just want to uh, summarize on that one as a, a black sea trade and development bank uh, we are uh, very strongly supporting uh, the Ukraine, uh, basically for the recovery at these stages, with, uh, which I mentioned. And we are uh, also stimulating, we are also engaging with other MDPs, working together with other MDPs, basically uh, in terms of like B loan, syndication, co-financing, the different type of way, so that we can diversify, that's the important thing, diversify the source of funding for the uh, Ukraine. That is our policy, of course. Now we are also uh, revising our strategy, especially, especially sectoral strategy as well. Thank you very much indeed. Hassan, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before, I, before, before, before we switch to uh, Ersin Nazali, I would like to, to address the question to Matteo and to Hassan as well. We all understand that everything has limits, but what Mattel mentioned and what you mentioned as well, I mean, the infrastructure, the energy, the green energy, what kind of budgets, volumes are we talking about? Are we talking about billions, 10, 10, 10 billions, 20 billions, thousands, thousands? Uh, uh, let, me be, let me put it this way. Uh, the, the European entities, as I mentioned, uh, they uh, commitment so far. The European entities are not us. So over one trillion, I can say commitment, uh, over one trillion euro. This including the sovereign entities, the, the state, EU state, as well as uh, European funds and European investment bank, including whole Europe. It's roughly one, one, uh, more than uh, one trillion US dollar. It's not only a billion. Regarding the development banks, of course, when you do kind of uh, a commitment, you have to take care of uh, your capital uh, strength, your rating capacity, your abs shock absorbing capacity, and your limit. So, I mean, as a kind of a BSTDB, we cannot normally uh, have an exposure in a single member country more than 15% of the total portfolio. So this is the kind of uh, com uh, compulsory limit, which is also imposed by the rating agencies as well to maintain your rating. So regarding the, um, uh, so far, the commitment we made, and it's around more than 15%, very sorry, 13%, so very close, very upper limit of the Ex, you know, uh, ceiling of the exposure limit for the for our, for ourselves. So I can say the uh, percentage, but I cannot mention the exact amount because the uh, it is the exact amount is a dynamic. So every time it, it changes depends on your capital structure, your profitabilities, uh, your uh, borrowing, your basically size of the, your asset. So that's why the important things for us is to uh, stretch the limit, single obligor limit to the member countries up to 15% of the total exposure. Thank you, thank you, Hassan. Matteo, the same question to you. Please give us more clarity on what kind of budgets can we expect and can we, may I say, calculate, if I may say so. Uh, 
Matteo, you're muted.
you. Thank you, Matteo, very much. Uh, Ersin, two questions to you as you are the representative of the business. To, so two questions to you. What kind of tools are you looking at in order to find a way to finance Ukraine? And a, a, a lot of businesses and governments and uh, NGOs, they are talking about how to get all those monies that were freezed by the United States, by the European Union, I mean the uh, Russian bank, I mean the Russian the Russian money that were freezed by the European Union, European Union and the United States. So, question to you as to as you are the legal guy and the tax guy. So, do we have a chance to get it? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, our, uh, we are representing many Turkish investors in Ukrainian, and the finance is as of today is the most important point actually. Uh, with respect to your last questions, from legal point, I think uh, it is not possible uh, because, uh, as you know, that these assets in EU, US, some other uh, countries, and as you know, uh, from all part of the world, people flying to UK because I have residence in UK at the same time. Uh, they think that the country is a safe uh, region, safe place for everybody actually. Therefore, uh, as of today, considering the international uh, legal uh, law, international law, and also the domestic law, uh, the assets uh, as of today state, I think it is not possible. But in practice, they it, it deem as a, a security against the uh, loan or some other finance to be provided by the Ukrainian because uh, in practice, uh, this SS is staying uh, as an idol, uh, I think. But uh, directly to your questions, uh, it is not possible as of today. Okay, okay and what about the first one? Uh, as of today, many of our clients continue their operations. Uh, and at the moment, uh, I understand from my uh, meeting with our clients in Turkey, uh, the other companies, uh, in some different business are looking for opportunity uh, soon in Ukrainian. As of today, uh, in Turkey, our office is more, more than 250 people. We have five branches in Turkey. Uh, I can say that we are representing uh, many multinationals in Turkey at the same time, biggest uh, companies of Turkey uh, in uh, different parts of the Turkey. Uh, finance is the big problem because uh, even if you have uh, opportunity, if there is no fi uh, finance facility, it is impossible to, to continue their investment. Uh, we can divide uh, subject to part. One of uh, them is uh, heavy investment, which means construction, some other infrastructure investments. Uh, as you know, Turkey is a big country, but uh, total amount of such a budget needs international investment. In that time, uh, our clients at the moment started to making some, how can I say, lobbying activities in EBRD or World Bank or some other international institutions. Uh, and at the moment, I think, uh, hopefully, uh, the war uh, will end uh, soon and uh, they will uh, continue their current projects and at the same time they will start uh, the uh, new projects for the reconstruction of the Ukrainian. Uh, with respect to the daily business, daily business which means retail or uh, some other basic needs of the people, uh, many of our uh, clients continue their operations as before, even if there are some, as you know, the rockets uh, fire or some other issues. Therefore, they continue this, its operations with their own capital, uh, without any uh, foreign or uh, third party uh, facility. Uh, this shows uh, the commitment of the Turkish business to Ukrainian, I think, and it will uh, didn't it didn't end uh, because of the war or some other issues. Uh, when we discussed our clients, all all of them say that we will broaden our business uh, soon. At the same time, looking for other opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the same question goes to Hassan as well. Hassan, as you might know, as you might heard that uh, the Canada.
Canada just changed their legislation in regards to the freezed assets. So do we have a chance to get the freezed, uh, the, the freezed Russian assets in European Union or in, in the US or elsewhere as from your uh, banking point of view? Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, um, Russia is one of the important uh, member countries and um, just uh, new, uh, even the uh, nomination of the presidency time to time for the bank is Russian. So, yes, we have a, a significant exposure to Russia and we are uh, basically facing challenges, especially for the repayments of the portfolio. Um, but um, because of the uh, having a kind of multilateral development bank status, you have a certain kind of privilege, uh, let's say, to get the money back, uh, you know, a certain privilege. But despite of that, we're facing difficulties trying to uh, basically uh, arrange the, especially in our compliance office, um, some of the uh, using the privilege rights as a development bank. And not only us, but other development banks as well, uh, also doing the same thing. Yes, we are facing the difficulties, it's very clear, but the size and significance of that one, it's very difficult to say at this stage. But what, what I can say, especially for Ukraine, a very, very important and also a very important for the um, fund provider from the credibility of the Ukraine entities. As I mentioned, we have uh, more than one billion exposure already approved for the Ukraine. This is a cumulative one. Uh, so far, uh, of course, there is no sanction, but all the entities we are working now, they make the repayments on time. Okay, That's thank you. That's very important, especially for the finance and the international financing community. That's very important to highlight. As this is the, a good experience we are facing. That also encourages you to further finance and take a further step for financing in Ukraine. That's also, I like to uh, underline and highlight these issues. Thank Understood. You. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Mateo, my last question to you. We have one minute left. So do we have a chance to get freeze Russian assets from European Union or the US or elsewhere? Okay, then on this very positive note, thank you very much. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you, Ersin. Thank you very much. Thank you, all the guests. Thank you very much and looking forward to get all these billions and trillions from all the financial institutions. Thank you. Applause. And thank you very much, Dennis, for the great moderation. And we'll be calling you back on stage, so maybe. Oh, okay. Just wanted to let you know. Thank you very much, our dear speakers. Thank you. So we'll be, we're a bit behind schedule. That's why uh, we're going to be, thank you. Thank you. That's why we're going to start immediately with the next panel. Um, this is going to be about the status quo and how to move forward. For our moderation, I'm going to call Alfred Praus, the president of Austrian Ukrainian Business Council and board member of the International Council of Business Associations and Chambers in Ukraine. Welcome, Mr. Alfred Pross. So I will leave you the stage, but just I just want to shortly introduce our speakers, call them to stage. For the International Chamber of Commerce, Head of Global Engagement, Damian Burkhardt. For the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry President, Gennady Chiziko, please. For the US Ukraine Business Council, Denis Yatchin, he's already on stage, Director of Corporate Relations. For the Canada Ukraine Chamber of Commerce, Managing Director Emma Toros. For the International Turkish Ukrainian Business Association, Chairman of the Board, Mr. Burak Pelivan. For the Association of Industrial Automation of Ukraine and Head of Ukrainian Cluster Alliance, Alexander Yushak, CEO. For the European Business Association, Executive Director Anne Derevyanko will be online. She is, we're hoping that she will be connected. And for the Ukrainian Automotive and Mobility Cluster, 
and president of the Ukrainian Association of Management Consultants, Olga Trofimova, cluster manager. So we have two, four, five. One more. One more. Six panelists. One is missing. Plus Anna being online uh, representing the European Business Association in Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to moderate this panel. This panel is a more general panel. Uh, because it is not going uh, into details concerning any specific issue, but it is the essential question. Where are we standing now, and how can we move forward? We are here at a business forum, rather than a more political forum, like uh, the Lugano conference was. So this is the forum with the people uh, who should get things going and not so much what to do concerning the framework, how to do the framework, how to uh, manage that. Uh, this is the more political issue. Uh, I may ask uh, Gennady Chizhikov, uh, since he is uh, president of the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce of, uh, and, and Industry, uh, what do you see and how do you judge the actual state of the economy in Ukraine? Because if you want to say how to move on, you have to start to say where are we? Gennady, please. Thank you very much, Alfred. Uh, you asked me a uh, so important question, and I needed to ask how, my, uh, how much time I have. <laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. That's why I will be very uh, busy. Uh, situation what was in the beginning of the match and now different. Uh, from, from my point of view, the, I can say that Ukrainian business now more and more adopted to, to the situation they were born. Of course, it's not easy. It is uh, not easy because, uh, honestly speaking, this is situation uh, of stress, situation of un uh, uniqueness, because it's to, uh, to work in the situation when the logistic uh, chains blocked or uh, destroyed, when the city bombed, uh, when the, a lot of people, uh, as you know, them, uh, more than six million people uh, now uh, across the board of Ukraine and now get the second possibility to be, how to, to live, to, uh, to walk in the uh, countries of Europe. And uh, also the a lot of a lot of questions, a lot of uh, challenges. Of course, we know about uh, some uh, general figures. More more than uh, nearby 30 percent of Ukrainian business stop their activity. Uh, nearby the um, 50 percent have uh, a lot of difficulties with their uh, work. If this is general figures. What can uh, comes, uh, uh, demonstrated? It's not simple situation, but me, like a president of Chamber of Commerce, for all this, we are very important to see some trends. What is it? And main trends, what uh, business after this shock start now more and more thinking about how to be, not on real life, how to develop activities. Uh, uh, thinking about the relocation to find some more uh, safety place, to find new pro, uh, pro, uh, pro, um, uh, partners. Many businesses are now, now thinking how to be, to work um, in uh, with Europe more uh, easy way and Europe if you know the European Union uh, made uh, very good steps forward to Ukraine that uh, we uh, cancelled the a lot of tariffs for uh, export products etc etc it's demonstrated what business now in the main trend business in the way to find new solution in this very difficult situation and for us for Ukrainian business very important to uh, what we see is the openness 
in many cases, openness of the European partners, Turkish partners, and a lot of partners abroad who are ready to work in this very difficult situation. This, uh, from my point of view, this is motivated what the end uh, give me the, a little bit uh, more positive what Ukrainian business can find in new possible to work in this very dramatic period of our history. We named in Chamber of Commerce this is like economical front. And this front for business not less, um, uh, for Ukraine is not less important than the real front with our enemy. That's why uh, we uh, here in this conference just to share information what's not needed to wait when the war is finishing. Uh, business ready to work and would like to work in any circumstances and especially now in the period of war. It's dangerous sometimes, but business always the risk. Of course, we have a lot of questions to the uh, international organization, first of all, multinational organization, how to find, how to support international partners, our investor, by uh, insurance, by uh, another question, but this is a little bit for another topics. That's my, very shortly, it's situation not easy, sometimes very difficult, but the main trend, Ukrainian business adopted more and more the situation and would like to work not only in local market, but internationally as well. Thank you very much. Uh, so the point is we are in a basically unpredictable situation because we don't know how long will this war last and uh, what will be the status at the end of the war. This is maybe, what is victory? What does it mean? This is the big question for everyone, I think, here. But coming to the point, and Gennady was uh, very clear on that, we should start planning for the future now. Because as soon as the point, the time comes when we can act, we should be ready to act and not start the whole thing from scratch in maybe half a year or one year or in three months, however the, uh, the actual situation will last. Secondly, uh, there are some uh, obstacles, I would say, uh, to uh, the inflow of foreign direct investment and uh, uh, financing uh, the financial needs of Ukraine, and I may fall back on the question of my friend and colleague Dennis in the previous uh, panel. Uh, what about uh, the uh, uh, blocked, the frozen, the freezed money? This is, if I'm not wrong, $300 million from the Central Bank of Russia, plus an additional $30 million uh, from uh, Russian oligarchs, etc. I may give an answer as a non-expert. We are living in a Western legal system. So it is not Russia where we are. That means we have to abide by the existing laws. And it will not be that easy to use these $330 million because the legal issues are very difficult and we will have to see whether there is even a possibility. So don't take it as fixed. Uh, newspapers are writing that, etc. This is not a fixed issue. This is open and questionable. Uh, so, let me continue in asking uh, uh, our panelists. Uh, we are uh, chambers. We are um, business associations. We are clusters here. And a major part uh, of uh, uh, this panel is constituted by my colleagues in the International Council of Business Associations and Chambers. I may start with uh, my colleagues, and since we are in Turkey, I may start with uh, uh, Burak. Uh, what do you think? What can be the role what can the international bilateral organizations we are representing here, clusters, etc., do uh, in this situation to support Ukraine? Thank you very much, Alfred. We had today a historic, I can say, keynote speech 
by the leader of World Business Community, Mr. John Denton. And I think his speech could show us a good roadmap what can be done, how can we facilitate, how can we strengthen Ukrainian economy under these harsh conditions. All these business associations, all these business chambers, in the good time and in the bad time, have an important responsibility to give right platform for the businesses. To name as business doesn't mean automatically to make turnover and profit. To be a businessman doesn't mean you make profit and you can just pay salaries, pay the, your suppliers and to make business. After the war, according to different estimations, but averagely, Ukraine economy will decrease 4 to 5 percent this year. The unemployment rate will reach 50 percent. Ukraine temporarily has lost because of the slump of demands, because of the logistics problems, because of the blockade of black seaports, because of the war conditions, almost 50 percent of its industrial capacity. Temporary, we hope. So there are big challenges in front of Ukrainian businesses and big challenge in front of all these business associations and chambers. What can be done? First of all, we should underline everywhere in every platform. The economic front is as important as well the other fronts. Every people has a individual war. Every people needs to bring its home, their home, bread for their families. So every people should work or at least have some incomes. And because of that, as we always say, world stands with Ukraine, world supports Ukraine. But that kind of phrases should be not just words and supported with deeds. Of course, the international business committee and committee engagement, commitment to Ukraine, till now not bad. More than 12 billion US dollars already injected Ukrainian economy. There are big commitments, and altogether this commitment is one, more than 100 billion US dollars. Maybe over the recent decades, no country had such a big support. But that support should be realized as soon as possible. Every day counts. Ukraine does not need time, years. International business community, international community should support Ukraine now. As the budget needs, we know that Ukrainian budget, only budgets needs every month at least five billion US dollars. But the, if you look over the same five years, Ukraine can get 2.5 billion US dollars. So every month, already 2.5 billion uh, deficits. So this period even, starting today, let's say, starting 1st August, needs will be even more than five billion US dollars. So, as business associations, as much as we can, we should increase the awareness of that issue. So international community should support Ukraine now and with mostly nuts, debts and grants. Because Ukraine after the war, post-war period, shouldn't fall in a debt trap as well. So the amount of that intangible aid should be increased. It should be more grant instead of debt. And that commitment should be realized as soon as possible. We always say about reconstruction and rebuilding of Ukraine. 
after the war. I should say, even before the war uh, finish, that kind of the efforts should start. First of all, with projections, because in some big infrastructure projects, even project time takes one, two years, even more. And second, to give people help to make a movement, a move inside of the Ukraine economy. So that rebuilding and reconstruction if, uh, uh, efforts should start in the relatively safer areas now in Ukraine. And not the lost capacity and for updating the current capacity. So as a summary, I can say that we really praise, we really should say thank you that strong commitment of international business committee and international community to Ukraine. But that commitment should be realized with bigger amounts, should be realized sooner, earlier, and it must, it must be more grand than that. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I continue with this question? And uh, may I ask uh, uh, the next uh, speaker uh, to also tell, uh, beyond financial help, uh, what could be done by the bilateral organizations? And I may ask uh, my colleague and friend, Emma, what can Canada, Canadian Ukrainian Chamber do? Yeah, thank you, uh, Alfred, for your question. First of all, our uh, chamber is uh, very well connected with the Ukrainian diaspora. Actually, we are part of the Ukrainian diaspora. And uh, all uh, support and help is so multidimensional. First, at, at the individual level. A uh, few um, diaspora members uh, and uh, also members of uh, Canada-Ukraine business community are in Kyiv, like myself. So, and uh, uh, you know, uh, as Barack mentioned, uh, just let's go down at the human level. First, safety. Yeah. So we are trying to provide uh, shelter to uh, those people, to those our colleagues, members uh, who are connected with us uh, and uh, who are just, let's say, in Bucha or maybe in Eastern Ukraine. So we say we call our members and say, if you need to stay in Kiev, welcome, welcome to my home. And just we have people, just we provide our apartments for those people, so food, maybe some money, because sometimes people escape without any belongings. Uh, secondly, let's say about uh, just business, so people have to, to take care about themselves. First, um, evacuation of uh, just maybe vulnerable uh, people, uh, just like children, like uh, elder senior people who can't uh, help themselves. So we do help uh, this. And diaspora is doing a lot. They are collecting the money. And people who are more brave, uh, so they provide for cars and uh, whatever to evacuate people. Also support uh, the staff uh, of the companies. Yeah, and if we say uh, our members and we say our Canadian colleagues who have offices here, just try to pay people at least a little bit and uh, fairly. Uh, not like, uh, you know, top management is paid much more than other stuff. Let's pay fairly this time to let people survive and to, um, to continue uh, the business and to restart the business um, just when time comes. So I, I think that uh, Canada is doing a lot, but Canada is a very conservative country. And we are reporting after things are done, not before, as our government likes. So uh, that's why uh, just uh, I think that in a few months, uh, maybe in three months, if there is interest, we will make a common event 
and uh, tell uh, and report everything our chamber and diaspora and uh, uh, Canada done uh, within this really very, very disturbing and uh, just unprecedented time. So I, I think I have answered your question, but uh, of course you are welcome to follow uh, what Canada is uh, telling about or is not telling about if you, if you have uh, doubts uh, that Canada is not the greatest uh, supporter of uh, Ukraine. So please ask us and we will tell you. But of course, uh, this international community is to help now, as Burak mentioned, that's definitely to be done. And uh, just the role of international community and diaspora too, uh, just to rebuild what was done before, before the 24th of February. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are a business forum yesterday, today. We have heard about grants, loans, we have heard about charity helping the population. May I ask Olga uh, to focus on what can be done in terms of business, since we are in a business forum. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I also give some small stories and small example of uh, how we do it. On 20th of February, we just finalized a project of uh, certification of management consultants and also supporting to start up businesses in Azov region, about 400 new businesses. It was really great project, really. We made a lot of efforts for that. But from f uh, 24th, as we know, uh, most of our consultants and our beneficiaries right now are under occupation or in the war. From the March, we have announced and we had a call for mobilization of management consultants of Ukraine and we start to support businesses. We didn't have money, we did it on a volunteer base, but we understood that our companies, our SME, uh, small and medium businesses, really need professional support. Professional support to relocate their businesses, professional support for marketing, for export from, uh, policy strategy, you know, so uh, for operational management, for fundraising, and other things. And we did it. And for last two months, we do have a project with GIZ and Expert Promotion Office and DIA Business. GIZ, uh, German, German Ministry of Economy. Merci. And uh, right now, we do have already, we are supporting already 170 enterprises. And we, we are looking forward for more companies for more SME and support them with the professional services. How to enter other markets, how to survive. Because just to open grants, just to give money to companies, it's really great. Just to open borders, thank you. Just to decrease some rules or regulations, perfect. But some companies simply do not have resources or do not have competences to do it. And that's why they really need support from, from our side, from professional service side. And this is exactly what we do. I just give you some small examples for the company. So we are, how to say, we are not waiting for, uh, for the end of the world. I mean, we think about it, that it should, it must end every minute. But we start to support businesses from March. And this is exactly what is needed. I will just give you some examples of the company from Bucha, Vesna. She's very, fam they're very famous with cosmetics. And right now we support them with relocation and with new market entrance. Company Kasane, furniture company, who produce furniture with also Ukrainian symbolics. And they stop their production only for some days. And then they proceed their production because people should work. Economy front is very important. You are absolutely right. And people should not hide every day in the underground. They should work. This is also part of freedom. 
and also company Liquor Invest, who produce uh, prothesis for uh, metallic ceramics for bones, artificial uh, bones, and other stuff. It's a very, very famous company, and they also need support. And many other companies, Agrosem, this is a company which I'm really proud of. They support our agribusiness. They found new instruments, new tools, how to do it, how to support them, you know, and they also need professional services support. And also company Green uh, Technologies, which, uh, Greenland, which uh, moved from Mariupol, which did actually garbage recycling, very interesting, very challenging business. They did it in Mariupol, then they moved to Zaporizhia, and now they are moving and relocate their business to Novovolinsk. So we are proud of these companies, but we need to support them. So this is our role in it, and we do it, and this is, we, we are not waiting. We should start right now. We have started, and we will proceed with this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this, Olha. This is really business-related support. And uh, before I will ask Anna Derevianko, who is heading the European Business Association in Ukraine, and who is one of the really important players in this respect in Ukraine, I may just make a mention. When I was maybe two months ago with Gennady Chichikov, at the Federation of Austrian Industries. There was a big discussion and uh, there was uh, the will to provide support to Ukraine. But there was one question from uh, the General Secretary, Mr. Neumeyer. Yes, we would like to help and we, we mean it, we are serious about it. When do you think, however, when will there be a ceasefire? So that means this is the obstacle for direct help, for direct uh, um, uh, foreign investment. Maybe uh, if Anna is with us, I may ask her, how do you see that as top representative of the European Business Association? Many thanks. Hello, everyone. Do you hear me well? Yes. Uh, so, look, uh, I would like really to concentrate on how the business community feels and the, what can we do in order to um, improve resilience of the Ukrainian economy. And in this respect, I would like to start from saying that, you know, um, the first shock for the business community has passed. Because the first weeks, the first months uh, were really um, troublesome, I would say, very tough. But nowadays, we see that the businesses try to concentrate on, on operating and they are partially or fully operational. I will give you a few figures so that you uh, can understand how the businesses look like at the moment. As for the moment, when it comes to small businesses, 21% are fully operational and 38% function with certain limitations. 17% uh, of the business community in small and micro businesses do not work at all. So you see the situation in small and micro businesses is really very negative. When it comes to salaries uh, in small and micro businesses, only 23% of companies pay salary in full. 32% of them reduce salaries. 21 do not pay at all and 12% and, and have cut staff even. We also asked companies uh, from small and micro businesses about reserves, and what kind of capacity they have in order to sustain the situation in case the war is going to continue. And 12% of them said that they have reserve only for one month, 34 for several months, 12% for six months, 5% for more than one year, and 29% of respondents have no reserves at all. The situation looks much better when it comes to big businesses because small and micro is presumably they are feeling worse because of no support from global headquarters. When it comes to the big businesses, the situation is much more rosy because 47% uh, of, of big businesses fully operate and 50% operate with certain limitations. 
So you see, vast majority of the business community uh, feels okay, and only 3% are not working. When it comes to sustaining people and human resources, 63% of our respondents in big businesses pay salaries in full, and 25% pay even additionally to those ones who are relocated outside Ukraine or in the western side of Ukraine. Only 13% have managed to reduce salaries, and 4% actually have sent their employees to unpaid vacations. So you see the situation in big business community is much better. When it comes to um, reserves, in big business community, 34% um, have reserves for six months, 20% for one year, and 19% for more than a nine year of reserve. So we see that the business community stay committed which is also a very good sign uh, from the, from the um, political point of view. So the second part of my speech, what can we do in order to help businesses to sustain and become more resilient and more agile? And so when it comes to this, I would say the first and foremost issue which needs to be settled is that we need to stop war. Make everything possible so that Ukraine and Ukrainians win in this barbarian war because uh, in case it will be done all people will come on oh, not all but majority of people majority of ukrainians will come back and actually foreign countries will not have to you know support very much and the refugees in general mm -hmm. and they will not have to actually send macroeconomic support mm -hmm. in those volumes at least uh, as, as they do now because actually investments will start to come to the business uh, to the environment uh, so that's why the first thing is actually it's necessary to stop work. Whatever we can do, we should do. Because otherwise the world will be really suffering a lot. And the second is tax residence status for displaced people. We raise this issue on political levels many times and this issue needs to be settled because uh, we are approaching already first uh, half a year for certain people who left Ukrainian uh, territory and they are settled in certain countries. And in case this issue will not be politically resolved, obviously those people will have to be re-registered re as fiscal residents of those countries where they are located, which would mean, which could mean actually paying additional taxes uh, to those um, countries where they are, which is not a good scenario for Ukrainian refugees and Ukraine as in general. Third thing uh, uh, to actually help is necessary to use experts for the EU and for the globe. And many things have already been done from the European Union, for example. We have zero tariffs uh, with the EU. We have actually also lots, lots of B2B platforms uh, have been developed uh, so that uh, to allow business matching. And we have to do a lot of other things like a visa free regime for goods, I mean, like ARCA introduction, logistics uh, expansion, and settling. So, lots of stuff which could really ease export potential of the country. And obviously, we can actually have some access to funding because money is really essential thing for Ukrainian, Ukrainians. And we see actually here where we could find uh, room for you know, cooperation with you guys because uh, it's obviously necessary to um, provide some support to Ukraine uh, economy. Uh, and that's why, especially the small and micro business, because you've seen those figures which I mentioned. And this thing, which is also important, it's necessary to invest in Ukraine. Obviously, it is essential thing, but in order to make it done, we need to settle the issue of political risk insurance and uh, in general international insurance of assets and properties. So here is again political um, uh, moment needs to be used, and the political um, environment needs to help. Uh, because without this kind of mechanism, it will be very difficult to expect that the private investors would come to Ukrainian territory while the war is going. Anna, uh, may, I, may I ask you? So you this kind of stuff needs to be settled and conclude. I would like to say that obviously, again, we need to understand that the war needs to be over. This is, this is the thing which, which will help Ukraine, Ukrainian business, Ukrainian economy, and will help you. Because without winning the war, it will be next to impossible to expect that the world is going to, the world is going to be stable and prosperous. Thank you very much. Uh, as you have completely rightly stated, 
uh, also insurance is a very important provider, provisor. First, the political risk insurance, and second, uh, the insurance of property and uh, commercial business, so to say, because also that the big groups, market leaders like Unica, they have gone down with insurance in this respect in a situation when it is double important. Okay, uh, may I thank you very much, please stay with us, may I, this is European Business Association, may I ask Dennis from the US Ukrainian Business Council, what is uh, the point of view, the ideas, the proposals from the American side, uh, having uh, in mind that America is helping Ukraine most of all? Thank you, Alfred. Uh, so, uh, I would like to highlight that each crisis brings opportunities. As my fellow uh, friend Shevkia Jr. is saying, that God, God helps to those who help themselves. Yeah, correct. So, uh, in regards to the U.S., so as you might know, the United States has provided to Ukraine more than, more than all, almost 40 billion dollars financial support. Part of that, of course, going to the military, part of that going to financial support, to uh, macroeconomic support and other things as well. But part of that is going to financial support as well. And this is approximately nine billion dollars. So yes, businesses is looking for opportunities that arise since the war started. I would like to concur my friends, Hinadi uh, Chizhiko, Burak Pehlivan, just and, and remembered five five months ago, six months ago, nobody even thought about that Ukraine will get a, a, a membership status at the European Union. Today we have it. Nobody thought that Ukraine will get access to the European uh, budget. Today we have it. So these are the opportunities and. A lot of businesses, including the United States businesses, they are looking forward to these opportunities and they are looking forward to work with the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian counterparts in order to seize these opportunities and to go and overcome these opportunities. Additionally to that, I would like to say a few words about the United States businesses. I would like to say from my yesterday chat chat that I had here on the arena with Trimble, they are having a great, a great, a great perspective for Ukraine. So two years ago, they have been, they had, they, they were working with Ukraine on some projects, but today this is completely other agenda that we have. I would like to mention about other companies from Turkey, from 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 from, you know, from European Union, from from United States as well. All of them are looking today for the infrastructure for a building. So. To be honest, the, the key issue what we are having today is, of course, the, is the financial support. To be honest, I was, uh, I expected more positive, um, uh, if I may say so, feedback from previous panelists, from Hassan, from Matteo, and from Ersin regarding the financial support to Ukraine. But okay, <laughs> we have what we have. So yeah, but in any case, as I mentioned, the crisis brings opportunities and we need just to use these opportunities because as somebody mentioned from, from the politicians, the opportunities like this, they arise once in 100 years. Of course, the price that we paid since uh, February 24, 23rd is tremendous. But all what we need to do is just not to lose this opportunity, we need to seize this opportunity and we need to go over this opportunity. And all just to highlight and to underline the Ukrainian government and the, uh, and the business, the European business, the Turkish business, the US businesses, they need to become an allies. An allies in uh, development, in allies in reconstruction, in allies in finding ways to work with each other. Because sometimes we had in the past opportunities when they uh, were very very much reluctant to work with each other but okay let's hope that uh, this uh, this times were in the past so just just to highlight so today we have only two 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 ways we can go in fame or we can down in frame if i may say so thank you thank you very much very clear statements we have one last panelist, Alexander. What are your views? You have three minutes, please. Yeah, uh, I think we discussed the subject, how to be uh, resilient, how to be the, to more resilient. And uh, 
the answer of uh, your Ukrainian cluster alliance. I represent it's uh, enough simple, so we should uh, better collaborate at the level of professional community. Uh, for us, it means uh, to be more united, more mobilized, and more um, concentrated on common value, but also common challenges. Regarding common challenges uh, at the level of clusters, which unite more, um, today we unite more than 35 uh, clusters in Ukraine, different industries, uh, more than uh, 2,000 enterprises. Uh, so the, the challenge number one is about uh, order taking. It's not. Uh, uh, it's obvious because, uh, as we said, uh, half of SMEs uh, today is stopped, uh, stopped operations. So uh, it's really where to find a new order. So, and our answer is uh, option is very simple. We should go international. It's not new, uh, but we see a really big, big room uh, for a new opportunities. The world was never so open for Ukraine like today. And in fact, we de deploy today three main uh, strategy. The first one is about joining to international association community. Uh, this year, uh, just in, in uh, previous three months, we joined it to a uh, European Cluster Alliance, which unites more than, uh, sorry, uh, 17 uh, national cluster associations. Uh, we united to a uh, European Institute of Innovation Technologies. Uh, our association, uh, Dust Automation, we joined it to Control System Integrated Association of US. Uh, we also joined it in a similar association, Pan European Association in textile industry, in automotive industry, in metal industry. Um, it means that uh, all these uh, associations, they open door for, for our clusters, our association for free, even if, of course, it costs money. And uh, it's uh, really profitable and very, uh, very interesting for us just because uh, it's an uh, open door for new resources, for uh, their competence, expertise, and so on. And uh, the, the next uh, strategy, we try to go to um, dialogue, and we develop dialogue around uh, not just uh, export-import operation, but a uh, little bit behind, beyond. Uh, we, we, we discuss uh, about, uh, for example, integration to value chain, how we can be better integrated to value chain. And for example, in, uh, for Ukrainian company, in my association, uh, we developed a database of uh, free resources in uh, control system integration, in IT developers, industry market and we uh, proposed it to our um, partner in the US and uh, in Europe and he, he, we, we had immediate um, immediate feedback that yes we need such kind of services just because in many countries uh, there is a lack of uh, yeah, resources uh, the talents and engineers and, uh, and other options uh, can be done with uh, yeah, better integration into um, European program uh, supported by uh, a European Commission like uh, Horizon Europe, like Hori uh, Digital Europe, and so on. There are many, many uh, windows of opportunity today for uh, Ukrainian companies and uh, different categories. And the third one, the strat strategy we developed, we deploy, it's about uh, building bilateral agenda with different countries. For example, the Czech Republic, we started to build uh, agenda around manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. And uh, we, we started just because how to increase participation of Ukrainian SMEs in trade fair in Brno this year. But then we start to think, uh, well, we found uh, many other touch points, uh, for example, in cybersecurity, in, uh, in domain how to develop digital innovation hub, you know, that is main tools for how to increase innovation and digitalization of uh, industrial SMEs. Uh, also, we started to, to exchange uh, um, around Industry 4.0 and so on. So this is just an example which can be multiplied by, by other countries. I think we, we, we can propose a similar agenda for uh, Turkey, just because we are very interested in, for example, uh, Turkish uh, industrial program to be tak. Uh, we don't have in Ukraine such a solid industrial program. So uh, the question, can we replicate, uh, replicate it? Yeah, and, and maybe we, we can go to, to other uh, similar topic in sector of agriculture, of construction, uh, and, and, and so on, so on. And I think we started this discussion with Burak. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, well, finalizing, I, I would say that we are very open for discussion, any kind of for uh, collaboration with, with any countries. And uh, I'd, I'd like also to thank uh, to uh, organizer of this forum uh, to uh, all partners but uh, attendees yeah, because this is really uh, crucial for, for Ukraine to have such kind of support. Thanks. Thank you very much. So if we take us including Anna, we are really representing the business in Ukraine internationally and domestically. 
and uh, that means this is very competent, a very competent uh, panel. Uh, one further question. Uh, as a businessman, I'm used uh, to uh, resort to a SWOT analysis, strengths, Microphone is working again. Uh, chances and threats. Uh, question to you, two minutes maximum per person. Uh, we have heard about infrastructure. Of course, this is extremely important. But talking about industrial sectors, uh, everybody, uh, every business leader knows that you should not work so much to extinguish your weaknesses but that you, sh you should focus to building on your strengths. So what are, in your view, uh, the sectors which should be most supported, apart from infrastructure, because this has been demolished and, and, and destroyed so much, so this is clear. M may I start with Gennady? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, when we, uh, we ask about the future, and the future of the Ukraine, economical future, uh, more or less my contacts with the officials, uh, with experts, with my colleagues demonstrated what we will, a couple of years after the war, we will see absolutely different face of Ukraine, international and the local. From my point of view, uh, Ukraine will be in the, uh, it should be in the, uh, in the this is we see also in the, our program was, was pre uh, represented in Lugana. Uh, I think we have four or five more important directions where we will see uh, our strengths. First of all, we have a very good results previous years of the green, uh, green economy and we will uh, full move, uh, full, uh, move forward because Ukraine don't like to be depends first of all of the gas from Russia from another uh, okay that's why we have only one pos uh, no, possible to be independent in green deal it's very important for us. Second one. Uh, Ukraine is, a, uh, as I said yesterday, it should be move from the uh, breadbasket of Europe of world to the supermarket of the Europe of the world. We need to, uh, together with our uh, colleagues, to start it to process more food processing process will be very important. So, Ukraine, uh, I absolutely sure will be one of the most interesting for uh, outsourcing of the industrialist in the, our territory, where we we will see. I, can, I give you the only one uh, figure. Before the war, 25% of Ukrainian export to Germany was uh, companies, German factories, what were uh, located in the nearby border, who produce the automobile, automobile parts, etc., and moved uh, export back to the uh, Germany. And absolutely sure, after the COVID, after the, uh, we understand the logistic became very expensive, and for Europe it will be one of the most interesting destination for uh, uh, industrial. Okay. Next one, logistic. Logistic. Ukraine very much depends on. Ex uh, export, and uh, we will see a new uh, situation with export. Despite what we heard today, is from my point of view, positive news about what today will be signed agreement about the deblocate uh, of our ports here in uh, in Istanbul. It's very good news. But very uh, in, but anyway, we will see in the couple of years new logistics. It's very important, and we uh, but logistics is a big business, and we needed to unite our efforts. And of course, maybe it. If I should to say about what's first or second, Ukraine is a country with a very high level of IT sectors, and my, from my point of view, it will be all one of the most interesting destination for uh, Ukrainian business and for international business and territory Ukraine. And uh, besides which, Ukraine it will be very attractive after the war, like a touristic destination. Everybody would like, not only company, but a lot of people would like to visit, and we needed to prepare our restaurants and our host, uh, hotels for this. We will need all the dream not only about the finish of the war, but about the how to meet our guests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe Burak, two words, three words, three sentences, maximum. <laughs> two words. <laughs> Thank you. Help us. <laughs> Of course, this is a very good news. Uh, maybe not everybody knows, but it's a new news that today 
We reside in Istanbul, mediated by United Nations and Turkey. This green deal, green corridor, it means partially will be unblocked Ukrainian black sea ports and will let these 27 million tons of grains and sunflower oils and sunflower that go out where are needed. Today, one of the most important topics, which is one of the, I should say, one of the most excellent speech I have read, heard, the Anton speech, this opening these Black Sea ports are very, very important. And today, it will be succeeded in Istanbul, as I mentioned, with the efforts of United Nations and Turkey. One sentence left. Second, Alfred. Of course, Ukraine has a big advantage. It's its resources. Ukraine is a very rich country for natural resources and human resources. We have an old Turkish story, Nasrettin Hoca. That guy likes very much Turkish dessert halva. And even his home, he asks his wife every day what we have. To have halva, you need very simple ingredients. It's butter, it's wheat, it's sugar. And as you need somebody eat it, and it's not set to nausea. And every day, it's something is left, something less that. And one day, he collected everything, and at the end, no halva as well. So because one people should prepare it. So I am sure that if the old conditions will be ready, with all these resources, human resources, and natural resources, Ukrainian nation will be able to do what need to do done. And Ukraine will be a bright, a prosperous, a democratic, a free, an example country in Europe and in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I have been asked to shorten the panel, and I have been asked uh, to let uh, Damien Buch, what's his name, Bukat, uh, to have a short statement. Is he here? Yes. Will he be online? So please come to the stage. Sorry that you could not contribute from the very beginning. Take, take my microphone. Come here while you have it. Do it from there. So. Please. Okay. Well, well yours. Thank, thank you very much. I was originally going to join the panel, but there were too many excellent speakers and great ideas and not enough chairs. Uh, so excuse me uh, for doing this from the lectern. Um, and I'll make it short because I have the uh, position of giving some remarks after a long, interesting panel session, but just before the lunch break. So we really we heard some very sobering views of the state of the economy, but also optimism and hope about what can be done. And for me, a huge take out of everything that was said here is that businesses want to work, they're motivated, they want to connect with uh, their partners abroad, but it's very difficult to do so. And so what we've been trying to do at the International Chamber of Commerce is really facilitate that as much as possible, to broker those international uh, connections and connect the regional chambers of commerce with those abroad. We've also set up a centre of entrepreneurship for Ukraine, which is really focused on helping the Ukrainian refugee diaspora, especially in Europe, building a B2B matchmaking platform to connect businesses in Ukraine with those abroad, and accelerating the rollout of a trade finance tool that helps Ukrainian businesses access credit in obviously very difficult circumstances. But the takeout for me is that there are so many organizations doing so much here, and the key question for us as a business community is how do we scale that? And so from my, my final remark here is that what we can do at the International Chamber of Commerce with our uh, more than 10,000 chambers as part of the network in over 130 countries, is we can help you scale these projects. 
So anyone with uh, concrete ideas for how to connect Ukraine with the world, please do uh, come to us and we can roll out good ideas uh, across our network and really just see us as, as an ally for not just Ukraine, but all of the uh, work that your organizations uh, are doing. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much. I can't agree more. International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, is an extremely important umbrella. Before we stop this panel, I still want to ask Anna. Uh, you have a lot of experience, Anna, concerning uh, uh, sectorial uh, priorities which have to be set. Uh, what's, uh, what, what are your thoughts in this respect, Anna? Are you still there? Yes or no? Yeah. I said uh, uh, I was asked uh, uh, just some minutes ago to shorten the panel. And since uh, the ICC representative has to leave, I had to take him in, in between. I would ask you, um, with the, uh, in the remaining maximum uh, three, four, five minutes, uh, to tell us your thoughts. Uh, which Ukrainian industry sectors, apart from infrastructure, which should be, should, uh, should be prioritized? Uh, if I understood well, so you, you're asking about priorities of industries, right? If, uh, if they yes, have yes, have yes. Have uh, you can't do everything with the same speed, with the same impetus. So you should uh, uh, build on the strength of uh, Ukraine rather than try to eliminate the weaknesses. Yeah, uh, this is a man. somehow find global expert markets because what I hear from companies at the current stage they understand that the local market is going to be um, really declining in the nearest future uh, at least for the upcoming several months because the outlook is not very optimistic uh, according to their um, expectations but nevertheless companies uh, are Also, when it comes to the industries which would be interesting to invest in in Ukraine, is obviously the main agriculture, uh, logistics, digital sphere. This is, uh, by, by the way, digital sphere almost uh, did not lose anything, and they, and they continue to work like they, they used to before the war started. Uh, and they will remain so as soon as uh, this, the war is going to be over, they will be just continue um, operating further. Uh, so it means that we have lots of potential in those areas, uh, which I said, uh, agriculture, logistics, and uh, digital. Plus to that, obviously, Ukraine will, will probably need to utilize this military uh, industry and develop it. So whatever you, uh, can be offered in that area, this is a new niche, which would be highly demanded. And uh, I think that the banking sector, sector, which is now currently doing all right, they try to maintain this macroeconomic stability in the country. They will be also very good uh, you know, supporter to all those investments, all those opportunities, uh, which, uh, which will be emerging in the business environment. Uh, so that's why it's very hard really to forecast the upcoming months because uh, the, the horizon is very... Uh, I, would, I would say vague and very cloudy, so that's why we cannot understand what to expect. But nevertheless, main fundamental things, they remain, uh, they remain as I outlined. Thank you. Thank you very much. Clear-cut statement. That was the purpose. I have uh, Emma.
You want to make a short statement still? Just, I would like to add uh, to and continue what Borak has said. If you're asking about the uh, sectors to be supported in the first turn, and which will be very, very profitable, and if you are going to do business with Ukraine. So I think that this sector is local production. People can't live without heat and without food. Yeah, they can even live without the electricity, uh, believe me. And uh, uh, I think that uh, local production of food essential needs, like family milk farm, a family business, small craft business, but uh, uh, everything is to, is to be produced locally, because logistics uh, now is difficult, it, and uh, logistics can be broken at every moment. If community has a local production of these essentials, like uh, maybe a small um, uh, a boiler house, uh, a small uh, just uh, bakery, a small uh, family uh, milk farm, so the community will survive. So I think that local production will be next uh, boosting business in Ukraine. It's my point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two sentences from you, or sorry, we are in a hurry. One sentence, even better. Open it. Is it working? Oh, yes. good. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, I want to say uh, my, uh, my attitude to it. I do not like any sectorial focus. Does it mean that all other sectors should die? What do you mean we should choose the sector? What should we do with other sectors? So just let us, uh, let all our sectors to be survived, okay? okay? All our small and medium businesses to be survived. And of course, local production, this is really should be stressed. Because you, we wouldn't be, we would, don't want to be import oriented. We want to be uh, self esteemed and export oriented. This is our position, and uh, please don't kill other sectors which are not focused on in Lugano and other articles. Thank you. This was certainly not intended, but the question is sometimes you have to set priorities. Shevki, you wanted to make a statement. I just wanted to make a suggestion rather than a statement because you know, 90%, 95% of uh, business is represented here. Um, on the humanitarian front, uh, there is great solidarity uh, from the rest of the world with Ukraine. And you have members from both sides of the partnership of Ukraine with each of the country. Why don't you try to create, if you haven't already, a platform for business solidarity that would partner uh, one company with a company from the West to support in whichever way that support could work. They can sort it out. But create some platform for people, for companies, to be able to support individually each other. That's my suggestion. Perhaps it could work. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I have to close this panel uh, early, 15 minutes earlier than intended. Uh, thank you for your patient, patience. I do think that we had some quite interesting topics and that we came uh, quite to the point. I just would like to make a, a final statement, uh, a topic we could not work on today due to lack of time, and that is we all know that there are millions of people abroad. Okay, it's mainly women with their children. We know that there are millions of people displaced. So one of the focuses in future, in any case, should be how to secure uh, workforce and how to get back. It is a sign that you need to wrap up. <laughs> And how to get back 
the people who have the brain Nothing to speak still. So everything has been said. What can I do? Thank you. Just have fun. I just want to show you that it's. It's a sign Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Applause. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and honor to address you here today. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, we had some um, miscommunication with the video, but we will start soon. And uh, we have one final session before we start our lunch break. So I want to thank uh, for our last panel to all our dear speakers. And n right now we will be proceeding with a video from uh, Honorable Senator David Wells from the Canadian Senate. And after that, I will introduce our next panel. of not just Ukraine, but of the world. As I begin, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference, the government of Ukraine, the International Trade Council, and of course, our host country, Turkey. In the aftermath of World War II, Europe Plan was born. The Marshall Plan was a United States sponsored international.
So we are also sending our thanks to Senator David Wells. And right now we will pro proceed with the next panel before lunch. This will be about Ido Pomoga, presentation from the Ministry of Social Policy of Ukraine. First of all, we will have a Zoom connection with Honorable Konstantin Koshalanko, Deputy Minister of Social Policy of Ukraine for Digital Development, Digital Transformation and Digitalization in Ukraine. No Zoom. Zoom or video? Okay, so we will start. Hi. Hi. Yes, so it is. Welcome, uh, and this, uh, this stage is yours, Mr. Minister. Let's start, colleagues. Dear ladies and gentlemen, partners, uh, friends, and colleagues, uh, glad to see you after watching part of the forum online yesterday. Uh, between uh, us, a hundreds of kilometers of the Black Sea and Ukrainian land, some of which uh, has been temporarily occupied by Russian forces, but I feel uh, that we are close and united in our partners and efforts and ways. And uh, thank you for the strong support. We have a presentation for you. Just uh, a second. I need to open it. Okay, I see. I see that you see the presentation. And uh, I need to talk uh, to you that uh, the stability of Ukraine, first of all, now determined at the front and the, on the battlefield where our soldiers defend our country from the Russian army. But the stability of the country is also about the function of the state wise. The country, which, uh, the continuity of social protection of people who do not retreat from the attacked territories and occupied territories that have become internally displaced uh, person in Ukraine. Today, uh, we, will tell, we will tell about a digital solution that helps support Ukraine anywhere in the world. Uh, but uh, uh, first of all, uh, but first of all, I need uh, to uh, talk with you about the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. Um, one second. Yes, we, we can hear you.
my colleague Lilia will tell you more about this function after me. Thank you very much. And right now, Lilia Lishnansky. And third function, third function. So to collect application from citizen okay. along with up-to-date bank details, cell phone numbers, and consent to the transfer of personal data, You don't hear me? Yes, yes, yes. We hear you. Um, I will tell uh, in detail... Technical uh, problems? No, no. All right. Uh, I am Lilia Lishnyansk. I am uh, advisor uh, Ministry of Social Policy. And uh, I will tell um, about uh, uh, volunteer assistant uh, in detail. Um, we have developed two main... Uh, direction on volunteer, volunteer um, uh, assistance uh, is uh, the first uh, um, uh, assistance peer-to-peer -peer and online uh, assistance volunteer. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer assistance uh, provides an opportunity to select an application with uh, the need of person located in some region. After estab establishing um, contact, uh, the volunteers can uh, uh, as a purchase and provide directly to the person the products and basic basic um, uh, basic uh, needs uh, that the person um, such uh, of transfer these items from their own stocks. Uh, the very interesting uh, second. Um, uh, Solutions. In the case of online assistance, the volunteer uh, does not need uh, to look for the products somewhere and transfer them. The volunteer just simply makes a prepayment and the uh, recipient uh, just uh, receives a code with certificate of IDPOMOGA via an SMS. Uh, it is provided in a form of a gift certificate for products. Uh, the person uh, who received the barcode uh, through SMS can buy products in any store of the partner retail chain by paying for them with uh, his code. Uh, in such a way, the volunteer provides a grocery set for a person or family. After the purchase of the products uh, by a person, the volunteer uh, receives uh, an SMS uh, what uh, this certificate has has been used and uh, a message of uh, uh, this message is uh, um, gar gar uh, guarant uh, for the fact um, uh, his uh, donate uh, use additionally um, the volunteer receives a link to the grocery stores uh, he received he received uh, appro approval that uh, the money were, uh, were used uh, correctly. Uh, when the volunteer receives uh, such a check, he um, uh, feels that uh, he really uh, needs uh, concrete uh, uh, people sitting in, in Ukraine. Uh, the almost uh, is small. We have available uh, demonstra uh, denom denomination um, about uh, six, uh, seven, uh, or uh, seventeen on uh, thirty uh, dollars. But uh, it could be uh, for specific uh, person or, or family to eat for several uh, days. We have introduced some um, restriction on products. Uh, 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 it's alcohol and uh, tobacco prod products uh, uh, cannot uh, be purchase, uh, purchased by certificate. Uh, all uh, other uh, products uh, uh, are available. Uh, our platform is uh, under the process uh, of developing. Uh, more and more volunteers uh, from different countries uh, are supporting Ukrainian citizens uh, through the platform. Uh, today, uh, today there are 27 uh, countries uh, and uh, the leading countries we, uh, we, can, uh, we can see uh, in the, our infographics. Uh, the structure of citizen uh, needs uh, we uh, show in infographics and uh, uh, the today over uh, over 
57% uh, uh, people uh, uh, need uh, a food and 50% uh, uh, is uh, hygienic products and 12% is uh, pharmacy. Uh, that is uh, uh, reason why um, our team uh, focused uh, prima primarily uh, on food products uh, because uh, you can see uh, food is uh, uh, more important uh, in uh, our needs. Uh, um, platform uh, other plat platform indicators we show in our um, presentation uh, and uh, I I will say that uh, over uh, 80, seven, uh, 17 um, volunteers uh, uh, um, active uh, uh, satisfied uh, of need uh, uh, about uh, uh, 3,000 uh, our um, uh, household. But uh, the, the, uh, now NAS uh, the large uh, problem because uh, people who uh, who need uh, help uh, is uh, more uh, more than people who can uh, support and assistance our people. Uh, our Edupomoga um, uh, platform was developed by Ministry of Social Policy with the support of the Ministry of Digital Transformation. With the UNDP, it's a United Nations Development Program uh, with support of the Swedish uh, government in co and uh, in cooperation with the US Help Ukraine 22 uh, Operation Polynesia. Uh, it's a um, committee for open democracy and uh, active uh, particip participation of MasterCard Ukraine. Um, next, go ahead, please. Uh, next uh, slide, yes. Um, I, um, I can uh, talk about uh, our um, partner, uh, pa partnership. Uh, uh, the one of the first um, to respond was the company uh, for the group. Uh, it's a um, uh, big Ukrainian uh, food chain, uh, include uh, over um, 60, uh, 600 uh, uh, shops, um, and uh, which include Silpo, uh, uh, um, Fora, and uh, other. Uh, uh, other food shops. Uh, this retail uh, chain covers almost the entire country, and together we transformed uh, trans uh, the process, which uh, in a peaceful uh, life um, uh, is called uh, gift certificate. Uh, we, uh, through uh, um, through this uh, system uh, to give volunteers from all over the world uh, the opportunity to support Ukrainian families uh, directly. Uh, with uh, this aim, uh, we develop uh, an interface uh, that uh, always people from different uh, countries to enter our platform, uh, view requests for help after reading uh, a brief description of the application, choose a specific family uh, and uh, in a specific, specific, specific uh, region, um, maybe a specific uh, city or district. Um, in the description form, people write about themselves. Uh, when you read the stories, uh, your heart uh, uh, it hurt you, your head. Um, and I uh, can say about uh, our uh, big um, uh, uh, collaboration MasterCard with uh, product uh, chain. Uh, uh, so, uh, since uh, of the, uh, the first July, we started a three months promotion in the FOSI for the group retail chain with the support of MasterCard. If the benefactor pays uh, for the certificate uh, with uh, MasterCard, uh, uh, the amount of assistance incre increase uh, depends 
on the uh, amount of the certificate. And uh, I will uh, say about uh, uh, our uh, uh, ways in super assistance uh, citizen. It's the first is food, uh, the second is pharmacy, and third is uh, gas and oil station. Uh, we, we believe that this is, this is a, a very important uh, tool because uh, when money, money is collected by large funds, uh, large international institutions, they have uh, their own operation system. Uh, they spend part of the money uh, of their existence. Uh, they are a bit bureaucratic and so on. And um, uh, there you can help uh, people directly. Uh, of course, the platform uh, does not conflict with international organization, but um, complements them. Um, uh, after all uh, international institutions, such uh, as uh, Red Cross, uh, for example, work even um, in the areas uh, of uh, hostilities and uh, temporary uh, occupied territories where, where we cannot uh, provide assistance assistant with uh, the, these tools uh, uh, in a certificate form uh, in our platform. Uh, our country is quite advanced uh, in terms of digitalization and uh, DIA is uh, used by almost uh, 20 million citizens. Even Elderly people and uh, people with low income have a simplest smartphone. Uh, this, uh, this is en uh, enough uh, to live in uh, application um, and uh, then receive uh, the support. Uh, I would like um, to draw attention and uh, to the fact that Idupomoga is uh, multi-vector tools. After all, um, it does not only help a specific person um, or, or family who receives food, uh, medicine and food. Uh, it helps the entry delivery chain uh, because um, Mm, uh, this is uh, the support of the supermarket uh, where people work. Uh, this is the support of national produ producer uh, of goods. Uh, from the point of view of the econo economy, it is very, it is very m m much better than just when humanitarian aid uh, uh, is delivered by distribute distributed. Uh, 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 only food or another, uh, because uh, in other humanitarian aids, uh, um, every every who works uh, in the delivery chain is also supported by by either Pomoga and uh, benefactors. Uh, Integration uh, with the is uh, our plan um, and uh, is currently is in progress. Uh, it will be possible to register this through the DIA application on the IDOPOMOGA platform. Uh, this will be uh, will, uh, additional verification of both vol um, volunteers and aid recipients. So uh, that there is not fra fraud. Uh, there are no dozen of applications from the, uh, some people. Uh, uh, the Pomoka platform is not uh, only for our time. Uh, in, in already understand that uh, for sure. After the war, Ukraine will be rebuilt a lot and uh, the need for resources will remain. People will be spending major funds of rebuilding their homes, uh, so they will need help. Uh, we hope that the international community will continue to support Ukraine even after our victory. It necessary for, uh, for uh, to understand that uh, People in need uh, section of uh, our population, population is people with disabilities, single mothers, large families, people with uh, low, low income, uh, etc. Uh, continue to, to receive support from the state by applying uh, to social protection centers. But uh, now there are also uh, who's who did not need such support before the war. Uh, 
this uh, young and strong people who found uh, themselves without money uh, or work at all. And I am sincerely grateful for the international communities understanding for this problem, uh, that all Ukrainians are currently suffering regardless and of age and sta status. Uh, we hope that over time, after our victory, we, the number of people in need will decrease, but a uh, platform for aid our project will be needed even in peacetime. In Pomoga is new experience in charity, and after all, help is available in a few clicks from any country. country is 100% uh, targeted. Konstantin, please continue. I hear you very bad. I hear only uh, can, can operators. But I need uh, to uh, talk uh, to you that we are open to interaction. If you are interested in cooperation with platform or with partners, if you are interested to launch a platform to help people in your country, we would be happy to share our experience. And thank you for your attention and your support. I ask organizers and participants, participants to share a video about our platform and links to pages and social networks. Only together, we will be able to strengthen Ukrainians who are fighting for independence, peace, and the entire democratic world. Try to help through the platform. Thank you very much, Honorable Konstantin Kosilenko, and thank you very much, Lilia Ryshenko. Now it's time to watch the video that we're talking about. Finally, you realize that the most valuable thing in this world is life. Ukraine is fighting for people's lives, for the end of war, and for peace on Earth. Thank you very much. We will be shortly. Uh, we will be having a lunch break right now, and at one thirty, sorry, at one thirty, we'll be back on stage. And in the meantime, those who are here can watch the videos that are being running.
Ses kontroll. Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Yes. For the for our Zoom speakers, uh, can you please uh, do thumbs up if you can hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Yeah, no. I will anyway leave the stage to you after the introduction. Just the mics. Yeah, they're all set, open. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome back for the second half of today. And right now the panel will be on overcoming supply chain and logistics disruptions. And our moderator is going to be Olga Trofimova, cluster manager from Ukrainian Automotive and Mobility Cluster. I will shortly pass the stage to her. I just want to introduce shortly our speakers. We will have Ukrainian Logistics Alliance presidents, Edwin Persons. We will have project manager and head of export sales from Spezek Hosnaska Limited from Ukraine online, Maria Chebisheva. And then we will have Maxim Anisimov, deputy director of development from VD Mice Ukraine. And we will have Alexander Yurshak, CEO of Association of Industrial Automation of Ukraine and head of Ukrainian Cluster Alliance. We will have Nadia Shaban, HR Director of Leoni. We will have Martin Gobal, Commercial Plant Manager from Kronberg and Schubert. Thank you very much. Your stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I would like to, to start a short presentation about our cluster. And uh, definitely then I, I would like to uh, give the floor to our panelists, which I respect a lot and which I would like to share to share uh, to share their things, their thoughts and their presentation. But the main message I would like to say to all all of you uh, that we uh, we are definitely would like to survive. We would like to have working economy, and we, as an active part of economic front, we really faced with such problems which we uh, which started from February this year. 
But we do have capacities and we do have high competence of our companies because they already supply for such a great companies, which you see. And definitely those suppliers, very respective companies, are right now with us and I, I will give them the floor. As you see, actually, historically, uh, the biggest uh, players and key players of automotive industry in Ukraine are based in the western part of Ukraine. And some of them are still in the central or eastern part and trying to survive and trying to move, to move forward, actually. Uh, as for the statistics, short, very short, I know that you are maybe boring with all this presentation, but uh, Ukraine is really have automotive industry and Ukraine really has this uh, uh, 60,000 employees which are working only for foreign automotive industry, but we do have also a Ukrainian automotive industry. That is why uh, I invited two companies which represent the best automotive companies with foreign investments and two best automotive companies which represent Ukrainian, fully Ukrainian companies. And definitely, definitely uh, we are strong and I would like you to to hear their stories, to hear how they survive and how they move forward. So I would like to uh, give the floor to Nadia uh, Shaban, uh, who is a chart director of uh, Leone company, well-known company, who has 6,000 employees in Ukraine. And the company in Ukraine is already exist for 20 years. Uh, Nadia, please describe the challenges you had from the beginning of the war and how you managed to solve it. Thank you. The screen at first. Am I sharing? Yes. Fine. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are from Ukraine. This is a typical uh, words from Ukrainians that you can hear every day. Uh, I'm happy to present today Ukraine and uh, my name is Nadia Shaban. I'm a chart director at uh, Leoni Production Plant, uh, which is the part of international company Leoni AG. Uh, on the, as we are also a member of the automotive class, I was asked by Olga to share with you our success uh, story. How did we manage to continue in this uh, difficult time for Ukraine? Uh, as was mentioned by Olga. So let me share with you how did we, uh, the, the story of our recovery. So uh, 21st February for all of us was a shock as for the, uh, each and every Ukrainian. And uh, uh, for sure, we released and sent home all our employees uh, to give them possibility to take care of their families. And in the meantime, uh, the management team were not stopping for even for a day. Every day we were coming together to think over how can we move further, what should we do, what should we do, our next steps, because it uh, was difficult to plan far away, so we were thinking about the next day, and uh, uh, in this time, starting from 20th of February, we were preparing the safe conditions at first for our employees, and then thinking how can we recover. We received a solid support from our board members, uh, LAG, and with the help of them having an uh, everyday meeting on a daily basis with the task, task force team. Uh, in the, the team which includes the high level management of the company, we were even prepared this start of production. Uh, on meantime, on the 2nd of March, our employee, female Ukrainian employees received the possibility to also to move uh, with their children to Romanian plants. Uh, so we also have uh, plants in Romania.
Thank you very much, Nadia. And uh, it's really, really important for us, for all of us, for all the Ukrainians to, to hear your story and to share it to, to the whole world. Thank you so much. Martin, may I ask you also to, to take the floor and I would like to introduce you. It's a big honor uh, that our member of our cluster, Martin Goebel, Commercial Management Director of two production plants, Kronberg and Schubert in Ukraine, which also operates in Ukraine for 15 years and also supply to many countries and to many brands, which I showed you already, uh, also joined us and also would like to share his story. Please, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you so much for, for your efforts and uh, thank you so much that you stay in Ukraine and you stand with Ukraine. Uh, so th thank you so much, Martin. Thank you so much that you stay in Ukraine and that you stand with Ukraine. Really, really, it's very important for all of us. So, Maria Chebyshova, I would like to introduce you and your company, uh, Spezia Hasnaska. It's one of the first independent automotive company in Ukraine, which this year celebrates 33 years old and which really has zero foreign investments and supply to Mercedes, BMW, Volkswagen, and even Bentley and other famous brands. Maria Chebyshova, please, floor is yours. 
Um,
Thank you so much, Mari. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, so the next uh, the next speaker will be Maxim Anisimov. This is a company also 100% Ukrainian company, 100% Ukrainian company who is a leader in electronic industry already for more than 25 years. So please uh, tell us, Maxim, your story, how you uh, work with all challenges you have during the war.
Thank you very much, Maxime, for inspiring speech. And uh, really, I would like to add from my side that our uh, Ukrainian automotive cluster is really working on uh, promoting on promoting our Ukrainian business to all over the world, to show all the world all the world that it is possible and it is actually big opportunity also for the whole world to make production in Ukraine, to make orders, to place orders in Ukrainian companies. We are capable, we are definitely competent, and we definitely could be your reliable partners. So actually Ukraine, even preceding the question of Alfred Prowse, yes, even if this sector is not priority right now. So definitely it will survive and definitely we will work further. And automotive sector is definitely kind of barometer of any economy of any country. And we really would like to uh, invite more automotive companies to Ukraine and invite more partners to Ukraine in automotive industry. Because exactly automotive industry is the peak of industriali industriality and uh, management system and many other developments definitely will lead us forward and will for, uh, give us opportunity to move forward. That is why our Ukrainian automotive and mobility cluster really have such a goals and missions and to, to be a reliable partner in automotive industry for the whole world. So uh, we, I just want to mention also that we also a member and even even establisher of one of establishers, sorry, of Ukraine, uh, European Automotive Cluster Network, and from the beginning of the war, uh, Automotive Cluster no Network really support us a lot, and we had a lot of a lot of common events and and uh, other things. But I would like right now to give the floor to our another speaker, uh, because many many questions which we faced at the beginning of the war. It concerns logistics, and that is why uh, our next speaker, uh, Edwin Berzins, uh, would uh, will explain us about logistic issues and challenges in Ukraine. Thank you very much, Olga. I come closer to you. It's very tough always after lunchtime, actually, to the first session and. Uh, Yes, my name is Edwin Berzinch. I'm originally from Latvia, from European Union, but uh, the last two years I uh, work in Ukraine, and uh, right now I represent uh, Ukraine Logistics Alliance. As yesterday all speakers actually mentioned, and also today, uh, the war changed everything also in uh, logistics. And uh, we are speak a lot about investments, about how companies are working right now, how, how they are actually uh, try to do everything. But uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the main questions today, how all these products, services can deliver to customer? or actually receive uh, actually equipment for pre producing as such. And uh, I just, uh, it's very tough in the five minutes actually to, to, uh, to give all um, problems what we have right now, but uh, I try to actually just uh, strengthen in, in some of them. Just one figure, uh, actually last year, 150 million tons actually exported from the Black Sea uh, regions. Yes, you can imagine how many is it. Right now, also yesterday, everybody mentioned that these actually borders are closed right now. It means that only way how Ukraine companies can export is just actually through the borders actually European borders or borders that uh, Ukraine have with their neighbors. But uh, I'll be very honest, our neighbors, it's not ready for such amount of actually uh, cargo or such. Why I'm saying this 150 million tons? Because 
if we turn this 150 million tons to border to the also the ports to the, for example, the Baltic Sea, actually it's a really huge amount. Today we see there's a sore shortage of infrastructure, shortage of uh, uh, capacity, and uh, we should look to the situations, what we should do right now, what we should act right now, and we, what we should actually do for tomorrow. And why I'm telling this, because if investors looking to invest also Ukraine, one of the main point, it's again logistics or transportation. And for sure, every investor looking to this and he should be aware that it's possible to deliver all products to the end customer or receive materials for it. Right now, uh, if we're looking to borders Ukraine and, for example, European Union, uh, the queue of auto and also the rail, actually, it's, it's very huge. For example, today, there is around 35,000 wagons, 35,000 wagons waiting for actually reloading to European Union. Actually, the waiting time, it means it's around 30 days. You can imagine how many it costs also from an investment point of view. On this sense, uh, I see that uh, for sure, uh, Ukraine companies actually and logistics companies, expeditors forwarding, doing a lot and doing a lot by ourselves trying to find the good partners uh, abroad, finding totally new logistics actually uh, routes as such. And what I see from the numbers, actually it's again numbers, actually uh, they succeed in it. But it's again, uh, one, what I also uh, support for it, dry ports at the borders with Ukraine. It's already last two years, actually many companies, private companies already building up these dry ports, uh, which means that at the border we have good hub. Maybe for audience, I would like to say there is some, some problems also for these uh, terminals. There is actually, uh, you think, for example, to railway uh, in Ukraine, uh, one train actually consists of 57 wagons. It might be 3,000 tons, also uh, 5,000 tons in the one train. If we're going to your Perun, it's just, uh, uh, it depends on country, it depends on situation, but just 1,000. You can imagine it means that from the one train, actually, there will be the three trains. And also, if we look from the gauge size, we again, we know very well that in Ukraine, 1,520 millimeter gauge is wider as the European Union have right now. And one of the uh, long perspective, or actually perspective for the future, actually it's, it's uh, really building the European Union gauge, for example, to the Lyov, because it helps really connect uh, with infrastructure, Ukraine with European Union, also with, uh, with the robotics, when we will be ready the robotic uh, project as such. And then for the future, we might deliver as many as possible tons. But it's again, if we look into facts, if there is a, there was many questions about grain. Uh, a calculate what's the possibilities for terminals or ports in uh, all Baltic states also in Poland. It's just around 20 million. Actually, it's yes, it's something, but it's nothing if you compare how many tons actually we have in Ukraine right now, we have in Ukraine right now, and we should deliver all this grain to customers as such. And uh, for this, also, my, should be actually 
for my understanding, some decision also from European Union and from European Union Commission actually to build up the temporary warehouses at the border because right now everybody understand we need actually delivered from Ukraine as many as possible also the grain sunflowers what we actually uh, speakers discussed previously and then afterwards then already slowly we can actually deliver to the ports and deliver to the customers because still shortage of wagons shortage of automotives shortage of uh, uh, locomotives as such it's right now but if you actually uh, today uh, trying to offer it I will try and produce, it will be just in three years, it's ready. But we should act today, it's again. Uh, what I say also, we should ask also the Turkish colleagues actually help with us, because I know there is a good producer, there is a wagons which can actually use for actually European Union um, growth side. Why I'm talking maybe also about European Union. We are talking on supply chain. Because if you are a customer, you can, uh, uh, you can actually solve every questions in Ukraine till the border, but then you need actually also res uh, all problems uh, to solve in European side and also to the ports and also to the end customers. I'll be finished, yes. Uh, uh, yes, I'll be very short. Uh, just one more point. We as a Ukraine Logistics Alliance try to support our members and not only members actually to put all market players together for setting up the real chain point to point. Thank you very much and uh, actually once more we should act today but not just talking but actually after in these minutes actually step by step actually setting all, uh, up and solving all these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah. Definitely logistic is really a crucial point and uh, definitely when we make a decision we should took all facts into consideration to make a proper decision. So I would like also to give the floor to Alexander, uh, who, who will tell you a bit uh, about, not, on, not only about our Ukrainian cluster alliance, which I'm also an active member of, but also about other initiatives and how to support our companies with the existing, existing platforms. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Olga. Uh, I'm not a big uh, expert specialist in uh, logistics, but uh, I would like to share with you uh, our um, uh, experience in the Ukrainian Cluster Alliance regarding uh, uh, supply chain and uh, logistic uh, issue. So, as I said uh, this morning, that uh, logistic uh, in our, let's say, rating is on the second place after taking order, and uh, we had uh, a lot of demand uh, from our cluster about how to cope with uh, logistics, uh, because at the beginning, especially early March, it was uh, also complicated by government decision about so-called uh, list of critical uh, import goods and, and so on. So the situation was really very tough uh, uh, in March. And uh, as far as we have a lot of cluster, different industries, so we we were really very concerned of this, uh, this topic. and. Uh, we try to resolve it by grouping just uh, uh, our experts in different working group and also using many uh, available tools from uh, from European Union uh, like uh, digital platform. I, I will talk about a few of them. Uh, so we created with the help of European Cluster Alliance uh, so-called marketplace where our clusters and their members they, uh, could put uh, all demand and uh, from uh, the side of uh, cluster of European Union, we expected uh, the some proposal offers, and you see also the uh, window of logistic because the logistic was uh, really crucial uh, at the beginning. And uh, everybody from European Union asked us uh, how to cope with logistic because it was clear that uh, well, even for humanitarian aid, 
uh, it is a problem. So we uh, we prepared our experts. Some uh, it was our first uh, position paper where we uh, produced this policy paper about uh, current state, possibility, and, and solution. Where we collected all information to uh, our colleagues uh, how to cope with that uh, with uh, exact. Uh, um, contact of a logistic operator with some uh, solution and so on. And uh, of course we try to uh, produce uh, some solution um, internally. Uh, here you see just a uh, screenshot from, from different operator logistics. There are many, many of them proposing different solution. Uh, also some different marketplace for especially for cargo so this is uh, I will mention later a bit so and also we um, try to use um, the typical solution for cluster like matchmaking if there is any kind of demand we we can find proposals but this is the role of cluster uh, to to do this matching yeah between uh, demand and proposal and this is a really role that somebody uh, was mentioned this morning about platform, uh, um, well, we are proud of our IT community and there is, there is a lot of different uh, tools every year in Ukraine uh, and uh, just in the area of logistics and purchasing, we have more than 10 different platforms resolving resolve different uh, issues. And uh, of course, we use uh, we, we use also a platform of, uh, as I mentioned, uh, European cluster collaboration platform, uh, B2B Match, it's a European enterprise network, and, and so on. So there is a, a number of uh, digital tools we can use for matchmaking, including uh, logistic and uh, supply chain issue. Uh, you maybe you know this. Uh, uh, new uh, tools, uh, re relatively new. Uh, it's uh, uh, Ukraine Solidarity Lane. It's how to to uh, to move uh, 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 food products, uh, especially grain, from from Ukraine. Yeah, because Black Sea is blocked. So, and typically such tools propose just matching that. Uh, uh, for example, the port uh, in Poland and the uh, Ukrainian manufacturing of grain, they, they resolve these, uh, some, some problems themselves. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't work as, uh, let's say, itself. Uh, it needs much more support. Uh, anyway, um, this, this is such tools like B2B uh, matchmaking platform are really useful for, uh, for let's say, for initial contact, for, for matching, to find a good partner. And sometimes they, they can resolve the situation or issue with uh, supply chain. Uh, but anyway, even here on figures, you see that a uh, number of uh, from Ukrainian side and from other countries. So, uh, well, as I was told uh, many times today that we need more uh, international support. And this is just example. The, yeah, we, we don't see too much uh, participants from other country. And this is the same situation we had uh, on marketplace on ECCP, uh, European Cluster Collaboration Platform. Uh, so we we have also some uh, internal tools just for Ukrainian participant in our cluster alliance uh, just to, to match a different kind of uh, demand. Yeah, it can be not just about uh, um, logistic, but also about uh, fundraising, about uh, relocation, and uh, and so on. Uh, so I just uh, our time is limited, so I I finish. Uh, so our experience, let's say, uh, with using uh, digital platform for a supply uh, value chain issue, um, is um, is so that uh, well there are, there are maybe uh, too many or uh, uh, really many platform which uh, in this area, but there is no uh, a universal platform. Typically, many platform are very dedicated to resolve uh, different issue. Uh, well, uh, business, of course, uh, try to, to use maximum these tools uh, like digital platform, but well, we, my opinion is that we are at the limit of these tools of digitalization. Uh, in fact, uh, the true solution, I, I, maybe I agree with uh, Edwin that um, solution should be uh, found as rather the level of uh, political issue because uh, it's rather uh, a decision from government and from a decision from the European Union and Ukraine uh, with regards to uh, custom corridor, uh, technical limitation, and so on. It's briefly about our experience. Thanks, Olga.
And by the way, uh, you are uh, today have birthday, so thanks, thanks for your job. And uh, let's upload this to Olga for, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, this forum, it was a big uh, opportunity to meet Alexander uh, in life because uh, we collaborate from the beginning of the war every day with the UCCP platform and with all other activities, but we never, we never saw each other. So thank you for all our organizers. Thank you for Tristan. I'm sure without you it wouldn't be possible. Thank you for ITC. It wouldn't be possible without at all. So uh, just, just, just to finalize, uh, again, the position which we would like to show to the whole world. Please, Please, we need your support in our internationalization. We are not, we don't want begging. We want to collaborate. We want to be your partners. We want to work and our people want to work. So this is our position and we would like you to hear it. And at the end, I just want to show you a small, uh, small example, small territory which is now in a, safety position right near to the border of uh, Slovakia and Hungary and uh, it's also our uh, active member who has actually OM uh, the only one OM right now in Ukraine it's licensed Skoda and we also are looking forward for new OMs which will come to Ukraine and really help us and support us to move forward because we know if OM will come to Ukraine definitely all suppliers tier one tier two suppliers will come uh, so short movie at the end and uh, and I will give the floor to to another uh, section Exactly, example of one of industrial parts which we have a lot actually in Ukraine, and this one is in the border of Hungary and Slovakia, which is operate already and looking forward for new automotive and industrial companies to come. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga, and thank you very much. So, we will be passing on to our next panel. Uh, I want to say once again, thank you very much to Mr. Parsons and Mr. Yurshak. Yes? Okay. So, while the video is running, I don't want to be uh, late on time, so I will go on with the next panel. Next panel is going to be about global and regional energy security, challenges and opportunities. For our moderator, I want to call Esar Özdil, non-resident fellow of the Atlantic Council, to the stage, please. And for our speakers, I want to call Mr. Sherki Ajunar, former chairman of the supervisory board of Ukraine Argo, NPC Ukraine Argo Ukraine. Dr. Zeynep Elif Yildizel, vice president of the Association of Geological Researchers, Turkey. Mr. Onur Ünlü, CEO of Eskon Energy and President of AODAR. Torsten Wollar, Minister Councillor of Energy EU Delegation to Ukraine. Anna Diyar Sashko, Associate in International Arbitration Group of Shearman and Sterling, LLP Paris. Hello, good afternoon. <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, being with us in this very important panel. Uh, I would like to thank to all organizers and the panelists, uh, especially this is a very timely event, uh, I believe, because the energy is in the hot topic of the global uh, agendas right now. 
especially uh, after the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, the energy became more and more important topic to all countries because of the prices and supply security discussions. So today we have a very high caliber panelists uh, having uh, direct uh, experiences in the ground. Uh, so I think we will have very fruitful discussions, even though we are in the second day and afternoon. So I briefly would like to introduce you to our panelists and not uh, spend much time uh, to, uh, to, to go to discussions. The first of all, we have Dr. Zeynep Elif Yildizel. Uh, Elif uh, Yildizel is a very well-known expert in upstream industry in Turkey. We know each other for probably more than 15 years. We had uh, many common projects before. Uh, she will talk about uh, the importance of Ukraine in global energy security. Um, uh, we have uh, Shevki Ojunar. Shevki Bey is the former chairman of the Supervisor Board of Ukraine Energy. Uh, he has direct experiences in the ground in Ukraine, and he is one of the uh, closest observers in the energy transition in Ukraine. So I think his contributions will be very, very important for us to understand. Uh, the current uh, set of play in Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, Onur Ünlü, he is the CEO of Eskon Energy and he is uh, president of EODER. He has a very extensive knowledge about renewable energy, uh, performance contracts, green transition processes, so his contribution will be basically on the green energy side and energy transition. Uh, we have Torstan Werlert, he is the Minister Consular Energy at Delegation to Ukraine. Uh, like Shevki Bey, I think he's one of the most closest observer of the energy transition in Ukraine, uh, both from policy side as well as the market side. Uh, so his contributions will be quite critical, especially I will have some questions to him about the current status in EU and what EU is thinking about the global energy security and EU energy security as well. Last but not least, we have Anna glad Shasko from uh, International Arbitration Group, Sherman, Star Sherman Sterling LLP Paris, and we will get uh, a legal perspective uh, and uh, his, uh, her, uh, sorry, her uh, opinions about the uh, current activities in, in Ukraine. So uh, I would like to start with uh, Zeynep Hanum because uh, she is going to give us a broad introductory a speech about the importance of Ukraine in global energy security and what's going on right now, especially uh, in Europe, in Ukraine, and in Russia. Thank you, Mr. Rosin. Uh, okay. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the global impacts of uh, Ukraine crisis concerning the energy security. As we know, Ukraine is an important supply on energy minerals and foods to the global markets. This is the fact that we know today. And by this crisis, the world is facing uh, uh, an important food and energy uh, supply problem. And securing these items became more vital than ever. Uh, the minerals and mining is also important in the uh, global supply supplies of the world uh, because uh, in 21st century uh, products that we're using today are all made up from minerals and ma metals. So we are facing the price increases in all goods because uh, when the crisis has set up uh, uh, by the uh, by Russia and the Russia invaded Ukraine the markets global oil and gas markets uh, the skyrocketed the prices. That's the fact we know. And Ukraine is one of the key economies to the global markets, as said, and Ukraine holds 5% of the minerals of the whole world, uh, mineral resources, and the mineral resources are mostly for industrialization. Ukraine holds a small amount of oil and the second, uh, uh, second uh, natural gas resources of Europe. But besides these, mineral, uh, besides these resources, y Ukraine is very important to Europe and to global markets because it's a transition country from the gas uh, coming from Russia to Europe. So she is a vital role in, in, in energy transition and uh, transportation. And uh, Ukraine has the largest pipelines. It's about 45,000 kilometers something and 72 compressor stations with 13 underground, underground gas storage, which is, which is very vital to especially Europe. But uh, having problems on these uh, uh, flows from Russia to Europe, uh, not only Europe is affected, the whole globe is affected by the prices, price increases. So, uh, 
This event made us to rethink or remember the energy security again as a globe, because uh, we forget the, the energy security in the climate change topic. Uh, we have we are in a dilemma uh, whether we uh, whether we are going to to make our net zero targets or whether we have to secure our uh, energy. Of course, climate change is very important because uh, concerning the increase in sea level due to climate changes will increase uh, uh, will make uh, millions of people displaced and uh, uh, due to displa due to displaced due to rising sea level of losing land and losing losing agricultural area, and uh, this will be a very drastic, very dramatic result uh, for uh, for uh, increasing of the sea level. So confusion. So. We found out that by this crisis, the confusion of energy independency with energy security. Yeah, we were trying to be independent in energy by countries. Each country tries to do that. But we forget about the energy security. So uh, what can I say? I mean, uh, we found out that the energy security is a major concern, and globalization is another concern on this issue. And when we come to Russia, uh, Russia inputs 4.3 million barrels of oil and uh, 210 BCM of natural gas annually into the energy system of the globe and 2.5 million of oil per day and 142 BCM of natural gas flows to Europe in the system via Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, and there are so many uh, IOCs, oil and gas companies, and other companies uh, out of the oil and gas sector running in Russia. So we are facing a very important issue, not, not only Ukraine, but the globe itself is facing an important issue, concerning, especially concerning the energy. And if, if we try to put sanctions on Russia, or if we enlarge sanctions on Russia, uh, then the oil and gas, in, uh, concerning the oil and gas subject, uh, will find its way to Asia, because Asia is still in the market, and I don't believe that Asia will be in the sanctioning club. So we are really facing a challenging uh, 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 new coming months. So the problem is, uh, uh, for the oil and gas, uh, if can, can EU replace its uh, demand uh, from OPEC plus or from Iran or from non-OPEC producers? Um, yeah, they can replace somehow, but uh, the problem is there is a production capacity for each country uh, uh, supplying oil. Although we can increase some, some production, that the demand will not be replaced uh, uh, by those increases. And uh, the European countries turn out to uh, LNG, and the spot market in LNG rises up um, uh, very dramatically. And Ukraine uh, also, I mean, the total Ukraine uh, um, exports approximately $70 billion of everything, uh, goods, and 50% of this export goes to Europe. So uh, as the war is going, uh, ongoing, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, and, uh, Ukraine economy will be badly affected. That's what we are talking about since two days. And this effect will, uh, will be in a domino uh, uh, structure to the other countries that are working directly with Ukraine and uh, buying goods or raw materials from R Ukraine. So the supply chain is always in a disruption, and that's what we're talking about since two days. Uh, also, uh, also, Ukraine has a workforce problem, as mentioned before. So. Uh, as, as everybody said, then what shall we do? We should invest in Ukraine, not only in uh, logistics or um, uh, the other consumption goods or co uh, construction, but we have, to take con we have to take into consideration about oil and gas. And uh, we, have, uh, we have underground gas storages that are being run in uh, Ukraine, and those storages should be filled up before the winter comes. So that's a big challenge. So. Uh, What's, what, what we are going to do is not very clear in energy consumption. And uh, when the Europe wants to replace its, uh, or replace, or replace its demand, uh, then the prices are rising up. So everybody is affected uh, by inflation and by increasing uh, 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 prices in the goods. Because, you know, uh, oil and gas, it's not only for transportation or for energy, it's also the refined, of, uh, refined products from oil. Uh, we have 80,000 refined products from oil, so increase in oil prices will make increase in 
goods uh, in uh, in goods uh, that are being produced from those uh, refined oil products. So. Uh, the majority of the Ukraine's mining industry should be raised up and, and the important other thing is Ukraine is an unexplored country and uh, I think more exploration should be done uh, uh, in this basins that Ukraine has. You know, uh, you, uh, after the Crimea crime invasion, Russia, uh, ex uh, Russia wanted to, uh, to, to enlarge its ex economic exclusive zone in Black Sea, rising from the Crimea wa uh, water, for, uh, water shores. So, Majority of the production in Ukraine is in, is on the offshore of uh, Black Sea. So uh, that's another major point, uh, political point that we are going to face in the coming uh, months. And uh, we have to invest in in oil and gas business also more than uh, ever because uh, while we are thinking about the climate, yes, the climate change is very important, but. Uh, you, but we have to we have to make our energy secured because we are going to face uh, a winter in the coming months. But plus, our industries, heavy industries, cannot be run with uh, renewables because when you have a steel factory, you cannot run it on uh, uh, basic renewables. Or when you have a glass factory and something like that, so we need to secure our energy. That's uh, what I'm going to mention or what I'm going to emphasize. Thank you very much, Senepal. It was a very um, informative opening speech to understand the Ukraine's position as well as the global energy security dynamics. Um, Torsten, we know that the Ukraine has been following very ambitious policies to market liberalization and trans uh, tra uh, transfer its, uh, transform its uh, energy industry. And EU was one of EU is one of the key counterparties, especially from regulatory framework as well as the market integration. Um, and after this, after especially annexation of the Crimea from natural guys wise, actually Ukraine stopped almost all imports from Russia and diverted to uh, Europe. So can you give us a framework how EU contributed to Ukraine's energy transition in the last 10 years, for example? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this very important event and also for inviting me. And thank you very much to all people who are still with us, uh, even though it's the second day and in the afternoon. Uh, I hope it's interesting because uh, the energy sector in Ukraine is one of these examples that we are in a time of really transformative shifts. You can even compare to an, to an earthquake. We are in the middle of an earthquake and we don't know yet where these shifts will end. I mean, what tectonic shifts we will, we will see. Ten years ago, Ukraine was essentially 100% dependent uh, on oil, on gas, uh, and uh, from Russia and, and Belarus. Uh, it was uh, fully connected, integrated in the electricity system. Now, 10 years on, uh, Ukraine is still, or before the war started now, uh, but uh, in the beginning of February, 80% of imports came from, of oil products uh, came from uh, Russia and Belarus. But gas was purchased on the European market, and now we also have um, the connection of the electricity grids between Ukraine, Moldova, which is also part of the same system, with the European Union's uh, NSOE uh, network. Uh, this was done uh, in a, it was a long-term process. It was prepared starting in 2016, but now because of the war it was sped up. It should have happened uh, end of next year, but now as an emergency measure and also as a sign of support and solidarity with Ukraine, uh, all the members uh, of NSOE, including Turkey, agreed to have this emergency connection, this synchronization, which means that we are in an energy field. We are now getting more and more integrated. Ukraine and uh, the European Union are getting more integrated. And we are also working on uh, market rules, which is based on uh, you know, joint rules of the European energy community uh, to make this work, to really present business opportunities for this. And I think this could be interesting also for, for businesses here, because these rules are well known. These are essentially more or less the same rules that we have in the European Union, we have it in the Western Balkans, we have it in Ukraine and Moldova. And, uh, it also provides stability for investors. Now, of course, it's a very difficult time with, uh, with war, but the framework has changed dramatically and we have uh, managed, because of these rules, uh, to, um, well, to de-geopolitize to a certain extent energy supplies, even though we are in a very, very difficult moment of geopolitics and energy. 
when you see now about uh, just yesterday, Nord Stream 1 restarted operations, but only at 30-40% of the normal level. Nobody can explain you why. Today it may be 20% or 50%. So we are really in this kind of completely geopolitical world of energy supplies. But even there, there's, no, there's more predictability in the energy system in Ukraine now than 10 years ago. Uh, because we have rules for gas storage, so European traders have already used Ukrainian gas storages, which are, I think, the biggest in Europe. Uh, we have uh, now a situation that in, during the war, uh, when, we con when we connected our electricity grids, the idea was that in case of need, Europe can help Ukraine to uh, maintain stability in the electricity system. Now we see the opposite effect because of the war. A lot of industrial capacity has been destroyed, destroyed by Russian uh, attacks. So there's much less en uh, electricity demand now. And ele Ukraine has started to export electricity to the European Union, which is a win-win because it helps Ukraine to generate revenues, but it also helps to bring prices down in the European market. Uh, and currently it's Romania and Slovakia who are profiting from this. And these uh, tectonic shifts, we don't know yet where we will end up. But this is irreversible, and the, the, the current situation uh, of uncertainty also presents a lot of opportunities. And I'm very glad that also Turkish companies were very active already in the investments in renewables, because the, the big chance of Ukraine as a country is to turn itself from an importer of fossil energy, which it has traditionally always been, to an exporter of green energy. So, and this is for electricity, but also we are now working, for instance, on, on biomethane, uh, because everybody wants to replace uh, natural gas, especially from Russia. So for Ukraine, there's a huge opportunity to do this domestically, but also to export biomethane, uh, if it's certified, etc., cetera, as a, as a value-added product to the European market. Uh, and for this, there is a lot of industrial potential in Ukraine, but also, I think there's a lot of openness for international investors to, to come to this sector and to develop it in the spirit of integrating the energy systems. I will stop here and we can continue then. Yeah, definitely, because at this stage I want to turn to Shevki Bey, because he was one of the practitioners in this uh, transformation, let's say, uh, process. Uh, and I know that all transformation comes with uh, tremendous challenges. Uh, I'm, I'm following the Ukrainian market probably more than 15 years actually since 2007. And uh, when Ukraine government governments, let's say, uh, announced uh, market liberalization processes, unbundling processes, there was a big uh, debate in the society, especially on the rising prices, uh, new investment requirements, uh, new technology requirements, etc. So Shevki Bey, Probably you encountered with all of these questions and all of these problems in your career. So what were the fundamental challenges you have encountered in this transformation process in, in Ukraine and what kind of opportunities you see for the future? Thank you for the floor and thank you for the arrangements. I think uh, the most fundamental transformational challenge was getting the market structure and operability right. And I have to say that uh, the original design was not necessarily working very well and, and uh, created uh, a lot of distorted uh, picture uh, and situations in the market. Um, I can name, for example, the payment mechanism where Ukrainergo, the, the transit system operator which I had, was responsible for financial uh, shortcomings or non-payments from distribution companies. And uh, we ended up having over a billion dollars of accumulated payables to green energy producers. One aspect of this, the other aspect of this was the extraordinarily generous tariffs, feed-in tariffs that are provided to green energy, all right, of course, to promote investment because this was really the uh, starship, the, the Admiral uh, 
you know, the most important driver of foreign direct investment in Ukraine for a while. Turkish companies have, uh, you know, together with you know a few other Norways and uh, a few other countries, led uh, that uh, initiative of investment uh, from abroad into the sector. But that created again the uh, quasi bankruptcy of the the system. And you know these kind of distortions, of course, create uh, enormous rant for a few of the very well-known oligarchs in the country that at the time had uh, their own MPs in the parliament and affected the legislation. So correcting these uh, over time and, and the new government is also making, I think, great headway a new administration uh, in addressing these things was uh, were, were great challenges. But I also have to mention a few other challenges that I think Ukraine faces, um, and I'm sure uh, other panelists will eventually touch on that, is the energy efficiency issue. Um, Ukraine consumes at least two and a half times more energy per output of GDP compared to the European uh, countries, and that is uh, an enormous waste of resource and money. At EBRD, we, uh, as Thorsten knows well, and, and we collaborated very closely in financing uh, investments to improve the efficiency at uh, energy users, manufacturing plants, uh, even retailers where they want to change their uh, lighting system to uh, more efficient uh, energy consumers. So this energy efficiency issue uh, still, I think, is a challenge for the existing new government to uh, to address. Along with these, as a part of this, comes the issue of affordability of energy for the ordinary uh, Ukrainians, uh, because your uh, when you have such a high uh, cost component of uh, production. And when you look at the income, disposal income levels, that creates its own social problems and, and, and therefore, again, political interventions and then consequent distortions. So it's like a vicious circle of uh, challenges that we're talking about. Uh, one thing I want to point out, uh, particularly in reference to the comment that you made about energy security, uh, which has to be the, the most in today's world uh, policy option for any country uh, should not necessarily mean energy independence. Um, if you are uh, dependent on like-minded, democratically operating, uh, principled countries, that interdependency is quite okay. Uh, because otherwise you end up having to pay a tremendous amount of uh, money for your uh, energy security and uh, you might not even get there because uh, I think we have seen it in the case of when Texas, that was uh, the state of Texas in the United States was disconnected from the rest of the system, grid system in the United States and as we all know something happened somewhere and, and the whole state was out of power for quite some time. So. Uh, the, the point I want to tie all this uh, in, in the energy uh, security is the great achievement that Torsten has referred to. Uh, and Torsten, for probably you know that, but it's interesting for audience to know, the final uh, technical tests to pass the NSOE acceptance were actually completed on the 23rd, the day before the Russian attack on, on Ukraine. So by divine intervention that, that was out of the way before uh, the bully of the region, the vicious tyrant uh, attacked our beloved Ukraine. Uh, but this uh, integration into NSOE is, is very much this energy security uh, that Ukraine needs to have. And it, of course, is, is a mutual game. It also provides, as you say, benefits for Ukraine's neighbors and members of the uh, energy community. So I, 
I don't want to uh, sort of take too much time, but when you look at the components of primary energy, the, the coal, the uh, uh, renewables, uh, the uh, hydro, and in the case of Ukraine, um, nuclear and oil and gas, you know, it is clear that each of these sectors, while you need to have a coherent uh, energy transformation policy and, and implementation actions, would need their own specific uh, solutions that need to be designed. So there's a lot of uh, issues to be addressed by the policymakers, by the technical people, technicians, uh, by uh, the people of uh, Ukraine Ergo, uh, Nafta Gas, and all those colleagues to, to sort out. So I'll stop here. And uh, I think we can have a discussion as opposed to just long talks. Yeah, Thank def you. Definitely. I certainly agree with you about integration of Ukraine with the European energy systems. Because if Ukraine hadn't taken that measures before, most probably the situation would have been very catastrophic today uh, because of energy uh, supply or energy income or energy security. I, I certainly agree with you. Um, and I don't want to steal the philosophical discussion, but again, I cannot be more agree with you than uh, no one is no one is an independent energy island today in the world. So even though, for example, the current case in Turkey, we are can we continue directly importing gas from Russia, and we are not expecting any problem for the winter, but. Since the Ukraine, since the Russian invasion in Ukraine, steering the oil prices up in international markets, and actually Turkey also needs spot LNG in the winter time. Most probably, we will have a very difficult situation to find spot LNG, and oil prices are rising. So, again, even if you don't have direct physical flow problem, at the end of the day, the prices are affecting to you, and which is also uh, equally. Uh, related with the energy security, because if prices are not affordable, even we cannot talk about uh, supply security. So in this time, actually, I want to turn to Onur Bay, because we we'll talk about uh, hydrocarbons, we we'll talk about market integration, uh, we we'll talk about transformation in Ukraine, and now I want to uh, return to the expert in the energy efficiency and the renewable side. So we know that in Ukraine has huge potential on the renewables. There are some Turkish investors already invested the in solar energy. And uh, uh, as Cheviki Bey explained that Ukraine in energy, in the, uh, Ukraine in overall as a country needs huge efficiency measures. Uh, so can you please elaborate how the energy efficiency uh, can help a country or countries to increase their supply security, decrease their energy bills, as well as how uh, com countries in the future should attract new investors to the renewable energy side. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. It's uh, really a pleasure to share the floor with these distinguished panelists. <clears throat> you know, the world ecosystem is changing. It's changing dramatically to tackle climate change. Um, it all started with COVID first. Uh, this what so-called earthquake in the in the in the world ecosystem uh, then we see supply and demand measures change we see freight costs went higher energy prices go over the roof and it all ended up with russian invasion on uh, ukraine so uh, the not only the we we have three obstacles right now one of them is the climate change the second one is as uh, panelists mentioned, energy security. The, the, the third one is, as you mentioned, is the energy prices. So at the end of the day, we use the most out of the energy because when we when we look at the climate change issue, uh, the the emissions increase 
very dramatically, even though we thought after COVID, we, we went to our homes, we closed the offices and everything. We thought that the emissions will go lower, but we have the record numbers on the emissions. So it's, it's not the case. Um, the world is depending very much on energy and the source for emissions is like 75% on the energy production itself. So we, may, we have to make the most out of the energy we produce or we use. That's the, that's the scenario. As you mentioned, because of the increasing energy prices, if we look at Turkey, Turkey paid like $54 billion um, at most in, in, in the past. But if you look at today, the first six months is $48 billion. So it's it's going dramatically high. Um, when, when we look at on the energy efficiency side, energy efficiency is seen as the um, first fuel um, on, on tackling climate change. And it's seen as the newest renewable energy source. Um, so that's that's quite critical. Energy international energy energy international energy agency thinks that uh, forty percent of emission reduction will come from uh, energy efficiency itself. Why it's that important when we look at the industries, uh, even in Ukraine, is quite the same. Um, existing ones are um, usually old technology because when you when you invest on a new plant, in the, the previous discussion was inviting all the investors to Ukraine to have these factories. So initial goal for any investor is to produce that product in the factory. So it's not that uh, how much energy you consume. So whether it's a new factory or an old one, there is a huge potential when we make the calculations that are rising from the studies that we have done uh, in the field, we see that there is a, uh, almost 35 to 40% of energy savings in the industry. Uh, when you add it up to you know, domestic usage of energy, there's a huge, huge potential there. The, the important issue is that we have to keep in mind that, as uh, Mr. Sherky mentioned about the BRD's approach, there are energy service companies in the field, in Europe, in, in Turkey, in Ukraine, who can also um, cover the initial investment there and share the savings so investors or the factory owners or the building owners, they don't have to pay anything for that, that sort of improvement. When we look at renewable energy, uh, of course, Ukraine has a huge potential with the green fields and the industries with the roofs. Uh, and that also helps both the emission reduction and the energy security as well. Um, and when we look at the technologies that are uh, driven in the near future is mainly focusing on heat pumps, ORC systems. So those are due to the fact that like we would like to change our cars uh, from fuel to electricity. We need to try to switch the factories to consume more electricity than uh, fossil fuels. So uh, if we want to do that, we need to find a good source for electricity. And uh, Ukraine has a huge potential there uh, with the renewable energy. That's what I believe. I, I, I believe. I also believe that in the near future, with the new developments on energy storage, battery systems, and everything, these renewable energy systems will not only be available uh, throughout the daytime, but you can you can easily store the energy produced and use it in the nighttime as well. So we, we see a great potential there. There's a uh, huge potential, not only for um, Ukrainian companies, but for the companies who would like, uh, for the countries who would like to support Ukraine as well. And that way uh, we can easily reduce the uh, energy imports of Ukraine. Uh, as well as Turkey. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> very crucial uh, intervention. Uh, with the current energy prices, I think almost all projects are feasible. Yeah. <laughs> well, for, when I reviewed the last five projects in my own businesses, the one is the green hydrogen. And like two years ago, 
I do remember very well that we were saying for the green hydrogen, to make the feasibility of the green hydrogen, we need to wait another 10 or 15 years. Now it's feasible with the current prices. Uh, I reviewed another project about uh, storage, battery storage integration to the grid. And I was saying again, like two years ago, probably we have to wait another 10 to 15 years and still they are becoming feasible. Uh, most of the projects uh, are becoming very feasible, but the question mark is still how long the gas prices will be that high. Because this is a big question mark and still um, with the recession expectations are becoming more and more grand in the global economies. So expectations to drop in energy prices also will be uh, another issue. And if you look at the historical chart between the correlation of gas prices as well as oil prices, it totally diverged because of the geopolitical risk right now. The market is basically pricing the geopolitical risk. That's why actually the prices are high. I'm also very optimistic on renewable energy side, renewable energy technologies, but still the question mark will be how long that oil and gas prices will remain high. I don't know. So last but not least, um, I would like to turn to uh, Anna for her intervention before going to Q&A uh, session. Please, floor is yours, Anna. Thank you. I would like also to thank the audience to stay with us in the afternoon. My topic is uh, quite controversial because I know that uh, business does not like to discuss disputes or even to think about disputes, but this is a part of uh, the reality. It's no doubt that the Russian invasion of Ukraine will have a far-reaching impact on the global energy system, disrupting chain of uh, supply. And today we see already that the general picture has changed for governments, for companies, for investors, and they are trying to navigate in the new reality. Even before the war, disputes were, were quite common in the energy sector. The disputes usually high stake, political, involving different aspects, technical aspects, uh, regulatory aspects. So what are the disputes, what are the risks we are contemplating already and we will see in the near future. First, sanctions. And sanctions, very obvious uh, point for the sanctions, you need to exit Russia you, you, or how you exit Russia. But some companies decide to continue business with Russia and here we see these companies trying to navigate not to hold liable for the violation of sanction regulations. On the other side, Russia adopted measures, countermeasures against unfriendly countries in the European Union. And even more, now if you want to sue a Russian party, a Russian company, if you have a dispute, it's, it becomes even difficult to appoint an arbitrator. For example, ICC in Paris now just uh, inventing schemes how to get to receive payment or to pay a Russian arbitrator. In Ukraine, we continue uh, not only a fight in war, but economic fight, which is very important. And I think it's uh, nearly one week ago, an advisor to the president sent a letter to four international banks, JP Morgan, City Group, HBC, and the Société Générale, requesting them to stop financing Russia, to exit Russian companies, and especially not even to grant any loans. And in this letter, this person explains that you are committing war crimes. Because while financing Russian oil companies, Russian oil industry, you are financing war against Ukraine. Once the war will be over, these banks will be sued by the Ukrainian Ministry of Justice for war crimes. And currently, the security service of Ukraine is collecting data on these banks. Uh, we know that you cannot sue a legal person before the International Criminal Court, but still you can sue management of these banks. So I think it's a uh, it's very new, not, uh, creative approach, but we will see what will happen after the war. But as for now, the Ukrainian government already announced that companies, banks involved in business with Russia would not be able to participate in the reconstruction of Ukraine. 
Another potential, not only b uh, disputes, but general projects that are taking place, that are already in, pla uh, in place, it's how to change uh, the system and how to create more possibilities to avoid using Russian f uh, foil. It's, uh, we have a rare power EU initiative by the European Union with aim to stop using Russian energy by 2030. And as a part of this initiative, some countries like uh, Germany, Greece, have already announced uh, construction of the LNG terminals. Other countries also considering, for example, Estonia is planning to build uh, floating storage and another LNG facility. And also recently, U.S. and the European Union revealed a deal that would allow the U.S. to export more LNG to, to Europe. And other countries declared their intention uh, to build more facilities to build, uh, to use renewable energy. In France, Emmanuel Macron, the president, announced uh, plans to build more nuclear power plants in the near future. So here we have very short time frames for, for this uh, very important plan. So I think that we will see more disputes, but also I think it's a great opportunity for Turkish construction companies to come to France, to come to Europe, and really, inshallah, let's see. So I think that uh, as we don't have enough time and uh, really thank you for this event and if you would like to help uh, Ukraine spread the word about the event because we see on LinkedIn, on Facebook, it's very important to keep speaking not only about the war but about the future of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for your remarks and I would like to thank all the panelists. Before asking my questions, I would like to return to audiences because we have limited time. And if there are, if there is a question or if if any comment from the audiences, I would like to give the priority. Yeah, there is one gentleman over there. Yes, thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. Uh, all of you mentioned about the gas, about the hydrogen about electricity, but none of you have mentioned about the 55% of Ukraine's energy area, I mean the nuclear energy. I would be very much appreciated to look from you, your point of view, what kind of future for nuclear energy do you see in Ukraine? And uh, yeah, looking forward for it, thank you. Who wants to take this question? I can have a go and then sure. Uh, it's it's clear that uh, Ukraine is going to use, as it has been, nuclear energy as a, one of the main uh, powers. And then I think we've all read about the the ten uh, the contract uh, with Westinghouse being increased from five to ten uh, reactors uh, uh, or, or uh, turbines with uh, Energo Atom. Uh, the Issue with nuclear until now was uh, again, you know, that you had the dependency on on the supplier of nuclear fuel, but that is obviously being gradually addressed. And uh, my guess is that nuclear will continue to play this very dominant role. Uh, the renewable energy is, uh, as the system auction system is now uh, set to work uh, to. Uh, bring the prices to competitive levels uh, from the exorbitant levels they were. Uh, there will be a good uh, mix with the storage capacity that's being added as well. So, in short, I think uh, nuclear energy will have a continued significant role. But I think probably you would want to say something. Yes, I want to add something about nuclear energy. Ukraine and we are on the same boat on nuclear energy because uh, our nuclear uh, ours is being constructed and yours are was constructed by Russian uh, Russian technology. So we are dependent on Russia on nuclear technology uh, issue. The pro uh, the the problem if we want to cope with the climate we need a controllable 
and sustainable uh, energy, which is the nuclear power plants. The problem with the nuclear power plants, as everybody knows, when you have the uh, capacity to produce the uh, uh, uranium to be used in nuclear power plants then, plants, then you have the capacity to produce nuclear bombs. That's what uh, few countries have this ability on uh, in globe, uh, uh, to, starting with Russia, uh, United Kingdom, United States, and so forth. Few countries with France and uh, Japan. So we, uh, so I believe that the coming, the next coming uh, year, decades, let's say, will be uh, powered by nuclear. Uh, so we have to invest, or we have to find some way uh, to to invest in nuclear technology because. Uh, Personally, I don't believe in renewables that we can run our countries on the clim uh, on nature-driven uh, energies because we are talking about the climate is going to change and we're trying to put our grid system onto the changing climate. The climate will not only change by itself, it will change by sunning times, by uh, sea level rises, by wind, uh, wind, uh, wind uh, uh, flow uh, lines, let's say. So we're trying to make us dependent on nature and we're talking about the nature change. This is a dilemma that we're facing for. And I have one more comment to you. Uh, you said uh, we don't expect to uh, have the oil and gas prices rise up. No, because uh, in, uh, since 2014, when the oil prices fell down to $30, uh, investments were halted in EMP, exploration and production. And since, uh, since 2014, I've been constantly telling that we need to increase investment in EMP because we're going to face the next coming decade a shortage of oil and gas production. So uh, the, due to oil prices, uh, or, EMP uh, uh, investments, capital investments were halted. And in 2018 and 2019, the oil prices were trying to rise up and they came approximately 60 to 80 dollar per barrel uh, at that level. And then the climate, the Paris uh, climate uh, agreement was um, uh, signed and that agreement has halted 35% of the investment in EMP again. So we are facing, or we are going to face, the shortage of oil and gas production in the coming decades. Of course, everybody knows by 2020, the COVID uh, uh, decreased the uh, demand and then the prices fall again. So another, another period to halt the ENP uh, investment. So we're going to face shortage about oil and gas uh, in, the, in the coming decades. So I don't expect that their prices will be lowered down in the uh, next coming decades. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, before going to the nuclear question, which is really very important and very interesting, just I wanted to highlight one thing which also was addressed in the previous panel. We see really a separation of ways between Ukraine on the one side and Russia, Belarus on the other side. We see it in the energy sector, in the outlook, in the modernization tendency, also in the market integration. They're really going Part. And I think this is something which many investors have not yet really internalized also in their organizational structure. For them, this is one market, but this is no longer the reality. And I suppose it will become more and more clear. And I think the sooner companies adopt this approach, and I'm German, and I, I, I know lots of German companies traditionally have run this Eastern European business from Moscow. This will not work, uh, just as a general remark. And in energy, we see it very, very clearly. A nuclear. Uh, un unfortunately, we have now a new, a new concern, which is the security concern because of the war. And we have all followed with horror what is happening in Zaporizhia. Uh, and this is one question which, of course, Ukraine will have to live with somehow. So nobody knows really how this will end. So it is not only the traditional concerns of where do I get the fuel, because Ukraine has made a lot of progress there. Already now, half of the fuel comes from Westinghouse, half the fuel comes from 12, from Russia. So diversification. I think Ukraine is the only country who has really systematically worked on fuel diversification for Soviet-built or Russian-built nuclear reactors. And I think this is also an example for other countries to, to really seriously consider. It's possible. Of course, it has a price, but it's possible. And Ukraine shows that you can do this with a technology that other, also other countries are employing. Uh, the main question, I mean, for Ukraine, the power plants, they are in the rhythm of uh, 
lifetime prolongation, so Energo Atom is working on this, and until, let's say, 10, 15 years, uh, probably they will run on mostly on existing capacity. The big question is how this capacity will be replaced. And this is not unique to Ukraine. That's a big question for countries like France, etc., who all build nuclear reactors more or less at the same time. And then the question is, of course, of technology cost. And this is something very difficult to predict. I mean, I have seen various of numbers. And this will also be of relevance for Ukraine, because uh, if you are in a common market, in a wider European market, more or less the same rules apply, because you will have more and more uh, harmonization of prices, of cost. Uh, hopefully, Ukraine will also have uh, no longer the, the increased country risk, because especially for new build, uh, capital cost is critical. So if you only have 1%, 2% more capital cost for nuclear power plant, it becomes really expensive. So that's very difficult to, to answer. But in the short run for Ukraine, the existing fleet will continue. At least this is the planning of the government. And the real short-term question is the war. And that's something, and we have seen this seems to be a war tactic of Russia, because the first thing they did, they came to Chernobyl, through the nuclear zone, through the radioactive, let's say, contaminated zone, just to reach Kiev, because they knew nobody will fight in this zone, because you have radio, radiological risks. But they dedicated some people, or troops, to conquer Zaporizhia, and they have, were on the way to uh, conquer South Ukrainian nuclear power plants, uh, which were then defeated. So that seems to be a war tactic. To my knowledge, that's the first time in the history of war that nuclear power plants are used as a target in a war and potentially as a weapon. And this is something which I think we have not yet really internalized, unfortunately. That's critical. Also, one more remark. Uh, we see more and more, uh, especially US-based SMR companies are active in the Balkan and Southeastern European countries. So probably SMR technology will further develop uh, in the years to come. And also, in addition to your comments, uh, I think the nuclear will be with us in the future as well. I think we have uh, three minutes or oh, one minute to go. And there is one gentleman here as well. I want to give the floor to him. Hi. I have a question. How do you think? Uh, is green hydrogen able to replace natural gas? And also, I am curious, how, what do you think about, uh, can we produce hydrogen um, using electricity from nuclear power plant, and after that, storage it in underground storages, and became, for Ukraine, can became uh, European hydrogen hub, and export hydrogen to Europe instead of natural gas? No, no, you don't. <laughs> yes, thanks a lot for the question, because uh, actually we had, we have, uh, between the European Union and Ukraine, we have uh, what we call a Green Deal dialogue, and one of these uh, main components is what will we do on developing the hydrogen market. And there the idea is that Ukraine will participate fully in the development of a new market. So it's not joining an existing market with existing rules, but really creating it from scratch. And one of the priorities uh, was uh, what do we do about green hydrogen because the market is not yet there. There is a political will, a political ambition to create such a market in the EU and especially in some uh, advanced countries like Germany. Uh, and uh, we were planning, actually it should have started by now, a big study, a technical study, uh, how to use Ukraine gas pipeline network for transporting hydrogen, different options, uh, mixes or pure hydrogen. Also with the gas storage operator, how to store hydrogen at a big scale. Uh, and the idea was to have, to use the existing infrastructure to uh, make Ukraine a, a green hydrogen hub for the supply internally. And also we had, for instance, Mariupol was supposed to be a pilot, uh, the, exactly the Azov-style plant, uh, there should have been a wind park uh, producing green hydrogen. Part of it was supposed to be used by a green steel line in Azov-style. And part of it was supposed to give, go probably by river barges uh, to the Danube and then up to Germany. So that was, and there were talks with Siemens, and I think even EBRD was approached. Uh, <laughs> so 
I mean, we were, we were seriously thinking about it, working on it. We had the political support from our side, from all sides. And in the EU hydrogen strategy, uh, Ukraine is, is mentioned as a key partner. And uh, in, the, in the hydrogen alliance of the European Union, Ukraine is a member. And the aim was that uh, 8 to, uh, to uh, 10 uh, BCM of hydrogen would be produced by Ukraine, but it was just an intention. Mm -hmm. So we see this as very promising, and uh, as you said, there's a huge potential. But now, of course, we have to reassess also after the damages to the war, what will happen, also what will happen to the investments that, uh, for instance, Turkish companies have already done. Yeah, because this, the renewable energy or new renewable electricity production is the, the basis for all this, these new business models. Thank you. Um, we used two more minutes extra, so I want to stop here uh, because there are other panels as well. Thank you very much for joining me today and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ozil, and thank you very much, Mr. Ajunar, Ms. Ilzal, Mr. Nu, Mr. Wallart, and Ms. Saisko. We will just have a five-minute short coffee break, and afterwards we'll be waiting here at 3.40 p.m. for all of you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from the coffee break. So we will be continuing with our next panel. It's quite, uh, all of them are important, but this one for me, since I'm representing AgroTV as well, it's quite important for me. Global food security, challenges and opportunities. I want to call to stage uh, who's going to be our moderator and I will let him introduce his speakers. Mr. Howard Beasy, partner and co-founder of 8 Degrees East. Can you please come to stage? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, persevering. We're almost at the tail end. Last couple of panels for the day. So if you're out in the lobby and you can still hear me, come on in. Uh, and what I hope to have here over the next hour is a robust discussion over something that is not a new subject, uh, but has been highlighted by the recent events uh, with the invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces and that is global food security. Uh, before we get on into it, let me invite my three uh, panelists that are here with me today to discuss this. Uh, the first and foremost I'll start with is the Honorable James Kakuza, former Minister of Health of Uganda and a member of the East African Community Parliament. Mr. Kakuza, please join me on the stage. Second, uh, round of applause. Second, Mr. Boris Shestapolov is the co-founder of HD Group and UParks. Mr. Shestapolov is an agri-food entrepreneur and a food tech and food strategy expert. Boris, please, welcome. And last but not least, to cover the industry side and that of the global logistics supply chain, we have Mr. Diego Munoz, Managing Director Destination Marketing, uh, Turkey, Global Trade, ADM, Archer Daniels Midland. Mr. Munoz, is he still getting coffee? Quite possibly. Okay, well, we'll have him join us when he gets here. So without further ado, let me start off. I don't like to stand behind podiums, so I'll probably move around. I have this nice high chair if I choose to sit. Um, so I've been struck over a couple of things over the past two days. One, I've made a lot of good contacts and friends, so I appreciate that. Um, there's something I think that's notable here. Most of what we've talked about, certainly the horrific events that brought us together, but one theme has been opportunity. Opportunity to do better, opportunity to tackle challenges in an array of issues. So I'm inspired by that. The second word that I constantly hear, and I'll give a quote here, but it's been logistics. And most of you may not even know who this gentleman is. His name was General John J. Pershing. He was the commander of US forces in World War I on Europe. And he famously was quoted as saying, infantry wins battles, logistics wins war. So logistics is critically important to all the topics we've discussed, and it'll be certainly paramount to the topic here today. Now, as we stand, or I stand, you sit uh, here, the immediate problem may be actually underway of being addressed. Just two kilometers from here, Domobachi Palace right now, representatives from Ukraine, Russia, and Turkey, and the UN are gathering, and they may be on the verge of signing an agreement to allow the more than 20 million tons of grain uh, that is currently stockpiled in Ukraine to make its way to the global market. So I think we can all adjourn, problem solved, it's being addressed. However, I think the topic of today's discussion, and what I hope these gentlemen will help me illustrate, is that the global food security is not a new problem. It's an ongoing problem, and what has happened in Ukraine is simply a symptom of that, and that is the one domino falls in the global supply chain of grain, and the whole system starts to shake. The whole system starts to wobble. Uh, and so I think it's critical that, Boris, I think you can help us on this with your agri-tech, ag-tech, and things like this. I think it's critical that we talk about how we solve the greater problem. But first, I've been asked by almost everybody I've met, A, hey, what's 8 degrees east? 8 degrees east is simply the latitude of Zurich, Switzerland, where my company is located. Simple, done. 8 Degrees East is a business strategy, business advisory group. My partner, Steve, you can raise your hand down here in the front, is with us as well. 
and I'm very honored to be here. The second question I got today is, what do you know about food security? Simple answer is nothing. I like food. I like security. Bit on my background, and as I thought about it a bit more, and I thank Tristan for inviting me to be here, I thought about it, you know, I may be actually a good candidate for this job today. My background is 22 years of US military service. I was a US Marine for 22 years. I fought in Iraq, Afghanistan. I've seen the horrors of war. I've seen the horrors of famine. I've seen the worst of the worst. So I acutely am here standing here today to talk to you about how we solve one of these great challenges that our globe faces today. Secondly, I ran for a number of years, five years to be exact, a business and trade organization that was principally focused on US-Turkey trade um, to develop our interrelated trade, to increase our trade volumes, business cooperation, investment, FDI, and all of the alike. So I do have a bit of sense of the interconnectedness of the world today and how critical that is to uh, the stability and prosperity of everybody around the globe. So enough about me. Let me go ahead and I'm going to turn the floor to Minister Kakuza first to make your opening remarks, five to seven minutes if I might ask you to do, and then we'll get to Boris and hopefully by that time maybe Diego has found his way to the stage and will join us. So without further ado, Mr. Kakuza. Uh, thank you very much, fellow delegates. As he has mentioned, the war is und undesirable at any time. This is the reason why on October 24th, 1945, delegates from some 51 countries at San Francisco Conference created a universal organization and committed to maintaining international peace and security developing friendly relations among nations and promoting social progress, better living standards and human rights. I want to thank the International Trade Council who are organizers of this Global Economic Impact Forum on Ukraine. And I want to take this opportunity to salute the federal delegates and especially those from Ukraine. I extend my deepest emphasis to the several Ukrainian families that have lost their lives loved ones, and the devastating destruction on infrastructure and the way of life that have been caused by this war. A war that could largely have been avoided. A war that can still be stopped. My overview, there are no real victors in wars all parties involved have to suffer the consequences with often high numbers of casualties on both sides. Rather than dealing with the direct effects of people, politics, the economy, and the environment of two countries of war, namely Russia and Ukraine, my submission will restrict itself to the spillover effect of this war on the NATO parties to this war, particularly the continent of Africa, and even more specifically in Uganda, where I come from. As an economist, my duty here is not to point fingers at who aggressor or the provocator is. That is an area of experts of the intricacies of the international relations. My duty is to give you a somber but a, a factual narrative of negative economic impact on the war in Africa with precisely from a most Ugandan perspective. To put this discussion in two focus, a little petrol in Uganda as February 24th, 22nd, when the war broke out, proper was, proper was slightly above 80 cents in US dollars, and today it's well above one dollar and 80 cents. This is only the tip of the iceberg. As you, I will demonstrate in the course of my submission, the economic impact and the costs of the Ukraine will not be borne only by the innocent wheat farmer from Donetsk region, but also the cab driver on my capital city, Kampala Road, in the capital city of Uganda, 
some good away, 7,689.7 kilometers away. The economic impact of Ukraine war on Africa, fellow delegates, while Africa is yet to fully recover from the socioeconomic repercussions of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Russia-Ukraine conflict poses another major threat to the global economy, with the many African countries being directly affected. We were still reading from the unprecedented shocks of the pandemic, and now this. Just within a few weeks, global wheat, sunflower, and oil crude prices have soared to unprecedented levels. Africa is heavily reliant on food imports from both countries, and the continent is already experiencing price shocks and disruption in the supply chain of these commodities. The conflict has hugely impacted on food security in Africa, both through availability of pricing in some food crops, particularly wheat and sunflower, as a well as socioeconomic recovery and growth, triggered by rising uncertainties in global financial, financial markets and supply chain systems. Over the past decade, the continent has been growing demand for cereal crops, including wheat and sunflower, which has been mainly supported by imports than local production. Africa's wheat imports increased by 68% between 2007 and 2019, siding to 40 million tons. Russia and Ukraine, both the often referred to the world's bread basket, are major players in the export of wheat and sunflower to Africa. North Africa, Algeria, Egypt, Libya, Morocco, and Tunisia. Nigeria and West Africa, Ethiopia and Sudan in East Africa. South Africa account for 80% of wheat imports. Wheat consumption in Africa is projected to reach 76 point million tons by 2025, to which 48.3 million tons, or 63.4%, is projected to be imported outside of the continent. And on the other hand, the sanctions imposed on Russia by Western countries have further exacerbated commercial flows between Russia and Africa due to the close of vital port operation in the Black Sea. Russia is one of the world's big, biggest exporters of fertilizers. Concerns are growing that worldwide shortage of fertilizer will lead to rising food prices with a knock effective for agriculture production and food security. Russia is also the world's third largest oil producer behind the United States and Saudi Arabia, if the research is correct. The disruption of oil prices on the world market is expected to lead to an increase of fuel prices and higher costs of food production. Some regions, including the Horn of Africa and Sahel region, are at a greater risk of food security due to country-specific shocks, climate change, export restriction, stock peeling, stock peeling especially in rising fertilizer and other energy intensive input costs will negatively impact the next agriculture season as a result of ongoing conflict. The Uganda experience. Federal delegates, I've, I have already alluded to, Africa isn't immune from the Ukraine war was fallout on global economic activity. In Uganda, bread has become almost unaffordable and a car fuel prohibitively expensive. In this case, with other African countries, Uganda strongly depends on wheat and oil imports. This, the increasing bread and fuel prices following the Ukraine war and the sanctions hit Ugandans and had and could have devastating impact on the country's economy. Talking of trade between Uganda and Ukraine it reminds me of wheat, military hardware, and education, especially in science studies. Now, according to the observatory, economic complexity, a global private trade data bank, Ukraine's main export to Uganda in 2020 was wheat worth $141 million, followed by unclassified items worth $66 million, ironware, special purpose truck, helicopters, and aircraft parts. Uganda exported to the country leaf tobacco and coffee worth $13 million, and USA $4.8 3 million respectively. While aircraft parts and accessories were worth $10 million, these trade exchanges have certainly been affected. 
research also shows that failure of East African of East European products to reach the international market has created a greater impact of scarcity and prices increase than the actual production in the affected countries. The same is true with exports, especially from Africa and East of the, those countries. Currently, passenger and cargo aircraft on the region is disrupted and it is impossible to enter the Ukraine space. Unfortunately, the exports from Uganda and other East African countries reach most of East, Eastern Europe through countries like Ukraine, Belarus, Poland, according to the exporters. According to information available, global wheat prices have jumped by a third from $345 per ton to $460 since the fighting began. But other items that Uganda does not import directly from Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus have also been affected. The global oil and gas industry, for example, is already affected with crude oil prices skyrocketing. The commodity was already seeing price increase due to global scarcity as demand was outstripping supply to almost a year. For Uganda and East African countries, it was made worse by a, a truck driver strike at key border Uganda entry over the cost of mandatory COVID-19 testing. On the social side of the spectrum, data from Uganda Minister of Foreign Affairs show that at the beginning of the war, Uganda had at least 100 citizens in Ukraine, mostly students, but also residents who had settled there with families. However, the ministry expects that there are many more Ugandans in the country, some unknown because they have not registered their presence there with the Ugandan authorities. It's unfathomable, but past possible that some have these since died. Ladies and gentlemen, picture this di di diplomatic dilemma. Uganda's ambassador to Ukraine sits in Moscow. Russia is also in charge of Georgia. Moldova and Uzbekistan and Belarus. Ukraine embassy in Uganda is in the border area in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Most of the Ugandan who go for studies in Ukraine and the other former Soviet countries go for science, especially medicine, engineering, and agrotechnology. Before February 2022, few people expected Russia to launch a direct attack on Ukraine. At least in the next few days, all hours, save for close allies like China and Belarus. The war in Ukraine has consequences around the globe, including Uganda, where food staples become more expensive. I want to tell this dignified audience that now high prices and small portions have left many in Uganda on the edge. The negative impact of the war has also had far-reaching impact on the common man. For those who have ever been to Uganda or read the road in the Uganda way of life, you must have heard of the leakers called Rolex. Most of streets and markets in Uganda have at least one vendor firing up a hot plate ready to cook for food, which is a term used to mean Rolex and it's usually comes with tomatoes, cabbage, and onion, and pressed everywhere from the 1,000 to 2,000 Uganda shillings, which is 28 to 57 cents. Uganda is one of the most countries dependent on Russia and Ukraine for, calm, for some wheat imports. More than a half of Ugandan imports of this vital grain come from Russia and Ukraine. And the shortage is being felt by the country's street vendors who really have on wheat on cooking oil to produce their main offerings of Rolex, chapatis, and chikamandos, and other chapat wrap with beans. To meet these rising costs, may, many vendors are reducing the size of their offerings, leaving customers hungry and lacking the nutrients that would normally get them from their work days. Way forward. Nonetheless, amidst the crisis created by the Ukraine war, I see a silver lining to reduce reliance on food imports in Africa and indeed Uganda. Investors, we need to focus on this because the cost of production and sustainability should be achieved. With the developed world, you've got machinery, mechanization, where Africa is wanting in that. Africa country Uganda must also see the current geo political crisis and opportunity to reduce its reliance on food imports from outside the continent. 
Instead, African countries need to take advantage of their 60% global share of variable land to grow more food for domestic consumption and export to the global market. This would lower the number of people facing food nutrition insecurity caused by extant shocks. In 2021, the African Union Commission, the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, worked with African countries to create a common African position ahead of the Food System Summit in line with the African Union's Agenda 2063 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The African Common Position is a synthesis and a unified view of how to transform Africa's food system over the next decade primarily resilience in the face of growing vulnerability and shocks. It's anchored in the comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program and Malabo Declaration on Accelerating Agriculture Growth. Rapid expansion on agriculture and food productivity and production has been identified as one of the game-changing solutions to prevent future disruption. The supply chain of wheat and sunflower across Africa, countries that produce these cereals need to increase their capacity to produce and supply to other countries through into Africa, African trade. And those that do not should consider incorporating specific food crops in their agriculture value chain. This will reduce the reliance on wheat and grain imports from Russia and Ukraine, and most importantly, promote intra Africa trade and grow African sub agribusiness sectors. Another level in transforming Africa food system in the African continent of free trade area, which came into effect on 1st July, came into effect on 1st July 2021. African countries must take advantage of the world's largest free trade area. The trade treaty is expected to offer 2.5 trillion trillion dollars in combined gross GDP and agribusiness will be significant significant to contribute to this growth. The African continent free trade area would increase production and value addition as well as ensure adequate quality infrastructure and food safety standards to supply and grow local regional agro food markets. Regarding the oil and gas factor to avoid future food price shocks caused by rising oil and gas prices on the global market, African countries must improve the oil and gas production and exploration capability to fill any gaps that may occur as a result of supply chain disruption among the major global producers. African countries that produce fuel and gas such as Algeria, Angola, Cameroon, Republic of Congo, Egypt, Equatorial Guinea, Libya, Mozambique, Nigeria, Senegal, Sudan, and Tanzania should explore boosting production, filling the gas and oil gap within the continent and beyond to alleviate fuel price shocks which could contribute to lower food costs. In addition, African governments should invest or attract greater international investment in oil and gas exploration, particularly in countries where sub subterranean oil reserves are believed to exist but have yet to be explored. I would like to conclude by strongly affirming that regional solutions are prerequisite to addressing structural weakness and vulnerabilities, including poverty inequality. The Russia-Ukraine conflict has once more exposed the urgent need for policy and investment choices to sustain and build viable, resilient, and inclusive food system on the African continent. With these few remarks, I'd like to stop here. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Minister Kakuza, for a very data-rich uh, presentation and really uh, gets to the heart of sort of the pain point, the ripple effect of what's going on uh, in the glo global food crisis and some of those that will be most affected by this. Uh, before we proceed, I want to thank, uh, well, first let me give the apologies for Mr. Uh, Munoz. He was detained and unable to make it, but we've had a... Uh, Fill in, very graciously, Mr. Alfred Prouse, uh, the president of the Austrian-Ukrainian Business Associates, has joined us on stage, and I very much appreciate him joining us, and we'll hear from him in just a moment. But before I do that, let's turn to, let's turn to the tech side. Let's turn to the agri-business side and hear from uh, Boris uh, on his perspectives 
on some of the solutions that may be available uh, for the future of global food crisis? Uh, maybe not have big solutions. First of all, maybe needs to talk about different side of this problem, because uh, situations about Russian aggressions in Ukraine and food crisis, uh, what has happened after this, it's a topic of this forum and of uh, and topic of all the newspaper now and on the inform now. But it's understand why because uh, before the war, Ukrainian it's a global food supplier. And um, in 2021, Ukrainian uh, agri-food export uh, was equivalent uh, to feeding around uh, 400 plus million people. And understand why today this problem uh, exciting a lot of country who is uh, reliable to Ukrainian, Ukrainian food business. And, uh, but need to understand this problem has a two sides. It's a very, very important questions because one side, it's a picture of what we have now. Uh, Ukrainian ports blocked. We have more than uh, around 250 million tons of different type of goods. Uh, first of all, uh, next, last year crops in uh, our port. And uh, we start to collect uh, harvest of this year. What does we have now? Uh, now we have uh, in internal price in Ukraine, price inside from the farms, uh, around two times less than cost of uh, real um, value of this uh, crops. Because uh, who is now main player of this market? It's a logistics company, and but not like just just like company. It's a logistics situations. Uh, now, uh, price from the from the silo in west of Ukraine to port in, for example, uh, Constanta, cost two times more than price of uh, crops. And it's um, just start to this problem, because uh, why it needs to decide this. Uh, what needs to solve this problem? Because it's a just start of uh, situations. Because exactly uh, immediately after the finish of uh, harvest time, uh, start to time to new uh, preparing new harvest. If our farmers don't have enough money. Yeah. So uh, let me actually stop you there. I'd like to have a bit of conversation about this. So assume we have an agreement today. We open up transport. We're able to start shipping grain through the Black Sea. How does that how does that affect it? I mean, there's obviously a ripple effect. We haven't been shipping for months uh, now. Okay, my opinion, uh, it's a just uh, part of problem. Okay, it's a gift. Uh, it's a gift very shortly, very shortly decision, but just for this time. And uh, first of all, it's a give a place. Okay, it's uh, give a little bit money, but not full money because gap it's too much. And this logistics corridor, it's very expensive. It's not give full solutions. It's not like situations uh, like uh, one year before. It's uh, not give uh, for us 100% uh, of uh, this problem. And uh, okay, we delivery. I hope uh, this to 2000, uh, 20,000, 25,000 million ton of grain of uh, this uh, last uh, last harvest. But it's uh, you know it's uh, uh, it's very delicate situations, and I'm not sure it's work like a watch like a Swiss watch during the, all this time. Needs to understand. It needs to understand. Main main uh, solutions. It is just exactly stop of the war. Uh, all another all and another solutions. It is just uh, temporary solutions. Uh, and what I what I try to say, we have uh, two solutions. First of all, start to what I talked yesterday. It's a start to uh, food uh, processing in Ukraine. Uh, develop food processing in Ukraine for uh, growing, growing um, ready products for delivery in the, for this case, influence of price of the logistics, it's a less than for the uh, raw material. It's uh, one side. Another question needs to remember, we lost now around 30% of territory. 
30% of territory, it's 30% uh, of harvest. Uh, it's uh, uh, really decrease uh, quantity of harvest for next year. So what you're saying is that this is going to be a perennial problem next year as well because we'll face lack, reduced harvest, uh, so there'll be less grain in the market, which will drive prices. Really, really reduce, and for this case, price uh, more go up. Correct. Uh, you know, situations with the oil. Um, it means it means with the, with the, uh, oil it, it means diesel and uh, petrol for the agriculture workers, and all these factors go price up. Right. So those are the short. Those are the short-term realities uh, for sure. Um, I wonder if maybe Alfred could give a bit of perspective as he sits on the Austrian side, um, from Europe side. How do you see this situation and this problem and then current situation? Maybe a potential agreement, and, and then where do we go from here? Okay, I'm not an expert in that, but I have some idea and some knowledge. And I'm also speaking on behalf of the International Council of Business Associations and Chambers in Ukraine, so it's not just Austria. Uh, I think the problem is even deeper than uh, Boris uh, has described, because due to the programs like crop proceeds, etc., the harvest is sold already. So that means that the farmers don't have the money for sowing in the next season. So it's even more grave than you said first. From the European perspective, perspective I would say um, it's clear that this is a political, political game of Putin, not only against Ukraine. Ukraine in that uh, Putin wants to suffocate Ukraine, closing down the whole Black Sea. Uh, as everybody knows, Ukraine, and uh, I need not repeat it, is number one, number two, number three, number four in several uh, agricultural products, uh, raw products uh, in the world market. And this, uh, as uh, Mr. Minister has pointed out, is creating a big crisis in African countries and uh, uh, Asian countries. And that may lead to a refugee crisis again. And Putin is waiting for that, because where would they go? They would not go to Russia. They go to Europe. And Putin would lean back and would say, ha ha, now you have the consequence. So this is a geopolitical game of the very, very cute Mr. Putin. OK, uh, what to do? Uh, Ukraine, in my view, is in a kind of a locked-in situation because all what is done by rail, by truck, by ship, Danube, etc., this may uh, cover 10, 20, 30 uh, percent of the whole problem uh, because rail, you have the different gauges, yeah? Uh, in, in Ukraine and going to Western Europe, etc. So this is not only a question of, of, of price, of logistic costs, this is a question of uh, available capacity in the rails and, f and for the hoppers and this and that and this and that. So the whole situation cannot be solved. What I see today, and again, I'm uh, not a wizard and uh, I'm not top knowledgeable, uh, what I see today, uh, if I'm not wrong with the uh, sense and the mind of Mr. Putin, he may want to blackmail Ukraine and the European Union to give something, to give something up in terms of sanctions, etc., etc. So, and this is again creating a problem in Europe uh, because to weaken the sanctions. Uh, which had been uh, negotiated for weeks in some cases, uh, very tough negotiations, would divide Europe. So this is an ugly situation for Ukraine, because without a solution, it would be suffocated, uh, not being able to export 60-70% of uh, the potential. And by this losing uh, several, maybe even many billions, uh, of, 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 of dollars, mm -hmm. and this is, uh, again, tactic of Putin, because uh, I'm not sure whether the West, so this is America and Europe, uh, will, uh, like, uh, give infusions for years <laughs> yeah, uh, of uh, several billion dollars a month. 
So this is really a grave problem, and I'm not sure if Putin will give up his a very good negotiation position uh, for smaller concessions from Europe. So this is not yet solved, and I would be positively surprised, and I would drink a bottle of champagne if there is a signature. Today. And if there is a signature, whether this will hold. Correct. Because Putin is well known. He's yeah, saying that. one, he's thinking two, yeah. Yeah, and doing three. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, I appreciate those remarks. And undoubtedly, you're correct. And it's a, going to be multi-year challenge. Money is one issue, funding, the lost revenues, the problems for the farmers, things like this. I wonder if we come back to something you talked about, which is you know, on the global problem of food security, it seems to me that one of the solutions might be greater production in geographic proximity to where the products are being utilized. So you mentioned in your opening remarks that there is um, part of the East African Union that uh, you spoke about, that there is going to be some efforts there. Could you maybe elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, what we are trying to do in Africa Monster, when we are trying to make a way forward, we are trying to create an intra-trade like European Union, like uh, what is now. We have SADC, we have East African Community, which is comprised of seven countries, which is Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi. We are creating an intra-trade market that can really deal with the East African Customs Union, with one customs union, one common market, one monetary union, and increase the capacity to invite the foreign direct investment within those that we increase the capacity of uh, production. Because where we are now is a situation which is not easy. What I know, there are some people, investors, who have got money, but and mechanization machines which are advanced in technology. So what we are trying to form a block in West Africa, they have ECOWAS, mm -hmm. in South Africa, they have SADAC. Mm -hmm. So we are trying within to, within to have a common market within the region. Mm -hmm. But we are trying also on the other side to, to encourage the foreign investment FDIs, direct investment. Mm -hmm. We are reducing on taxes. We are reducing on people who want to invest in. Any profits can be taken back to their home country. This is what we are looking at. That once we have a common market and we collect foreign direct investment in those blocks, we trade together. The market becomes huge. Mm -hmm. And what I know in East African countries, soils, they are really the cost of production is cheaper and agro processing. Because this is where a country it has soils, whereby you don't need fertilizers, mm -hmm. which has been imported from these countries. You don't need to do much. That means we are, the cost of production is cheaper, and it's worth it to invest in money mm -hmm. than in another region. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I truly, I think that is certainly, uh, cert should be a focus in the future of global food security. Is of course, this, this is what, solution. you know, in my culture, we've got a language that where two elephants fight, it's the grass which suffers most. <laughs> but you need to necessitate the mass of invasion. So we are trying to form blocks within the regions mm -hmm. that we can sustain. Because what is happening, nobody can project when, are we go when is the war ending. Yeah. And what do we do right now? Right. Yeah. Now there's a short-term demand, need, necessity, versus midterm, and then as you talk about uh, yeah. the long term. Yeah. Boris, if I might come back to you then, uh, you talked about this was boiled down as just a shipping problem. If we could just open the shipping lines, it would all go away. This is what the major problem was presented to the broader world, and I would say that most that are not experts are really following this closely. That's probably what they believe. It's just a shipping problem. Now that this agreement is maybe signed, the problem goes away. That's obviously not true. Um, how much of Ukrainian's grain and other products, the seed oils and things like this, how much of that is exported via the Black Sea and out through Bosphorus to the world? And then other mechanisms like you talked about, truck, rail, et cetera, and 
how do we address those issues? Because obviously that was there before. You talk about gauges, rails, this sort of thing. That's always been there. So how was it dealt with before, and what's the maybe solution sets that might be on the horizon? Universal solution, it's the stop of the war. It's universal solutions, but it's not happened today, and it's a pity it's a not happened maybe in this year. Uh, we must be preparing uh, everything what is possible. Uh, but uh, needs to remember, before the 24th of February, Ukrainian uh, has approximately together 150 million ton of goods, which is delivery uh, through the, all the uh, transport vary, but 80% uh, through, through the sea. Uh, just uh, Black Sea port, uh, uh, it's around 8 million ton per month. What is needs to make now? Uh, don't have unique solutions, but um, last two days we talked about uh, different type of uh, solutions. One of this, it's a, a more faster developed uh, dry port near the west border of Ukraine. Ukrainian uh, Ministry of Infrastructure and some private company preparing some two, three big project, which is a help to delivery uh, grain and crops through the border. Uh, other questions very important. It needs to uh, increase very fast uh, temporary storages in the west part of country for safe crops, for safe money. And, uh, okay, if it's, we don't have possibility to uh, transfer immediately full capacity, we, but we have another good things. Uh, we don't have winter time if we have a dry port and we have a railway gauge. It's uh, for all year. If we very fast uh, build temporary storages, for safe crops this year and second and next year, we have very good chance for safe uh, more crops and uh, most of problem we solve uh, through this case. Thank you. So dry ports and uh, temporary stores <clears throat> seem like the immediate demand. Um, Alfred, if I could come back to you, then uh, I know you don't, but you sit in the EU. Um, where, where do you see the help for those kinds of projects coming from uh, on the global scale? Is it through um, EU funding mechanisms? Is it broader than that? How, how should we tackle that problem? There must be international funding, like in many other areas. Uh, and this funding uh, should include to uh, improve the railway infrastructure, uh, at the same time modernizing it. Because if uh, Ukraine wants to join the European Union, maybe the change, they change the gauge, at least in some areas. They use the rebuilding of the infrastructure, the problems in export, uh, to have the European, Western European gauge. That is one thing. The second thing, in my view, is a, a quite negative uh, consequence or a quite negative aspect, because even if you uh, create additional capacity by rail, etc., etc., this does not alleviate the cost problem, logistic cost. And the logistic cost means that the price of the agricultural goods, wheat, corn, uh, maize, and whatever, is maybe double or triple. And the question is, what is the world market price? And what can the countries in Africa, in Asia, afford to pay? So this is creating another funding problem. It's a kind of a vicious circle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, thank you. That's, that's the, the trickle-down effect of, of all of this, of course, is, is really quite monumental. So we have just a few minutes left. I, I always like to hear from the audience. Um, so if there are folks in the audience that have questions, and I would encourage questions. Then I see one over here. Um, 
I'll come around, give you the microphone, and uh, please address your question, and we'll try and answer the best we can. So let me come down here first. Thank you. Um, I want to ask for the next season. Uh, how about um, uh, fuel? I mean, biodiesel. Uh, I mean, it, it would in, uh, decrease uh, the like transport necessity. Like, uh, and oil prices are high. It will. Uh, it can bring uh, more income. I mean, it will be bad for Asia and Africa. I know, but maybe it can be a uh, seasonal solution uh, for Ukraine. If you ask a question, I'll give you a candy. Okay, may I give an answer? Please, sir. Uh, we have a shortage of food supply. We have a, court, a shortage of corn, wheat, etc. Uh, so for biofuels, corn, maize, rapeseed is used. So would you solve the food crisis in that you are using it for uh, diesel or for petrol? And this is a question which has been discussed in, in Western Europe for years uh, uh, in that what is the priority? Is the priority food or is the priority diesel or petrol? And under the given circumstances, I feel, this is my humble personal opinion, this is the wrong track to use it for biofuels. And there was a proposal here yesterday or today in the morning, projects, uh, biodiesel, etc., etc. Of course, that's good if we are affluent in, uh, in the agricultural products uh, which are used for production of, bio, uh, of, of biofuels. But this is not the case here. Uh, and one may, maybe small additional, it's my, exactly in, in my, our private, my private experience. Uh, we are one of the biggest Ukrainian producer of flour. And when we, when we produce flour, of course, we produce wheat bran. Uh, wheat bran, it's a very important thing for the feeding of animals. Uh, we export, it's one of the, our main positions for export before uh, 24 of February. Uh, it's price for this product depends on the time and of depends on the quantity of green mass, but it's something around 110 euro uh, CPT, 120 euro CPT. Uh, in April, uh, we selling by zero, just for delivery from our flour factory because it's impossible to continue procedures. Uh, now we have a contract, long contract for uh, selling uh, wheat bran. We, we, we have a big, big contract for uh, $50 now. $50 now is ex work from our factory. For this case, for this case, uh, we start to burn wheat bran uh, for the heating, uh, for the heating uh, technology, water in our procedures. For this case, just for this case, for this year, we used good products, ready products, for uh, next uh, stage, like biodiesel or uh, exactly to burn in our systems. Like, but it's just utilizations. Thank you, Bob. Can I ask? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay. Um, actually, I have two questions. Anybody who is willing can answer. First one is related to business activities. Second one will be a little bit more political. Um, every investor is looking for economic stability and political stability in the country. That's the first. Second, they're looking for um, profit, to be precise. Um, do you really think that Ukrainian government will be willing to create chances for those investors to have monopolistic or oligopolistic activities in case they invest in the country earlier prior to the um, other investors that would invest after the war? That's the first question. And the second one, um, when we say a country, we 
mean in general terms. But when we go specific, we can mention whether this is the government doing this, whether this is the nation, whether this is the institution or whatever. This war we are talking about, in your opinion, is the war between the governments or between the nations. Thank you so much. Any takers? <laughs> First of all, it's a question for the part of the government. I think it's better if there's some ministry in this in this whole answer to to, to, to these questions. It's a little bit difficult for me uh, answer for the Ukrainian uh, government. Uh, but. Uh, I answer for the second question first because uh, my opinion is that it's uh, more than a uh, war between the government. It's a uh, war uh, Russia against the Ukrainian nation. Ukrainian, 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 Ukrainian idea, Ukrainian people. It's more than uh, the just uh, uh, war between the different government. It's a war exactly against the Ukrainian like uh, big part of uh, Europe Union of future, my opinion. So I, have, I do have someone here that would like to take a stab at this. Yeah, um, so Lisa is co-member of Ukrainian parliament and I cannot say on behalf of Ukrainian government, but I can say on behalf of Ukrainian parliament as a, a member of Zelensky party also. So regarding the first question and uh, whether there could be a monopoly of some investors, you know that recently we voted for the oligarchization law, which actually says that there shouldn't be any monopoly in, in, in Ukraine, and uh, it includes, of course, political monopoly, uh, the control of the media, but now I also think, together with our policy of decentralization, we are very much interested that we have diversity, and we have different investors, we have different people who will help us to develop different industries, different regions, so we are interested in diversity, not in, in my monopoly. And regarding the second question that uh, I really want to answer, um, because I could feel that this question sometimes is asked, and especially in those countries that are closer to, let's say, Arab world, Asia, and a little bit further. Um, I can hear it, this question also in Turkey. This war is aggression of Putin and lots of Russian people against Ukraine. That includes all who is in Ukraine. That includes, yes, our government. It includes our society. If it was only between some of the governments, that would be much more easier. The question is that we see that even the polls in Russia show that Russian people support war. They like seeing that the Russian army is killing Ukrainians, Ukrainian infrastructure. So, and, and you can see all of us who are speaking, most of us, you see the representatives of business, of the parliament, of the trade uh, unions chamber, we speak first of all, as humans and as Ukrainians. We don't speak only with a political agenda. We, we are very much united just now, right now, and this is very special. And that's why we support President Zelensky efforts. That's why we have unity in a society right now, because it concerns all of us. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent answer. That deserves two candies. May I have an addition to that? Sure, sure. As Western European, who has been living until now 15 years in Ukraine, who has an Ukrainian family, uh, etc. Uh, as Western European, I have to observe that uh, the question, uh, what kind of war is it, uh, is sometimes uh, in Germany, in Austria, in some other Western European countries, not seen the right way. And I have to fully agree to you, I can't agree more, the war by Putin is to extinguish, to erase Ukraine as a nation, as people, as a language, as a culture, etc. Let Ukraine, including the name, disappear forever. And 
those people, and I have been at uh, uh, the Ostausschuss of Deutsche Wirtschaft, so this is a German Federation, uh, a federation of German uh, uh, industries in Berlin um, six, five weeks ago at the annual uh, meeting. I heard top people, and I may tell it like it is. Uh, deputy chairman of BA BASF Group, etc. Real industrial captains. They are short sighted and they don't see that uh, this war has a European perspective. They want peace. They want a ceasefire. They want to continue their business. And even in Austria, I'm, I'm an Austrian. I don't know. Maybe Putin will be welcomed by the Austrian Chamber of Commerce in one or two years. Hi, let's do business. That happened in 2015, after the first aggression. So this is a real aggression against Western mm -hmm. values. And it is fought in Ukraine. And if it can't be stopped in Ukraine, I say this as a Western, Euro as a Western European. It will go on like Medvedev, etc. Vladivostok to Lisbon. Yeah. Just to quote. Thank you. No, I think that's a great segue for, we have one more panel today, and I'm sorry, I do have to wrap up. I know you, I have some questions back there, but I, you have to, can you do it for the next one? There's another panel right after this. Can you hold the question? Okay, one last question. Go ahead. Do you have a mic? Okay. Istanbul Post, uh, Postcom TR, Hülya Karahan. Uh, when will this war end and how? Who will end this war? Anybody want to predict? I mean, I'll take that question. I, I think, and this is personal opinion, I think it is, it is not, the horizon is not there yet, my opinion. I think we can all hope and we can all wish, and these kind of events I think will precipitate that, uh, hopefully sooner than later. Um, but I would hazard no guess as to when the hostilities end. I think if history has shown us anything that these types of conflicts can become stale and last for a long time, I don't wish that on anybody and I hope that is not the case here, but I wouldn't put anybody under the spotlight for that, so I'll take that question. But that's my opinion and I think the solution to that lies mainly in the hands of the Russian government and at the hands of Vladimir Putin as to when this war will end, uh, as it is an outright aggression against the Ukrainian people. So, there, is no, there is no exit possibility, correct. and this is the problem. Correct, correct. So thank you, that was a great discussion. I appreciate you indulging me on in my non-standard uh, approach to the moderation side. Thank you, please join me in a round of applause for Alfred uh, Boris and uh, Minister Kakuza. <laughs> thank you, stick around. We got one more panel to go, and uh, then we'll wrap up the uh, two days of events. So thank you so much for your attention. We'll do a group photo. Aladi, can you make a photo? Right. Including the <laughs> moderator. <laughs> and just a moment, I will give you my, my photo as well. The Bamba. Or they are the majority. Thank you. You're sitting on one side, you're sitting on the other side. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as the uh, previous panel highlighted, there is one more panel to go, but some travel arrangements necessitated a change in order uh, of uh, the things that we needed to complete uh, for today. Uh, Mrs. Chetinkaya, Boju Chetinkaya, who really masterfully conducted these two days of conferences as the master of our ceremony, uh, will have to leave early. So uh, we wanted to uh, invite her to the uh, floor, if uh, Burju might uh, please join us. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Burju, um, I'm sure you heard how grateful we are for the efficient conduct, timely uh, discipline that you subjected us to, to keep to the schedule. Uh, it was, uh, from all perspectives, uh, have been remarkable two days, and uh, your contributions to it, as I said, have been uh, substantial. And also, on your presence here, uh, I'd like to thank you and the team of AgroTV, where you are engaged uh, for, for your services. So, um, before we send you off, uh, we have a, a record of recognition for you and also for AgroTV, so I'd like to first present them to you, but uh, please let's have a, a good round of applause for our Master of Ceremonies, please. One is for you personally for this work and I, I certainly hope that uh, we will have the opportunity to work on future conferences about Ukraine uh, but in the environment of peace and how to progress reconstruction uh, as uh, we win the war in the end. So thank you. And also before I give the uh, floor to you, I also want to present you with the recognition, a record of recognition for AgroTV. So you will, on our behalf, please uh, pass our gratitude to your colleagues as well. Thank you very much. I will. Uh, thank you very much. I don't want to keep it long. Thank you very much for your patience. I know uh, there was some, uh, it was a bit last minute for me, but I'm very proud and happy to be here. And hopefully, as Mr. Shevki Arjuna said, we will rejoin in a peaceful uh, conference uh, with a lot of hopes into the future and I'm hoping also from Agro TV side we are trying to establish an international agro media network and uh, I hope that Ukraine will be a major part of it. Thank you very much. And we, before you go, this is from the entire organization and also from our audience to you. Please enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Our, and, and please excuse the look of your temporary master of ceremonies compared to the professional one, but I will try to do the last bit. Uh, the, the next and final panel is, uh, have the topic of regional perspectives for international business. and. Our moderator will be Mr. Michael Edgar, who is the CEO of Select Chicago. And the, the panel will address how are the regional chambers of commerce dealing with cross-border business interruptions? What are the major challenges that their constituents are facing? How can governments assist in addressing those challenges? And are there opportunities which will emerge from the crisis? and how these can be harnessed. And I will invite the panelists to the floor. Uh, Mr. Arda Batu, who is the Secretary General and Board Member of Turconfed. Mr. Batu. Mrs. Olana Shrokova, Vice Chairman of ICC, 
United Arab Emirates Commission on Trade and Investment. Igor Stefanet, who is the CEO of Invest Moldova. Uh, Mr. Temuz Yit Bezmez, Head of Project and Business Development, French Chamber of Commerce in Turkey. For, uh, uh, sorry, for Stefan, oh, Eren, okay. And uh, Mr. Onur Ünlü is our final panelist uh, from TÜBKONFED and ESCON president of EODER. So uh, I, I would like to have Michael to uh, conduct the rest of the panel, please. Thank, Thank you. It's going to get loud. <laughs> so, turn that off. Okay. so good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Edgar from Select Chicago. So I got on a plane about five days ago to come to Istanbul. And I've been very excited to come and listen to the speakers over the last couple of days and then learn about the history of this great city. And so can everybody hear me well? Yes? I know it's late. It's Friday afternoon. Uh, and this is an exciting panel. This is really kind of going to tie up in a nice bow what we have been learning about the last couple of days and thinking about how we can take away these things about what we've learned about Ukraine and how we can implement them. So, you know, we're a little bit about Select Chicago. Select Chicago is about helping inbound and outbound foreign direct investment to the Select Chicago area. Select Chicago, Chicago is interesting, uh, kind of like Istanbul, where it's a really a crossroads in the United States. Outside of the city of Chicago, there are 256 municipalities. So when we think about Chicago, we think about the city. That's 2.3 million people in the city of Chicago. But outside the city of Chicago, there's 256 independent municipalities that are about 9.6 million people. So that's a large trade area in of itself. Also, part of the Chicago area is the benefit of having 50 trade offices from around the world. So by coming here, I was able to meet a lot of my counterparts where I work with the Lithuanian Trade Office, uh, Japanese Trade Office, the Taiwanese Trade Office, and we're able to talk and bring back dialogues here. And so what's great about this panel is we're going to be talking about the regional chambers and how they are dealing with these cross-border issues and coming up with some opportunities that we can discuss. So I'm with us, I'm just going to introduce each person in turn, and basically I'm going to say that their name and their company, and they're going to go start with their early remarks. So first up is Arda Batu, Secretary General and Board Member of TurcoFed, and that is the Turkish Enterprise and Business Confederation. Yeah, I think that's good. Thank you for that kind introduction and thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And as our moderator said, I realize it's a Friday afternoon. So I'll try to keep it light and practical and I'll try to be as succinct as possible. Uh, I uh, serve as a Secretary General of Turkish Enterprise and Business Confederation. It's a confederation that functions at the national level in Turkey. Uh, we represent uh, about, well, not about 30 federations and about 300 individual business associations across Turkey. East, West, North, South, all across Turkey, we have 300 business, uh, business associations that are members of the Confederation. And that translates to roughly 50,000 individual businesses across Turkey. So, uh, categorically, we are the biggest independent, non-partisan uh, network of businesses in Turkey. We take pride of that. Uh, and now coming a little bit to the function, I, I think we have two, three minutes, correct? Sir? Yeah. Uh, let me talk about not only to Confed's function, but maybe uh, the function of, uh, of business associations, uh, regional or national uh, or international. Um, I, think, I think it doesn't matter if you're a business association in Senegal or Turkey or Finland. Ultimately, there are 
uh, there are these functions that you need to, that your members uh, uh, want from these uh, associations, these networks. One is they need insight from you, especially in times of crises. Uh, in times of crises, you, as everyone knows, there's really a cloud of information, most of which is, uh, might not be correct. It might lead the businesses uh, in the wrong way. So I think the members, at least our members, they look at us for the correct information and insight. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's the COVID crisis or now, uh, today on the agenda, it was discussed, you know, the Russian, the Ukrainian crisis, times of war. Uh, it doesn't matter really what kind of crises. Ultimately, uh, businesses are affected from all of these crises in different ways. So I think the number one function that businesses look for in, in regional or national business networks and chambers of commerce is this insight and uh, access to uh, information that can help them uh, you know, take the right decisions in, in, their, in their businesses. Two, which relates to the first point on information, is they look for policy. And I think government also looks at these uh, institutions for policy also. Governments, again, it doesn't matter if it's Turkey uh, or, or Sudan, uh, ultimately the governments and the bureaucrats uh, they might not have access to the situation on the ground with the businesses, and you know, that's fair. Uh, but what I think we need to do as chambers of commerce or these business networks is help the governments, the public uh, officials, and the decision makers in, 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 uh, in them designing the right in the policies. Uh, so in that respect, I think the second function we can state here is uh, policy design uh, and or lobbying, the lobbying function. Uh, the third all of these are, of course, interrelated, is capacity building or training. Again, we're talking about access to information, we're talking about policy, but then we need to assist the businesses in adapting to the new environment, whether there's a crisis or not. Uh, that might be a training and green, green transformation, as Honor Bay, uh, uh, that's his function at Turconfet. It might be a training on digitalization. It might be a training for women entrepreneurs, and the list goes on, financial literacy and so forth. But these institutions, institutions such as Turconfet, one of the main functions is assisting the business in adapting to the new norm, crises or not. Uh, some of these functions uh, are dwelled on by some chambers, some of them are not. As most of you know, I think, some of these chambers dwell strictly on policy, so they're essentially lobbying institutions, and others, they dwell more, more on capacity building or these training programs. So it really, is really, it really is a decision that you need to make, and it's a strategic decision on what, the, what your membership base is looking for. The fourth and final uh, function, uh, I would say, is business development. Again, a function that, uh, that is not uh, limited to business associations or confederations such as True Confit, but it's an important function that I think the membership base uh, looks for. So these four functions, as I said, it depends on which country you're on, what your membership is looking for. But, I mean, these are the four functions at least I know of that the business uh, confederations, associations, or regional uh, chambers uh, can fulfill. And it, uh, you might take all four of them, or you might decide to dwell on one of them, but uh, these, these are all, I think, essential functions that regional or national uh, institutions uh, can help with their members. And I'll stop there. Uh, these are some of, I think, the main functions that we can discuss further on, and thank you. These are my initial remarks. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And so we're going to hand the microphone over to Ms. Olina Cherkova, Vice Chairwoman of the ICC UAE Commission on Trade and Investment. Thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure and honor to be a speaker, to be invited as a speaker in this very important event for Ukraine. And um, I would like to make a short, brief introduction about myself. My name is Olena Sherokova. I am Vice Chair of ICC UE Commission on Trade and Investment. Also, I am the head of the corporate in ARA Group. And uh, recently, I have been elected and appointed as head of legal affairs in Ukrainian Business Council in UAE. I'm Ukrainian. I have graduated from Ukrainian Tarashchenko National University. And as well, I hold LLM in international law from Middlesex University. If I may briefly introduce ICC and why this organization attracted me to join as a member. 
the International Chamber of Commerce is more uh, existing in more than 100 countries, and it's well known as World Business Organization. With a membership across the world and more, with having more than 45 million members from all business sectors, from smallest to large international, from the businesses, and is truly really doing a wonderful job of the trade facilitation and creating the businesses. And in fact, motto and uh, I would say goal of the International Chamber of Commerce in general is to make business work for everyone, every day and everywhere. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And then we had had a late substitution. So Onur Anulu from Turkofat will talk next. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you once again for inviting me over. I'm. We have talked about energy, uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, nuclear power, all those aspects in a couple of panels before. Um, I'm also chairperson for Green Transition Committee in Turkomfet, so I would like to emphasize on the uh, things that we try to do uh, with the Commission. So what we do basically, as Arda mentioned, we represent o over 50,000 companies. And as I told before, the world ecosystem is now changing. It's moving to more um, emission-free world, if I, if I put it correctly. So uh, in this new ecosystem, uh, we are trying to help companies within Turkey to make their green, tr green transition uh, as smoothly as possible, as uh, less painful as possible. Be due to the fact that these new laws, new legislations, such as uh, carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism in the European Union, those create quite a lot of question marks in the in the heads of all the investors in, in Turkey, not only in Turkey, maybe uh, all parts of the uh, rest of the world. So what we are trying to do is, first of all, we, we, we make seminars, training programs, to um, to teach, if we put it right, uh, to teach the companies how they can handle it. What would be the steps to uh, go to a green uh, transition period? Uh, on top of that, we try to show them it's not something to be afraid of. So uh, usually companies uh, think that these are um, th these sort of transitions need too much investment and it's quite difficult to handle, but we try to show them the positive sides of these uh, transitions, the opportunities, because when you do the green, the green transition as fast as possible, as smooth as possible, then it creates more uh, export opportunities in the European Union area. This not only affects your uh, revenue increase, but also helps you reduce your costs uh, because you you reduce um, utility consumption, you reduce energy consumption. So all your costs are going down. So this is something uh, we we try to do at a, as a confederation. We also work with uh, other associations such as uh, Turkish Business Association, TUSIAD, uh, Business for Goals uh, platform with TUSIAD and UNDP. Uh, so with all those um, associations, NGOs, confederations, um, we try to work as a team to help all sizes of companies to do this transition as smooth as possible. This, these are, will be my starting remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we'll have Igor Stefanov, with CEO of Invest Moldova. And I got to watch your panel yesterday and that was, uh, that was wonderful. Yeah. Hello, uh, Michael. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. I am um, representing the Moldova Agency. We are under the government and the Prime Minister office. Uh, despite we are, I'm a state servant, I come from uh, the private sector, and I do believe that business is the most important part of our society. They usually are helping us to achieve new, new, 
uh, ages and to especially the last three years they have a lot of uh, problems and concerns so that's why we uh, have uh, made several actions during the war first of all I think in the first uh, uh, first week we have organized the dialogue pro business we have launched a discussion uh, panels on each economic sector that we have is approximative 14 uh, strategic economic sectors uh, we ask them what are the problems uh, to have a screening of all the uh, solutions that we have then um, uh, with that paper we have shared this with our uh, government and our state institutions that allows us to come uh, with a lot of uh, um, strategic uh, ideas in order to change the legal framework to facilitate uh, uh, some uh, actions during the the war especially in business continuity is one of the most important problem at the, at the moment the supply chain the second part that is really uh, hard for us because 60% uh, of our border is with Ukraine and definitely the logistics the uh, raw material that we are uh, in the past uh, were coming through uh, or via Ukraine Ukraine was one of the major partner in terms of import of our country uh, more than 600 millions uh, we were importing from Ukraine if to compare what we exporting it was only 60 so uh, in terms of fertilization of all the, the food security of our country was under the, the the question the all the real estate market is still under the big pressure so we had uh, tried to identify all the problems uh, to communicate first of all because uh, the first uh, two weeks it was a lot of fear in the in the business community and uh, to come the spirits to have a direct dialogue and, uh, and aftercare not only to the investment uh, investor that are present on our market but also to the local business and to f try to find the new markets and uh, new suppliers and also to facilitate all the goods that are um, uh, uh, coming uh, from Ukraine uh, to European market now all our borders are full of trucks from Ukraine we also have uh, managed to discuss with European Union and uh, and Romania to facilitate the border uh, procedures and the custom procedures and we are now developing four new uh, points custom points at the border of European Union so we have a lot of solutions and I think also the most important part that we should do is the synergy between uh, all the countries that uh, are on, on, on uh, uh, today and yesterday at the panels I mean from Finland to, to uh, Baltic countries Poland Romania Bulgaria uh, Turkey and, um, and you know, to help uh, uh, our neighbors to fulfill their potential and to, to become again a great and successful country great thank you very much and last uh, on the introductions is Temez Desmes, Head of Project and Business Development, French Chamber of Commerce in Turkey. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so this is Temuz Besmez from French Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I have previously worked at the uh, Foreign Economic Relations Board of Turkey, DEIC, and then uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Uh, now I'm at the French Chamber. So uh, we are a platform basically for uh, French companies that are already invested in Turkey and also Turkish companies that want to export or want to settle in uh, to French market. And uh, well, basically, uh, besides all the uh, main activities that all business associations uh, do, uh, two main teams uh, that are being focused on, uh, well, of course, between uh, Turkey and the European Union, and European Union. And first, this is modernization of the customs union agreement that has been signed in 1996. And secondly, as uh, as Owner Bey said, uh, adapting uh, all Turkish businesses to Green Deal, uh, which is becoming much more important in these uh, years. So we are working uh, towards these two uh, teams, these two topics. And basically, of course, there's a, maybe as you know, there's a strong French presence in Turkey. Uh, there are many French economic institutions that are already present uh, in Turkey, and France is the first foreign country that the uh, Ottoman Empire has established commercial relations. So uh, French presence uh, is vast in Turkey. So we are collaborating more often with the Business France, uh, French uh, Development Agency, IFT, uh, and Economic Service of French Consulate, and many other Turkish business 
uh, associations uh, such as the network of uh, French network of Tussiat. So uh, yeah, very briefly. Oh great! So I think what uh, the purpose of the panel we had caught them up and talked about you know how are regional chambers dealing with cross border interactions and there were a number of questions that we postulated at the beginning. Most of everybody's introductory remarks actually covered a lot of those things. But I think what I, I think what we'd really like to try and put together are the opportunities. We've had a great panel. This is a great two days, and we've learned a lot. And so I'm going to start with Alina and really ask her: Are what are the opportunities that you think that'll emerge from the crisis, and how can these opportunities be harnessed? Uh, thank you, Michael. You know. Um, what I will start, I will start, I think, from the, of course, if I'm sitting from ICC. Yeah, oh, sorry, it's a little better. Better. Good. Regarding the work, you know, much uh, things has been done and many things still has to be succeed. Uh, but for instance, ICC rules underpin every single letter of credit transaction every day, financing billions of dollars of trade between the countries. But you know, I will tell you, like my major um, concern in this context of the world of trade is for the people, the people who depends for their livelihood, you know, and even survival of the moment of the goods cross borders. We have heard the challenging economic factors so well articulated is this great event. As well, we have heard about negative consequences, you know, of the supply chain challenges. But my biggest concern. You know, and my biggest worry is for many people in so many countries that are now facing the challenges of hunger, with the outlook even for my, for a much greater number of people some living below the poverty line. You know, so this is my biggest concern, and uh, I, from my point of view, this is, will be much more important than any points highlighted before. And we, as we know from the last updates, they are pending signing the contract for that. You know, and um, what's more even, I will tell you, within emerging, you know, and uh, the action, um, I will tell you that developing um, markets the important for food is mission is very critical. Food, I don't speak about the general food supply, you know, I'm speaking about the basic, basic food, you know, for wheat for bread, you know, and other sample sunflower oil and corn. If you speak generally, let's have a look, you know, if to combine Ukraine and Russia export, you know, and account for about 25% of world wheat export, 50% of sunflower, and maybe around 15% of the corn. I will not definitely uh, identify the uh, destination of the exports, but uh, I will tell you this is the countries with huge populations, large populations, where the poor in, in aftermath already and of the pandemic already suffering and struggling a lot. So this is, um, so what, what I can tell you, yes, you know, like I have many concerns, but my main aim concern is the disruption of the supply of basic food to countries and people in need. And I hope today we will receive the news also, which will cover this. Uh, it's very sensitive, you know, for me, businesses is okay, but human life is matters more than anything in this life, you know. Thank you. Oh, very well said. And I'm going to actually move on to Igor because one of the other things we've learned about the last couple of days is the tremendous amount of resources that are available. So the things that you know I'm noting coming from the United States coming here is there's a tremendous amount of resources. So Igor, why don't you talk about some of the resources you're seeing that say small businesses can do or people can start planning now to do because the time is now to get started on the next Marshall Plan. In my opinion, all the resources, a lot of resources should be now concentrated to uh, infrastructure and logistics in this part of Europe, I mean, Ukraine and Moldova, because it will facilitate a lot of the speed of, uh, of doing business. Uh, second, uh, um, uh, definitely uh, that's true, not only big business must be uh, helped, but also um, small and medium enterprises. So that's why we need a lot of uh, uh, business linkaging events and networking events uh, to connect all of them. 
so that's why I, I was uh, talking about some synergies uh, between uh, all our countries. Now we must uh, be united uh, because usually as an IPA, as an investment agency, we are competing to each other, but now we have, uh, uh, we must find solutions and to um, um, to grow together and uh, to attract together new new comers and uh, new uh, new investors. Wonderful. And then for Tamez, uh, you had mentioned that a lot of your work is working with French companies uh, and Turkey. The question is, what types of things can you uh, translate over for working with Ukraine companies or French companies and Turkish companies, since you wind up, wind up sitting at a wonderful intersection of the EU, Turkey, you know, and, uh, and Ukraine? Uh, well, that's a good question. Well, first of all, uh, I can uh, briefly say that the we are witnessing two two uh, important themes that uh, nearshoring and regionalization of businesses so uh, what i would say from this standpoint that uh, turkey is becoming uh, a more kind of hub for european businesses and especially for french businesses that want to move out uh, especially from uh, china or, or or other asian uh, countries so in this, at this point, uh, European companies and also I mean, French companies, the, we are receiving a lot of demands uh, in every, maybe every day. Uh, so Turkey can be a, a good, inter as, as of today, for example, we have seen Turkey intermediating uh, between uh, in the war. And Turkey, on the other hand, uh, can be an intersection point, as you said, uh, for European and French businesses that are already that are uh, has, is, uh, making decisions to settle into Turkey, uh, so therefore Turkey uh, can use this uh, as to uh, to, clo to, to to be closer to, uh, to to the Ukrainian businesses. Wonderful. So uh, I'm gonna the next question I have is for Anur. And I think we'd learned earlier about, we were talking about green energy earlier and then creating some good, um, you know, world building 2.0, net zero buildings, net looking at infrastructure. And I guess the question is with all of those new programs, the capacity building that needs to come along with that. Can you talk about what you've done in the last couple of years about capacity building and how that can get translated going forward? Uh, definitely. I mean, um, Russian invasion in, on Ukraine is devastating, but obviously it's going to end up someday, hopefully soon, and uh, the country will recover with the infrastructure, like uh, you mentioned, and um, that's going to gr create a possibility uh, to change or to, to construct new buildings, we, we, which are like net zero energy buildings, or new, new factories, like we have discussed earlier on in the other panels, where they use uh, less energy or they have their own renewable energy sources on the roofs or on the green fields. So it's a, it, 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 there, is a, there is a huge potential there as well. What we are do, trying to do as, as for capacity building is that uh, not only we mention the companies, the great, great opportunities there, but also we try to encourage them on, on these applications. Uh, what we do basically as a, as a confederation, um, we do their uh, carbon footprint calculations. We, we, we assist them on, on the way to become more greener production. We try to assist them utilize their um, raw material uh, usages. Uh, we try to help them on, on every aspect of this green, green transition period. And uh, what we see on the field is that we, we came a very good way. Uh, and in mid-September, we are organizing this event in Ankara, where uh, we, are also we are also going to present the outcomes that, it, that we generated from the field studies throughout Turkey and turn it into a policy uh, offering to the government and the other political parties for the future recommendations. Um, so this is, this is what we are trying to do because 
from our understanding, every country has its own ethics or its own way of doing business. So something good in U United States or Europe does not mean that it's going to work perfectly here in Turkey. So what we are trying to do is also trying to adopt what, how it can be handled within this country and within the surrounding countries as well. Great. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask Alina this question, because uh, earlier today we were learning about the financing of the rebuilding of Ukraine and the Marshall Plan 2.0. But one of those pieces that came about was that there's roughly $1 trillion set aside and available for this rebuilding, but on the implementation side for the small medium businesses, ha the capacity building that maybe ICC can help them with is applying for that funding or applying for these grants. So is that something you might be able to speak on? Yeah, sure. I will start, first of all, regarding what um, to add the information on the previous question regarding, in short, that uh, from ICC and what we can do and what exactly we are doing for that. You know, in the short, the origin of the merchants of peace, you know, of ICC, we can take positive steps to facilitate the trade and investment. And as well as the UAE is the, fa everyone knows that, especially right now, is the fastest growing trade hub connecting the world markets. So uh, like this wonderful event here today, we are trying to bring the key stakeholders together in the UAE to develop the trade facilitating rules and standards and to leverage advanced technology. And for example, ICC UAE, we organized the Global Trade Facilitation Summit in March 2022, uh, with the key stakeholders present for a full week of deliberations and trade connections. Uh, what about the future and what we can do? You know, we are already on the advanced stage of preparation for ICC UE Global Trade Facilitation Summit 2023 in Dubai. And um, previously, as you understood from my speech, you know, one of the agenda, I will put the food security supply chain. chain. It will be the central. So um, I would be happy to welcome the delegates and the businesses to join our Global Trade Facilitation Summit because there will be highlighted not only the trade, global trade, also the investment part. And as well as to um, rebuild, I mean rebuilding the Ukraine, as you said, this is already, I will reply on the part of Ukrainian from Ukrainian Business Council because mostly here is to attract and to find the right spot and the right bridge from, for the investment in trade globally as ICC UAE. Great. And I'm going to ask a similar question to Igor about uh, helping the SMEs, but also you're looking at kind of a broader, you know, Black Sea area with trade of Moldova and Ukraine. I was thinking, by the way, about the last question still, <laughs> because I think uh, we should find or we should establish an implementation unit. It, uh, there will be a lot of money uh, that uh, will, and I'll, we need an ac access to that money. So that definitely we need an at the international level to establish an implementation unit that will help all the these entities. Maybe we or maybe it will be ITC. I don't know, but uh, definitely the small and business and. Uh, uh, small business enterprises and all the, the businesses in our region, they uh, need an access to the money, they need uh, uh, to improve their capacities and to, in order to find new solutions, to find new markets, to find new customers. So that's, that's true. That's the, um, the most important uh, things that we must do next to, to this uh, event. Wonderful. So, uh, Tomez, the question about, I guess, as you bring larger companies in and out to new markets, how does that and why is that important? Because we were talking beforehand about the small to medium businesses that come behind those. So if you're building a new ecosystem, and I think that's what you've been working with, with the uh, French Chamber of Commerce in Turkey. So talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, for large companies and also for SMEs, I think uh, there are many uh, teams that are appearing uh, more interesting actually. Uh, well, first of all, I can start with um, companies who uh, value added exports is becoming in incredibly important for the stability and sustainability uh, of uh, developing uh, economies because uh, in every developing uh, country, trade remains an engine of growth. 
And secondly, good governance is becoming more important both for, both for SMEs and both for large companies. And, and companies and especially governments need to uh, rebuild and restore the trust uh, and need to manage more efficiently. That is becoming more important. And companies, uh, both again, both SMEs and large companies tend to become more successful if they manage to integrate into their regions and if they manage to uh, diversify uh, their uh, markets uh, and they, they tend to become uh, more successful. And, and lastly, I can also say that uh, resilience, again, is becoming for important uh, for both, again, uh, both, both for SMEs, because I don't want to uh, make a distinction between uh, in SMEs and large companies, because every uh, thing I think uh, I, I stated is becoming more important for those companies. And resilience, and also, uh, as uh, Honor Bay mentions, uh, adapting to new uh, low carbon emission deals uh, and then adapting fast and quick is uh, highly important for both uh, range of companies. Wonderful. And so, Arda, my question, or kind of follow up on that, is as we're looking at needing national policies and how uh, for rebuilding, and institutional level, we had heard from the, uh, what, the chairman of ICC this morning talking about being brought into the table at the top level, topmost level. How important are the chambers of commerce and the leaders of the chamber of commerce needing to fit in that ecosystem as these things are rolled out? Uh, I'll come to that question, but if I may just very briefly touch on the SME point uh, and also the opportunities, I'll just take a minute if, if that's okay. The reason why I want to focus on that is because more than, well, more than 90% of our members are, are from SMEs. And all of the programs that I mentioned, the functions, if you might remember in my uh, uh, initial remarks, are all uh, geared towards small and medium-sized enterprises, including uh, owner's program on the green transformation. And I'll tell you why. Because th those are the, 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 that's the target group that's in need. When you look at Coca-Cola or when you look at Unilever, you name it. They have access to capital, access to finance. They have access to human resources. They already have the best people working. They already can hire the best consultants and, uh, you know, uh, strategizing. But when you look at a, just a small and medium-sized enterprise, they don't have access to finance. They don't have access, access to information. And that's where institutions like TurConfit, that's where institutions like ICC come in to really serve as a beacon of lights to hold from their hands and help, the, help them go through tough times and adapt to uh, you know, the new situation, whether it be the Green Deal or you know, uh, digitalization and so forth. So uh, I think we're coming to the end. That's why I want to make, uh, make a very strong remark where, we, uh, where I think everyone in this room, coming from all across these regional uh, chambers of commerce, is that SMEs need a special focus, and they're the ones who actually need the real attention. It doesn't matter if it's in Ukraine or if it's in uh, if it's or Chicago. I think I think you all will agree on that. Now, uh, another point, which is the opportunities. I'll take one minute there, and then I'll conclude. Is that, if that's okay. That's fine. I think we all have lawyers on the panel, so all right. trained in that. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, now, again, the oper I think we can all agree that. This is not the first crisis. It's not going to be the end of the crises, right? I mean, we we went through the COVID crisis. We're still uh, witnessing the residues of this COVID crisis. Now, this crisis in Ukraine and many more to follow. I think if I if I need to make one single uh, if I need to pick one single word on the opportunity is adaptation. And I think we all believe in evolution in this room. If we're believers in evolution, I think we can agree that out of these crises, we not only need to have our businesses adapt, their skills of adaptation to be increased, but also our governments. So business, governments, NGOs, chambers, put the whole lot in there. I think we all need to come out of this rethinking about our position in our specific countries, in our specific regions, and the globe at large, on how we can adapt our business models in adapting to this new norm. Uh, you spoke about the situation in Moldova, you spoke about the situation in Ukraine, and same with the French Turkish businesses, and we coming from the Turkish from from the Turkish side, I think we all have different risks and different opportunities. But the one thing if I need to single out is we all need to adapt. We need to diversify our business models. We need to div diversify the way of thinking in adapting to this new norm. So 
should I stop there or? Yeah, I'll have you stop there. And okay. Then, but I'm going to let right. each of our other panelists kind of get the last word and really kind of come under the idea of what have we missed? Right. Uh, one piece that we had talked about earlier too was about how all of this is going to be insured. How are, you know, when business owners who invest, they want to know what's their downside. So I don't know how to best bring that into everybody's concluding remarks, but that was the big uh, piece that I missed earlier was how is all this risk going to be insured? And so, Anur, I'm going to start with you and then work across the panel. And these will also be your concluding remarks. So, uh, Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, if you're in a business world, you need to invest. You cannot stop. So uh, the only thing, like I just said, you, you need to adapt to the changes. You need to adapt. So now the ecosystem is changing, as I told you before. Now uh, you cannot stop. You, you, you need to find a, find a way to avoid risks or to minimize risks and to try to see the opportunities besides that. Like we have talked on the energy panel, uh, all the investments like a couple of years ago with their payback times over five, 10 years, now they are all feasible because of the high energy prices. So today it's time to invest on these sort of uh, new, 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 new systems. Uh, so, as a business point of view, um, we have the opportunities, we need to minimize risks, but we can never stop investing. So, that's my final remark, I guess. Wonderful. So, Tamez? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I can conclude with uh, maybe, I don't want to echo all the panelists and uh, bring in maybe another topic and, uh, uh, well, what we see besides all the uh, things that uh, we've discussed, what we see is that the in, in recent years, uh, I believe the geopolitics is causing more trouble and more cost. Uh, but all on the other hand, much uh, on the other hand, playing a much bigger role uh, in the global economy. And secondly, uh, since 1990s, we are in a uh, we are in a you know hyper sophisticated, interconnected, inter interdependent world. But on the other hand. In recent years, we have seen that this, this connectivity also uh, can lead to a catastrophe. And also, so I can uh, briefly conclude with the importance of analyzing uh, geopolitics and secondly, uh, the hidden risks bet uh, inside uh, the connectivity. Thank you. Great. So, Elena, so what, el what else have we missed and your concluding remarks? Okay, thank you. You know, um, I would like to highlight, like all the panelists mentioned already, the points which we should put attention on when we are doing the investor and how to protect the investment. But from our side, already like head of legal in the uh, Ukrainian Business Council in Dubai, I can tell you that we are putting lots of efforts for other Ukrainian also businesses and investor and investor foreign investors as well by creating the like right now uh, since. February, we are trying to create the webinars, seminars, lectures, events regarding such important like investment rate, export, even franchise. It was very important to discuss upon request, you know. And even so, we are trying now to create the club, special club, business club for only for Ukrainians. Um, we will, I think, launch that in September if everything is going well and also some countries or Europe. So to make ensure just there will be special experts inside which will guide, especially small and medium-sized business. As it was mentioned before, large business is already going in the right steps and the strong steps, but small business and medium business, they need our help and support. So in this stage, we just need to support from our background and what we have already came through, you know. So this is what we can do, and this is what we do from our side. And supporting investors is just ensuring the right stage and the right projects inside. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so finishing off the concluding remarks is Igor. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I, will, I was thinking that definitely, uh, and we know uh, everybody that uh, next year and 2024 definitely will be one of the hardest uh, in terms of economic in, in, in our history. And uh, it will be very hard uh, and we understand, but we must anticipate through communication, through collaboration, must anticipate and to find solutions, to find some, uh, let's say, economic pillows for uh, the new economic order that will begin. Uh, we must be united, we must uh, find all the proper 
more solutions, especially as I'm coming from a small country that are really attractive of everything. We are 2.6, a little bit more than Chicago, a million of population. And uh, we have been uh, very affected uh, by the war. And uh, we are now, and definitely that's in the, you know, what I'm uh, looking at our economy, we were fast uh, affected than the rest of the countries, because that's the chain how it, how it uh, have gone. And uh, I do believe that we must uh, have a very targeted approach to each economic sector. Definitely the services is the fastest that they are going to develop in the future. But also we must uh, help sustainable business in order to develop uh, a good and sustainable future for all uh, the companies in the region. Wonderful. And so this is going to conclude our panel, and we are the last session. So we're going to have our concluding remarks now. And I did want to thank Tristan for inviting me to come moderate. It has been definitely a trip well worth it coming from Chicago to Istanbul. Uh, they don't let me out much, so this is my first trip to Europe. And I was very lucky to get to the other side, so I actually got to Asia as well. So I got a two for this time. So again, let's give it a hand for our panel, and thank you, everybody. Well, believe it or not, we are there. So thank you all for very interestedly following this wonderful two days of discussion about our beloved Ukraine with all our wishes. It is now time to first and foremost acknowledge you as participant, acknowledge the participants who sat on the panels and the moderators, but also the institutional sponsors who made uh, this wonderful event possible. So I will read them out uh, in some quasi-alphabetical order, if you like. First and foremost, this wonderful venue. And if, uh, if you haven't seen the, uh, the museum part, I, I had a brief chance and I was literally blown over, flabbergasted, what a fantastic uh, displays that they have. And I will certainly be back to have a full view of that. So Atlas Cinema and its leadership, its management, thank you very much. Uh, Baltic accounting experts, creative team, Dimesh, is not present here today. Gugnor Law. Hulanichki Bednarek. Nazololo. Playtech. Serka 
International, Simet Bileşim Technology, Trimble, Doğuş Inşaat, Atlas Cinema Museum, as I, as I mentioned. I, I would like to invite now uh, a person who played a, a key role in putting all this uh, event uh, together and, and delivering uh, all these arrangements. Mr. Sinan Bedir, please come and join me. And Sinan, a round of applause. I also would like to invite the three uh, dedicated, committed, and passionate supporters of Ukraine, uh, Burak Pehlivan, please join here. Gennady Chizikov, dear friend, please come. And Alfred, please also join us. You're there, I see now. So, I'll leave it to you. Uh, We are giving thanks to um, the place owner, um, Atlas Cinemas. We are calling Mr. Jay Hoon. Is here? The second one, Baltic accounting experts. You are not here? Okay, thanks, them. Creative team. Anyone? Okay, thank you. And Timas? No. Uh, Gugnor Lau. Any representative? Okay. Hulanichki uh, Bet Narink. No. Nazali Lau. Any responsible? No. Playtech. Okay. Serka. Okay. And me. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> and. Trimble, and a responsible guy. Okay, thank you for all, and thank you uh, to joining with us, and Mr. Um, okay, yes. Mr. Pubrak, please. Thank you very much, Silam uh, Bey. We have already finished such a great event after two days hard working, networking. As I mentioned during my speeches during the forum, it was, it has been one of the best events, business events about Ukraine. And it was the first business event after Russia has launched its invasion, its war in Ukraine. Almost 1,000 business people from more than 20 countries gathered in Istanbul. And during these 11 excellent panels, more than 70 speakers shared their vision, their opinions about Ukraine, about reconstruction of Ukraine, about rebuilding Ukraine, and facilitating trade and logistics. And as a great coincidence today, just maybe 15 minutes ago, thanks to mediation efforts of Turkey, and United Nations already signed Green Corridor in Black Sea. What does it mean? It means 
27 million tons of grain, sunflower and sunflower oil can safely move through Black Sea, from Black Sea ports of Ukraine, and can reach needed people all over the world. And I would like to say thank you, Mr. Gennady Shugov, President Shishikov, about his efforts, because he was the first businessman, he was the first chairman of a business association, chamber, who mentioned it openly, publicly, and supported that initiative. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. I really want to say thank you, all organizers, all contributors, all sponsors. I don't want to say all people name by name because Mr. Sher Kajunar and Mr. Sinan Beder did it. But really from my heart, from my mind, I would like to say thank you for everybody. Thank you everybody which gave the possibility, the opportunity to organize such an important forum in such a great city in Istanbul. Especially, I would like to say my colleagues from ICBAC, because ICBAC, International Council of Business Association and Chambers in Ukraine, it was maybe one of the unique examples of gathering 10 business associations from and chambers from 10 different countries. And today, if we are here, such a, with a splendid audience, maybe one of the main reasons causes that ICBAC created such a suitable platform, suitable ecosystem, and started his efforts five years ago. I would like to say, of course, Mr. Sinan Beder and Intashe Threat Council, which is initiator and developed this project together with the Ukraine Invest. And I would like to say, of course, a part of Big but besides Big the largest Ukrainian business associations, Ukraine Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And I would like to say thank you all Ukrainian institutions, all Ukrainian government agencies supported that initiative. And of course, our uh, government agencies, our ministers, ministers who support that organization. I hope it would be not the last business event in the near future in Istanbul about Ukraine, and including in different countries and cities. Such kind of initiatives, such kind of platforms will continue support and contribute to Ukrainian force to be resilient and to have better and bigger economy, even under the harsh conditions of the war. World Business Community, we all together stand with Ukraine. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, there is not much to say after this very uh, comprehensive uh, uh, wrap-up by Burak. Uh, let me have such, just some words on behalf of ICPAC uh, as speaker of ICPAC today, where both Gennady and Burak are members. Uh, I'm happy to have been here. I was really positively surprised uh, that uh, this event uh, developed into a major event with uh, high quality panels, with high quality audience, and uh, I may say that uh, I will propose, and I already had done so, maybe we can do this as a sure fix every year, maybe at the same time. There is a Lugano conference, there is the Europe, European Forum, IPAC, there is Davos, so why not have an uh, Ukraine Forum every year, for example, in Istanbul, to create a sure fix. And uh, uh, if that's the case, I'm absolutely sure that next year it will even be better than this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, I'm a little bit nervous because I have feeling what uh, two days of communication is finishing. Sometimes people ask me, what is happiness? I, I say communication. It's no better than communication, when the, in the one uh, premises, people from different nations, different, different 
positions, etc. But we are uh, sitting on the table, sitting in this hall, just for what? To discuss what's very important for everybody: peace, future, and uh, trade, etc. But everybody say a lot of these things. What's doing us successful depends on the situation on Ukraine. And I'm very uh, happy and very glad what uh, today we can say very clear, and I, I will go home with a very clear message. All, practically all the world, uh, all participants who was here, will continue to support Ukraine, will set, uh, continue to support freedom, support independence, and the future of the world. What we uh, united, uh, what and this uh, meeting, this conference united us. Thank you very much. Uh, I also would like to say what in Ukraine people, uh, business would like to continue their fight, fight against the enemy who came our motherland, who came our land. Because it's very strange, in the 21st century, we're speaking about the territory. In 21st century, we need to speak about innovations, green energy, about how what's collected people. But from sometimes we feel and felt that we something from the this situation you came from the last century, probably so from the uh, middle of the last century. It's pity, but I'm absolutely sure. I would like to continue what Alfred said. Next year, at the same time, we, I invited you in the Chamber of Commerce of Ukraine, in the center of the city, where we organize similar uh, conference, where we will speak about the, some results, about the new possibilities. And I'm absolutely sure what I will see, all you, and it, for you it will be very interesting what we speak one year ago and what we will speak one, uh, one year later. Thank you very much for, uh, for your uh, kind desire to support and uh, I'm absolutely sure what, uh, that uh, today during uh, all panels, people, uh, no, participants, speakers, experts said very concretely, we need concrete, uh, 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 not only plans, but new uh, deals, what we needed to do today in, in this direction. And uh, I, today I have a big interview for our national TV and a very clear sent a message was today. It was a very interesting, very strong uh, forum where the businesses from many countries, experts from the any countries uh, spoke about the future of the world, about the economy and the Ukraine. And Ukraine can be play a very important role in this, uh, in, in many things. And today also a very important day because we very hope today will be send, signed agreement. We very hope uh, everybody would like to see what it gives a chance for Ukrainian exporters for, to, to be useful, if I can say, to, to save, the, if I can say, uh, many countries from position of the uh, food security. Thank you very much, organizers. I like uh, what, uh, sorry, I would like to say uh, some organizers like uh, from uh, International Trade Council, but sometimes we had a very difficult talkings, but results more important. Results is very positive. And thank you to all participants uh, who is with us, who was during these days. And let's go forward. Slava Ukraini, Tilke Pret. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thanks to Mr. Tristan Evans, Mr. Dr. Tristan Evans. Thanks to you also. Aile fotoğrafı için. Şevki Bey yok mu? Sinan Bey. Şevki 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 Bey. Şevki
most of the work. Uh, you should go here because uh, the Alfred and Gennady, first, Roman, first, first, first uh, row. Please, you as well. First row, first row. First row, first row. First row. First row. First row. First row. First row. First Yeah, I was a lot of positive 